I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on the 24 hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. And the glass had gone right through my arm, chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here, here. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo. The biggest headlines, one of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. It's like an alarm, but it screams crazy to scare you away. That was going off. The alarm was going off in the post office and we could hear the police sirens as we were getting into the car were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. He said, Terry, I'm taking you to Southampton. I've got a friend. He's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II, the ocean liner. Oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, yeah, OK, I'll be the butler. In life, when you've done something like this, what we were going to do. I don't know where it comes from and who we are and why we're doing it. But it takes something, some men to do it. All right, Terry Mugan has flown from California to be with us today. He's never, ever told his story before. This is an absolute exclusive He's had people biting at his heels to tell, to getting him to tell his story, but he's refrained. So we're deeply honoured. Terry is a man of respect all over the world, especially in the city of Liverpool, as you're about to hear. And this story is one of international dimensions because Terry's life, as you're going to hear, it may, it may be in multiple parts. Um, growing up in Liverpool, he ended up in a, a home in Witness, actually, right by near where. I grew, grew up as well. Horrific things happened to the people in the home and from so many people that go through things comes drugs, criminality, you know, that kind of behavior. In, Terry, in Terry's case, it was armed robberies, heavy duty stuff. He has a stroke of luck with the cops and ends up fleeing the country. Uh, he works on the QE2, <laughs> ends up Clint Eastwood's butler, which my dad found particularly interesting so huge thank you first for coming all this way thank man thank you, yeah. you know, oh, we are honored, thank you. honored. Yeah, yes and yeah. um, thanks for having me today it's a pleasure and me and jen had a fantastic meal last night yeah and we, we you know we heard just a, a, some of the stories yeah um but there's there's so many more you've also potentially got a book coming out this year as well yes. i'm going to hold this up now that is just a draft but you can you can capture the magnitude of the story there from Definitely. from that and uh, so if you are in the comments we're hoping you know teddy's going to get his book out later this year but we like to get one of the guests before they go back to where it all began to tell us you know one of the most moving or hardest hitting stories and i do believe you got one of those haven't you tony yes i was um assigned to a home in um truesdale estates just outside beverly hills and the home was the former home of Elvis Presley. And the people at the home, they, they owned the, the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And they were looking for what you call a majordomo. For the audience, I'll explain what a majordomo is. A majordomo is a guy who runs the home. He's in charge of the chef, the butlers, etc. He, and he puts a curriculum together. And he just, he's quiet. He's nice. He's very experienced. He's got multiple challenges with all the chef and everybody, who they are and what they do, entertainment. 
And this particular home I went to, it was very unusual. I, I only got interviewed by the secretary and she was the one that hired me and said, you know, you'd be suitable for the job. And I took the position and my living quarters was inside the home. And I was wondering, you know, where's the owner? And she said, oh, he's, in, he's at the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And I was wondering, you know, where's Mrs. Weinberg? Where is she? So oh, the secretary, oh, she's down. She's a, on the other side of the house. The house is about 6,000 square feet. So we carried on. I had the chef and we had the butler. We had a maid. And I'd, I was writing the curriculum. This particular day, I was told to come and meet Mrs. Weinberg. I walked down this corridor. And I always remember this corridor. It was like um, the movie out The Shining. <laughs> and it had all the flickering lights and everything. <laughs> and I was walking down and I was going, oh my God, this is like going to get your head chopped off. That's how bad I felt. And these big doors, and the secretary opened the door and said, come in. She said, this is Mrs. Weinberg. And she was in bed. And I looked at her. I thought to myself, this is a very unusual situation. But I used my own imagination from my experiences. And I was looking at her. So you've seen this woman, very pale. And she had this red hair streaking down. And she said to me, how are you? She starts screaming at me, you've been in the sun too much. Are you the new major domo? I said, yes, Ms. Weinberg, how are you today? So I proceeded to ask what, this evening what she liked for dinner. And um, she said, I want bagels and lox and salmon. I said, okay, we'll have that for you for your evening meal. Then all of a sudden she said, how's that chef? I'm not sure whether I like him. I said, oh, he's fine. He's, he's from the Four Seasons. And she shouted throughout the room, I hope he's, he's as good as my chefs at the Kahale Hilton in Hawaii. Otherwise he's getting fired. And so I just looked at her and, you know, I was putting two, two together, but I wasn't making any judgments at the time. Anyway, we went on in the home and we, she was fine after a while, but then there was one particular morning that I did wake up and I heard the noise of rumbling and my room was next door to the garage and I heard this rumbling and I looked at my watch and it was four o'clock. So obviously you think, you know, someone's going to steal the car, some, you know, from East LA or somewhere like that. They're going to come in and they're going to do something. I was a little bit like, okay. So I gets up, put my pants on, my shirt on, went out. And I just seen the smoke coming through the kitchen. And I went, oh my God, what's that? And I could smell it. And it was like fire, but it wasn't fire smoke. It was something else. So I ran out to the front door, opened the door, and I went round the back of the house. And I had a key and I opened the garage to let the smoke out. And all the smoke came out and then I was slowly looking at the car and I thought to myself, what's going on here? You know, somebody tried to steal the car or is there a short wire on the car or something like that? And to my amazement, I seen a, a pipe and the pipe was going from the exhaust into the window of the car. And I just seen this pipe going all the way in. I was going, what's that? And then as the smoke was clearing, I realized Mrs. Weinberg was in the car and she had the pipe in her mouth. So I ran, I opened the door and I dragged it out and I laid it down and I was shocked. And was, oh. So I went back in the house to call the police and then automatically with that, they call the fire engine and then they call the ambulances. They all come together. And obviously, you know, she tried to commit suicide. 
And then to my amazement, I just stood there and they were asking me questions. Asking me lots of questions. I didn't say too much. So, so like, you know, I was um, more empathy than any judgments. And but one thing did happen. When they were given the oxygen, one of the policemen had said to me, and the, the paramedic, he said to me, do you know how old Mrs. Weinberg is, Teddy? And I said, no, I'm not sure. I said, as approximately, she could be like 43. And she's lying on the gurney. She's going to the hospital to um, see the Sinai. And she takes the mask off and she shouts, 44! <laughs> and I just looked at her and I went, oh my God. I sort of gave up. And that was one of the significant experiences that I had in Beverly Hills. And did you ever find out why she did try to commit suicide? Well, obviously, she was mentally ill. And then that story went on. And as I write in my book, in the end, it cut turns into tragedy. Mm. Wow. All right, let's go back to where it all began then in Liverpool. Well, I was born in Scotland Road. Scotty Road. Scotty Road, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, my mum and my dad, they had seven of us. My dad, yeah, my dad was a lovely man. My mother was lovely, lovely people. But, you know, it's, it's Scotland Road. What can you expect? And we moved out of there, and we moved up in between um, Walton, Anfield, and Norris Green. We were right in the middle. And I was about eight years of age this morning. And I got up, and I just went out at three in the morning, got dressed, and I went out. I don't know why. I still don't know why. And I go to this place, and it was um, Freshfield Farm, milk. And in them days, Sean, you had the, you know, the horses that pull the milk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting outside, and this fella says to me, what are you doing here? I said, do you need any help, mate? And he went... You should be at school. What are you doing here? And I think it was, I waited an hour, it was about 4, 4.30. And anyway, he was probably lazy. Anyway, he went, go on, jump on, I'll get the kids to do the work. So I jumped on with him. I started delivering the milk and the orange juice and carried on. At the end of it, after like, we'd finished about half seven, eight o'clock, and he gave me a bottle of milk and a bottle of orange juice. That was my breakfast. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was my breakfast. So then uh, I just I just wandered the streets. Mm. It was like I was wandering the streets. So I walked down to the Anfield Cemetery and I went in there and I, I hid the orange juice in the corner there. And then I went home and my father was like away. He was in the Merchant Navy trying to support the family. And what happened was the the school board, where is he? Well, what is this kid? You know, why is he on the streets? And well, everyone was at school. I was the only one on the streets. And um, so anyway, the, the following day, I got up the same thing. I did the same thing. And I went and uh, got the milk. Delivered it and that. So Friday came. And he said, make sure you come Friday. He said, um, you can help me collect the money. So I went round. With him and I collected all the money with him and I seen this bag. He had a bag and it was just full of like half a crowns at the time and trippences and sixpences. And I looked at it and I went, wow, look at that. And then he had a wallet inside it with loads of pound notes and fivers and, you know, the old 10 pounds and all that. And I just looked at it. And the temptation was there right there to take it. But I left it. The following week, I did the same thing. But I got there on the Friday, two hours before, and I collected all the money. I collected all the money, and I put it in a bag, I put it in a bag, and I left. So I went to the Anfield Cemetery, Jen, and I buried it there. I buried it in the cemetery. And I used to go to the cemetery with my friends, and I'd say, come on, I've got all this money. Then the police had came to the house, and they're looking for me. We want that bag. Where does he put it? And they took me into custody. And that day, 
I never said a word to them. I always found the police to be, you know, in Liverpool, we were always against the police anyway. So I, was, I just went against them. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I think I was eight. Oh, yeah, I was eight. 1965, actually. So what happened was, um, I was targeted then. That was my life. That was the, the life of crime that I was about to go into. Did you manage to keep the bag yeah. hidden? Yeah, yeah, we kept and it. And remember where you planted it. Yeah, yeah, it was in the cemetery. <laughs> so um, I formed a gang. I had a gang. John Lally. Um, Franny Jones. And my old friend, God bless him now, he's passed away, Ronnie Gibbons. And as I told you last night, Ronnie was the, the brains behind the Brinks job in New York for the 8 million, and they'd done the movie on him. So when we got the gang together, we started, we, none of us went to school. So our next move was something else. We still had the money in the, in the cemetery, but our next move was, what are we going to do? Where's the money floating? So it came on, it was the co-op. It was a Friday night. And we died the co-op all, all week. So after everybody getting paid on the Thursday and people getting the pensions and they were getting the money, Friday would be like a big day for them to go shopping. So, you know, we knew the, the co-op would close at six. So we, we went in at 5.30, goes in, got Franny's to the, distract the cashier, to go down and say, where's the can of beans? Franny would take the woman down the side. John would be outside with um, Gibbo. They'd be outside. And then I just jumped over and I had a bag with me and I just emptied the till. In them days, it was a wooden till. And just cleaned a lot out and we put it in the bag. And then we jumped back over and Franny would just walk out. And we walked out and we just... Bump right back to the Anfield Cemetery. We buried it where the milkman's money was. And then what we did was we took about 20 quid. We went down to another shop and we bought, um, in them days, you had the cigars, Hamley. We bought five of them and we were smoking cigars. <laughs> and then we took a taxi huh. over to New Brighton and we were smoking cigars. And then... We went along in New Brighton, then we came back, and then when we got back across the ferry in Liverpool, the police were waiting for us, and they took us into custody. Oh, your first so John, John and Ronnie, they were a little bit older than me, so they got charged, but I got released because I, wasn't, I was too young. So that was another blemish, they were just waiting to get me. I didn't go to school. I had some little bits of school and that, but I was basically, I was just doing my own thing. I was like uncontrollable at the time. I felt like, you know, there was no guidance. I just did my own thing. And we'd go on the streets. So there was a place down in um, Long Lane in Liverpool. And it's all the factories. So one day I said to John, I'm going down to Long Lane. And in days you had a, um, a place called Mother's Pride where they delivered the bread. So the fella come out and I said to him, do you need some help, mate? And he went, yeah, go on, get in. And all the donuts and all that and all the lovely bakeries in the back and all that. I thought, this is nice. And the seat was warm, you know, <laughs> and he was driving it. So in my head, I had Friday in my head when he would collect all the money. So I decided I'll wait, I'll, I'll, I'll work with him for a week or two. And then on the Friday, when we get back to the, the mother's pride will go and I'll just take the bag and I'll take his wallet and eventually I did do that I took that and I put the bag over my shoulder and I got his wallet and I put it in my coat and I walked up all the way up Long Lane in Vazakli and um, I took it to to my stash in the Anfield Cemetery I took it there this was the start of my life. <laughs> so then I was targeted again then. Oh, we've got to get this kid. We've got to get him. So there was a home in, um, in um, Sefton Park called Westfield on um, Green Lane. And I was taken into care. Mm. I 
I was I was taken into care. How did your parents feel about that? I think they were part of the wanting me to to have a better life because they'd seen the problems that I was having. So they was they were all for that to change where I was going to go in the future. But the problem there was that when I went into that home, um, it was mixed. There was girls and there were older boys. I was only eight. And one morning we were in line getting for our breakfast in the queue there. And, you know, I was playing around with a kid, as you do, you know, you're not in control. And I, I kicked a kid on by mistake and I didn't mean to. So the headmaster took me in and he, he came me. He came me on the hand four times on one hand and four on that. That's what they did in them days. So what I did, as soon as I had my breakfast, walked out and said, can I go to the toilet? Put my coat on, jumped right down Green Lane, on the bus, right back home. I was done, no control. Tried to get me back, no. Couldn't get me back. So we started doing our escapades again on the street, me, John and Ronnie. And um, we went to, there was a place in Norris Green called Broadway, um, which is, you know, it's been notorious, notorious in over the years. So we'd go there to Woolworths and we'd go in and we'd do a lot of shoplifting. Started shoplifting in there all over Broadway. And then we'd hide. Always go back to the cemetery for some reason. It was like our comfort zone. I the can't cemetery. believe the money was still there. Yeah, after all that was time. still there. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knew, no one took it. John didn't take any. Or well, Ronnie, you know, said, Teddy, can we have some money? So we'd go back and we'd just <laughs> say, yeah, you know, what you want? 50, you know, I want half a crown. Give us half a crown each. And they went, you know, at the yeah. time they were made up with me. Like, I was, they, I was like the leader of the gang. And then eventually, Franny had got caught. He'd, he'd bagels at home. And the police said that I was with him. And I wasn't with him because I was his partner. So they said, how to get this kid off the street would be to take him into care and to be charged with burglary. And i never done a burglary. And I was taken into care. So they took me into care and I was put on an institute on, um, in Walton called Menlove Avenue. I went in there, but I was isolated. They had a special isolation unit and I was put in there and it was like locked up on my own because they just, they knew I, I was always running away. And we were under a section called 1948 to be given three years in approved school. This was in 1968. So he goes back to the magistrates and there's three magistrates in them days in the court. And they said, oh, well, we'd have to teach him a lesson. But they'd already had the record from the co-op, the milkman. It was all recorded in them days. So there was only one way the magistrate could do would be to take me under in on a section 1948. And that section was three years of approved school. Yeah. I went into the back of the, into the, the back of the, the magistrate's courts in the city centre. Now, could you imagine this? Could you imagine this? You've got a 10 year old kid. He's in the back of the magistrates. He's on his own in a the room. They've separated Franny from me. They didn't want us together. They've put these cuffs on me that are about three pounds in weight each. They've got a black Mariah pulling up at the side of the door to take this little 10 year old kid into custody and shipped off straight to Freshfield, Formby Freshfield to the approved school. This is how my life started. I arrived at the St. George's approved school in Freshfield and my sentence was three years. I went in there, it was like a, it's like a big old castle. It stands out. You can see it. it's like a haunted ma it's a haunted mansion. It sits today empty. 
It was run by the Nugent Care Society, which comes under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. No, no. Now, when I got in there, there was a little bit of afraid. Didn't know what I was doing. We were lost. It was like being isolated, all the children. There was four houses. I think there was about 150 kids in there at the time. We settled down. But their policies, what they had for us, was the inside of the world, not outside it. Their policies that they could do what they wanted with us. And it was a breeding ground for paedophiles mm. and abusers and sadistic men. That's what this was about. So the outside world didn't know. Children were going there. One of the things that they had was Mr. Hickey, he was the um, headmaster. He would take the child's pants down and bend them over and he'd give them six on the bottom. And the poor kid couldn't sit down for weeks. His, his bottom would be black and blue. There was another guy in there and they had a, this thing where if you, you spoke in line, where they'd get you out and they'd this on the head here. They'd hit you on the front lobe, which probably was causing some kind of concussion because some time of damage. And it was spent me, I'd spent about two and a half years in this home getting abused. One of the most significant things that stood out in my life was, which most of them were paedophiles, was proven later on under the Operation Care investigation in the North Wild. North, north of England, child abuse case. There was a guy, Mr. Matthews, he was a Marine. He was about six foot six. And what they'd do, they would say at three o'clock in the morning when they had the impulse, impulses for the children, they would say, okay, one child was talking, so we're going to get you out of bed. I'm like, you're going to have a cold shower. <clears throat> so they'd lead us down. This is in the middle of the night, getting us up at three o'clock in the morning. They take us for the cold shower, put the showers on. And they'd say, soap the left leg, soap the right leg, soap the left arm, soap the right arm. Okay, turn it around now, soap each other's back, bend over, face the wall. This is what, this is what the situation was going on. And we couldn't do nothing about it. There was children that did run away. One of the things that stuck out in my mind was two children that ran away in the summer. And they went over the sand dunes in Formby. And the tide came in. And unfortunately, they were getting chased and they had lost their life. And it was quite a significant thing at the time. But the children were so suppressed in their minds. They were, well, I would say the brains were absolutely cold. Because they were just, they didn't know what to do. My father had had a heart attack. I was 12. So I decided, I got a letter. And one of my sisters said that my dad had had a heart attack. And he was in um, the hospital. And they wouldn't let me visit him. Oh, no. So I decided to run away. And I went to a hospital called Walton Hospital. And I went into the hospital and I found out the ward that he was in. And I, and I sat next to him. <laughs> and um, hmm. he had all the tubes on him, beep, 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 beep. And I was just like, oh, my poor dad, you know. And my dad woke up and he went, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I went, hello, dad, how are you? <laughs> and, you know, because I love my dad, you know. And um, very sad, actually. Anyway... I left when the, the time was up, but I walked the streets and we um, got caught, got taken back. Automatically, where did I go? Right into the headmaster's office. Bends over, six of the cane, and then they put like um, a white jumper on you because you for being um, for being absconded, uh, you, you know you're absconded, and you had to stand on the line for hours. Anyway, we, after that, I moved out. 
And then um, I was released. I was released from there. And then I had one day of freedom. I stole some food and I was at a bus stop. I got recommitted. Took me back to Menlove. Started again. Another three years. Mm. So then um, decided to run away. Ran away. This is when it starts. Back onto the streets of Liverpool. Um, started shoplifting. Got caught. Back to um, magistrates. Recommitted. Another three years. That was nine years. So next thing, they sent us to St. Aidan's in Witness. By the time I got to St. Aidan's in Witness, I knew a lot of them, but they'd made a big mistake at the time. They put me and Franny together. And Franny was absolutely psychotic. Um, so this day was in the, um, in the dining area. So we had a plan that we're going to attack them, attack the teachers. Instead of them attacking us, we're going to attack them. And how we would attack them, when you get your dinner in the evening, we're going to attack them and then we're going to smash all the windows and then we're going to go up, up the roof and then we're going to escape. So Franny, I said, get the knives. You get them knives over there and I'll get these knives here. And then just, uh, just throw the knives all right across the dining hall and just attack the two of them. So we did that. And then we ran, ran to a pool room, smashed all the windows, jumped out, climbed up a pipe and got up the roof. And then we got down, and then we, and then that was our getaway down Norlands Lane. Well, I used to do my paper round as yeah. a boy. <laughs> down Norlands Lane, Norlands Lane, yeah. and then we went over to. Then we went through Hong Kong. We jumped on a train, and then we headed to Liverpool. Got to Liverpool, and nowhere to go. It was cold and wet. We still had the uniforms on from Saint Aidan's. So there was a, in the city centre. They had an um, army and navy store. Goes in there, um, and we. Helped ourselves, we got a pair of jeans and a jean jacket. And we're walking through the city, and, I, and there was a group of lads I knew from Scotland Road. And they said, All right, Terry, how are you? I said, All right, mate, how are you? Now, Franny was a very unusual kid. He wore the NHS glasses, and he looked like you know, one of the nerds out the movies. And um, I always stuck by him, we were best friends. So these four guys that I'd met in the city centre. He said, Terry, what are you doing? I said, oh, we just ran away from, you know, the proof school and that. All right, well, do you want to come with us? And I went, yeah, all right. He said, but he can't come. I said, why? He said, look at them, the glasses on them. You know, that's what they do. These four fellas, um, today only one of them is alive. Only one of them. They had tragic lives. One of them is alive. His name is Joe Cavani. He's a very hard kid from Scotland Road. Very nice. I know Joe very well. And then me, um, the guy that was with him was um, Joey Wright, Joe Moran, and Edgar London. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. I thought, okay. No, we had nothing anyway. So we're going to go down the docks, get into the, the warehouse, get a a big load of whiskey, and then we're going to push it up Vauxhall Road <laughs> um, to Joe's house. So as we get in the warehouse, we hear all the police with the dogs, and the doors are locked. We've got the doors locked, and we're in the whiskey house. And we can't get out. <laughs> we can't get out. So next thing, they've got the dogs, and we're locked in, come out and they're screaming at us and all that, and we're shouting. So anyway, there was a ladder and the ladder went up this window and we went up the ladder and there was a window and as I looked down it led into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal that was the only way we could get out so we, up, we, we got on this balcony and we all dropped down and we went we dropped into a, a little like there was a little wall but it, it dropped into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal so we had to swim across the canal I was a pretty good swimmer, Joe and Egan and all. And so we all swam across. And as we got to the other side, they just jumped up and, and done one. So then me and Franny, I was looking, where's Franny? Well, his glasses had come off. Oh, oh no. And he's in the middle of the river, the, you know, the canal. So I dived in and I grabbed Franny, brought him back. And then, then where did we end up? We end up in um, 
Anfield Cemetery. That's where we ended up. The following morning, I went to get some bread and milk from the co-op. And the woman knew who we were. She, she'd identified us and called the police. So she was the one that he robbed yeah. going back? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Years later, she was still there. And she remembered me. What are the chances? Yeah. And she, they called the police. So they all come and were surrounded in the cemetery. So they get me and Franny and take us. Franny was taken to a, um, an isolated unit in Warrington, Newtonley Willows, called Red Bank. And he had the experience with one of the child killers at the time that had killed two children. He was in an Excel to her. Am I allowed to say her name? Yeah, go for it. Um, it was Mary Bell. Oh. It was Mary Bell. He had the child killer. Because later on, when I seen Franny, he told me, he said, I've been in with Mary Bell. So I was sentenced to, at the time, the government to come out at the time with a short, sharp shock to shock us. So where am I going? I'm going, bump, takes me to um, Menlo Avenue. Magistrates, goes back in front of the same magistrates. They're always there at the same time. Well, Mr. Morgan, we're going to send you. We're going to shock you. You're going to detention. Gets three months in detention. Goes back. Same Black Maria. Same cuffs on. Right to Menlo Avenue for the week. Isolated unit. Bump. Shipped right out to Derbyshire. To Foster Knoll. For the short, sharp shock. Goes in there. Spends three months in the short, sharp shock. With all the scousers, Manchester lads. It was a barbed wire. And it was a it was like um, military exercises, all ex military. All ex military Marines and army fellas and um, you know, telling us what to do. But in it had some good stuff to it. It was like, you know, got you fit, very strong, lifting weights. You had to march two two hours a day. But it was a brutal Regiment, it wasn't there to help you. And then we worked in these cubicles where we would sand these components down for aeroplanes with sandpaper all day. And then same military exercise. So I thought after that, I'm going to get released. So when I got released from there, I was sent to... Back to Menlove. And I said, why am I back here? And they said, well, you're going to court. I said, why have I already been sentenced? He said, no, you're going back to court. I went back to the magistrates. I got another three years. And that was, because, sorry, I'm just going back, um, suffering the physical mental abuse you received at the hands of the staff and inmates begin to take its toll. That was still in Falston Hall. Yeah. That was in Fast and All. Yeah, it was taken as toll. <clears throat> and then... Can I ask what the physical and mental abuse you received was? Well, the physical and mental abuse was just mental abuse from um, violence, hitting us on the head, caning us. They were getting away with what they were doing. We weren't getting educated. We were under the, um, an umbrella of... Abuse constantly, where we were, I'd, we were, I, I would say, hyper vigilant, and and I think at the time then that the anxiety and the mental situation was setting in our brains that we were becoming unstable. I would say, and this would prove later on in life, that would come out later on in life when we were examined. Actually, that came out, and I'll get to that. So I had gone back to the magistrates and I was given another three years to go to another proof school. It was called St. Joseph's in Nantwich. And this was on the umbrella of the Christian brothers. So when I arrived, I had a confrontation with some Manchester kids because I was the only scouser in there. They fall from Manchester. And they just battered me. So I took that. I took that from them. I didn't, you know, that was it. I took them. Because the Manchester guy, he wanted to straighten it, so I had to straighten it with him and battered each other inside the home and that. 
And then I settled down a bit and I went, nah, I'm done. I'm out of it. I was, I was getting old now. I was getting older and I couldn't really take So I, I, I just didn't belong there. So I done one, got off, got the bus, right down from Nantwich, right on to crew, bump off to Lime Street. Got to Lime Street and I met an old friend and um, Richie Harrison from Scotty Road. And we stole a car and we're going down the dock road in the car. And then a police bike comes after us. This police bike comes after us and we're panicking that. Anyway, Richie crashes the car into a wall and I fall out. I break my leg and the cop is battering us, kicking us and everything. Anyway, he calls an ambulance and I can't move. Shipped back to the hospital, one hospital. I get bandaged up, plaster, your legs. And then the three of them came from St. Joseph's to get me. Goes back to St. Joseph's, gets put in in my dorm in solitary confinement for six weeks on my own. And they fed me and I couldn't walk. Not much education, just left alone with some books. So eventually I had to settle down. And um, what they did was the abuse started there again. I got put into um, a welding shop and um, I was trying to do some welding on these iron rods. And um, I'd done it wrong because I wasn't educated. I wasn't trained. And the, the guy in there who was, he was running the metal shop, he just punched me right in the jaw. And he punched me in the jaw and nearly broke my jaw. And um, nothing was done about it. I did mention, you know, I wasn't snitching or nothing like that. I just pointed it out to the headmaster. I said, you tell him, he, he, he hit me. And if he does it again, he's going to, he's, he's had it. You know, we couldn't, even though we could fight back, you know, you couldn't do that because then we would pay the consequences. They wouldn't because they were in control. That was the umbrella that we were under. So I decided to run away. And I'm off again. So I was off again and I ran away. Went and I, get, I got caught in um, Liverpool. And then they brought me into custody and then they escaped from Menlove Avenue. How did you escape? I smashed all the windows <laughs> and um, I put the sheets together and I tied down from the bed. It, see, in Menlove, you had these iron bars and we tied the sheets, me and this kid. And we smashed all the windows and then we just got down and we were gone. Boom, gone, gone. Yeah, all escaping. The great escape from, <laughs> from Menlove Avenue. Yeah, not many kids did he. So gets to Liverpool. What happens? Gets caught again. Gets caught again. Only one alternative. Gets caught again for shoplifting. One alternative. Borstal. Yeah. Borstal. That's the only thing. Anyway, then... Before the Borstal, I'm sent, I'm, I was. I think I was the youngest kid and there was a, um, a remand centre in Risley. I get sent to Risley. I think I was 14 and a half with all these men. I get sent to Risley and I'm on a section. I, 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 don't, I, I don't recall a section, but it was Borstal. I'm under a, a section of Borstal to be sentenced to Borstal for six months to two years. So we waited in in um, in Risley. Now in Risley at the, at that time, the conditions were very appalling, absolutely appalling in the seventies, absolutely um, seventy three. So there was a guy in there on the wing, Eddie Davis from the South End, and um, he started a riot, and they got on the roof in Risley in seventy three. They get on the roof. 72, 73 it was then. They get on the roof and um, there's a big riot. So we're all banged up 23 hours a day. We can't get out. So we're waiting for the Crown to come to Crown Court to go to the Crown Court in Liverpool. And I'm with one child and he's, he's 
you know, we worried, I'm going to get Borstal. Everybody in the country was feared of Borstal. <laughs> You'd rather go in the army or the marines. Thanks for watching our podcast. It's with my sponsor. It's AG1 by Athletic Greens. With Jem being pregnant, some days she wakes up in a good mood. Some days she points at the belly and screams at me, you did this to me. But with AG1... It puts me in a better mood, thankfully for Sean. <laughs> AG1 has been a part of millions of mornings since 2010. AG1 gives me increased energy and mood support. It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. My body is my temple. And with AG1, I take good care of my body every day. Why take a bunch of things when you can just have athletic greens, one scoop of powder in water every day? If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-M. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Sean. Check it out. That's the word from our sponsor. Thanks for watching. Link in the description box below this video for AG1. The Borstal. Hmm. That's what would happen. Can you explain to perhaps the American viewers what Borstal was like? Oh, to the American viewers, Borstal's like, it's not like juvenile law in America. It's an institution where you're going to get, it's like a sharp, sharp shock, but it's worse. It's actually, actually Borstal was for Britain's most toughest children. That's what it was for. And I, I would actually find that out when I got there. Because we were pretty tough at the time, street fighting. You know, because I'd been in boxing gyms with Ronnie Gibbons, who was a, he turned out a professional fighter. I'd been with Ronnie, training with him, boxing with him for years. When I, I'd see him in and out, when I ran away, I'd, oh, we'd go to St. Saint, Teresa's Saint gym in um, Norris Green. So Borstal, to the American view, it's like a... a a very tough institution, but it's worse than juvenile all. And you're on, it's like a prison, actually. It's just the same as prison. So it came this day. We're all going to the Crown Court in Liverpool. One particular kid stuck out to me. His name is Milesy. And he was, he was petrified. So we were all, it's, the Crown Court in Liverpool, it's like dungeons underneath them. And he goes up to the judge and the judge is sitting there with his big red and his sash on. And, oh, you've been this and you've been that and I'm going to send you to Borstal. I'm going to give you this and this, you know, the way they do the summing up. So we were all sent to Borstal. This kid comes down. He's crying. I'm not going to be able to do it. But we didn't think about it. Because we were probably on our way to being institutionalised anyway. It was just another, another thing that was happening in our life. That's what was happening to us. So he comes down, he's crying in the cell. And with a few other kids. So we get shipped then on a bus. Where are we going? We're going to Strangeways. Notorious Strangeways. In Strangeways then they had um, a wing. It's an allocation wing for Boston boys, all tough kids. So he goes in there, gets a, on this wing. Usually you're there for about three weeks to a month before you get allocated to a Boston. He goes in and it's three to a cell and they're preparing you for Boston. That it's, it's so regimented that the all your kits all on the beds, you can't lay on the beds. You've got to sit on the chair all day. Only at night you can remove the strivers in the cell. And we're getting abused by the prison guards. The screws. They start on us because we're Boston boys. We're going to give you this shock, this treatment. And none of them used to say much. So the first day there, the next night, I woke up the morning and I looked at Milesy's cell. And it was sealed. And I was looking at it going, why is that sealed? What's going on here? Anyway, sorry to say, he'd committed suicide. This was one of the first experiences that I'd had before I actually got to Borstal. This 
add this was the where the brain had just gone, the fear had gone in and said, well, you know, this was the first experience I had. And I remember that and it stayed with me most of my life, thinking about the kid. Anyway, it was September, I remember, and we were shipped off. Shipped off to Boston. It was 72, 1972, 73, one of them years. So we get to this bull, Boston in Hull. All got off the bus. It's like a jail. Big massive prison. Tough guys. London, the Geordies, Manchester, Birmingham. A few scousers. Goes in. Come as we get off the bus, they're giving us all the marching orders, go this and under our breath we're just going, fuck is, you know, fuck off. You know, you know, you know, you know, they thought they were tough, but you know, we were tough. So then what happened was, gets in on this wing on the borstal, settles down. You settle down, you meet kids and that, you know. There's a few hard cases. There's a few f- fellas who think they're the fucking daddy and all that. This is where, where, we, where we really pick it up now. The strength. This is where we have to pick our metal strength up. Because I was born with metal strength. I had to be, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here to survive. It's in, absolutely impossible. I speak for them kids. I've never ever, I've never ever forgot any of them, and especially Ronnie and John and Franny, and Milesy, and Joe Moran, and all them kids that I knew in Scotland. Oh, they were good kids. It was just a way of life. So we're in Boston, and we had to march every day. The same thing. We're putting a, a woodwork shop. We're under this micro, the micro managing us. Do this, like machines. This, do this, do this. So one instance come off the yard, and it's it's just like in 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 scum, but I think in real life scum was inside scum was worse than the movie because they only portrayed so much in the movie that they couldn't show the real life in scum of the children being raped. They did show it in parts of it and things like that. And um, they showed one kid where he got a letter in the movie where he was, he got a letter and um, one of the teachers was reading to him and she said, oh, the letter, um, somebody had died and she thought it was the dog and it wasn't, it was his wife. He says, that's my wife. So that's how they did the movie. So my experience was, it was a brutal institution. I'd had this experience where we come off the yard, Scousers, Geordies, everyone from Manchester, all want to fight. Who's the boss? So this guy came off the, the yard, and he was about six foot, and he was looking across at me after we come ma- marching. And he went, um, you, upstairs. And then he was the daddy. He was the daddy of the postal. So these other two scousers behind me, I said to them, just hang on here, will you? So I took my coat off, goes up, and there's a thing called a recess. And uh, he was a big lad. So I just weighed into him, and he'd never experienced what you call, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Sean or Jen. It's called a Liverpool kiss. No. <laughs> a okay. bit of a Glasgow. Well, Liverpool kiss was, um, yeah, Basically, it was a Liverpool kiss, but they didn't know. So it's head button. Joe Cavana, my old mate from Scotty Road, was brilliant, Harry. And I learned a lot from Joe from doing it. So we didn't realise this kid. I got him in the corner and I just head butted him and I just knocked him out. And then I got him on the floor and I battered him. I just pounded him, pounded him, pounded him from the boxing skills that we were trained as a young kid. Anyway, I was taken then, put into solitary confinement for one month on bread and water for four days. You got bread and water in them days, no food. Got put in for the month. Bump, I'm registered then. Violence. I've got no chance. After that, it went on for a while, but then they earned a lot of respect. They earned a lot of respect for doing that. So it sort of come like, 
part of the daddy. So they had this big dining all one day and we all decided to cause a riot. And them reports, they couldn't have done that in, that, in the movie because they must have had them reports from someone in there to portray that in the movie. I've always said that. So one day we decided we were going to cause a riot with them because we were getting bullied by the screws in there. So this day we caused a riot. We got all the tables, we kicked them off, we threw all the... They were steel trays against the wall and everything. And they all couldn't put us all in the block. They all just had to separate us, calm us down. It went on for hours and hours. It was absolutely bananas, <laughs> just like the, the movie. <laughs> anyway, we... we, we we all settled down and then they just let us go quietly. We had actually won that battle and we quietly went. So it went on for, I ended up doing about eight months. I did about four months in the block in solitary confinement for other situations like um, the night watchman, my roommate underneath him, in, in my cellmate, he'd tell the night watchman to fuck off. Fuck off, you cunt. And then the night watchman would come in the next morning when he was going off his shift. He said it was him. So they marched me then back across the yard. And the yard was like, it was a little block on its own. Solitary confinement. And it was absolutely horrible. And inside the block, you had to walk inside the block an hour a day. And at night you had these lights on. A little light on at night. So finally, I was released from Boston, out back into the world. I didn't really know it at the time, because I'd been now, phew, I was 15 going on, on to 16, come out. And we started, the gang got back together, me, Franny, and we brought another kid in. They'd been in approved schools too but we were all out free. So what we started to do, we started doing snatches and night safes. I had an idea that we would start them where the money was flown in, in the area. It was good. And we just, because we, we probably couldn't function to do a job. We never had the discipline. <laughs> we would, couldn't get a job. No one would give us a job. So we just carried on. We started doing night, snatches and night safes. The first snatch we did was, um, it was a Woolworths in Broadway where we, the manager would take the money to the bank and we'd have him on Friday afternoon. And as he was taking the money, and he'd have it and we'd just come behind him and snatch it. And then we'd just run. And we'd run and run and run and we'd get away. We were doing them. We were doing stores. We were doing like off licenses. We were doing cinema houses in Liverpool where on a Friday night where they collected all the money, people going to the cinema. And on the Monday, we'd watch and then went to the bank, do that. This particular time, I'd left Liverpool and I'd gone down to Brighton to see my brother. And I started doing some shoplifting. And I went in the shop. It was called Debenhams. They really just closed down. <laughs> yeah, have they? Yeah. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would have closed down a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> With all the um, all the shoplifting and everything. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but, but they've done well, haven't they? To it. Yeah. They've done, <laughs> yeah, they've done well. So yeah. what we did, we, we started going in Debenhams and that. And this particular Saturday, the manager came out and I had a briefcase. And he went, come here, you. And the two shirts were in the bag. And I went, I ah, get lost. And they actually took the briefcase. They took the fingerprints off it. And I'd been arrested in Brighton before. I'd been arrested before in Brighton. And I was shipped to live. I was actually in a, um, a prison called Ashford in Middlesex. Ashford. Yeah. And they'd shipped me to back to Risley, and um, this day they got the fingerprints. So I was in Liverpool, 
and I'm I'm doing the snatch that day. Me and John Lally. We're doing the snatch. Anyway, we we do the snatch and we get five hundred and fifty quid. It was quite you know, it was a bit of money then. Goes downtown, buys some clothes, gets dressed up. Actually, um, I bought a sheepskin. Oh nice. And next thing we go to a local area this this Friday night and it's um goes in having a few glasses of lager and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by four detectives and t- there was a sergeant and another police officer with him and I went uh oh do you want us for the the snatch that day so the policeman says to me get outside I said no and I had the glass of lager and he punched me with a stick so I threw the, the glass of lager at him I hit him on the shoulder and I ran and I had to run around the bar and I was but as they came behind me they pushed me they pushed me and my arm went through the window this arm here and the glass had gone right through my arm Chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here. Here. Yeah, you showed me last night. It's like a shark bite. Yeah, showed you that, didn't I? Mm. And then what happens is the artery had burst. The artery had actually burst. So I was conked out. Oh. And, the, and then the cops started kicking me. So I woke up in Walton Hospital. I just had emergency surgery to save my life. But I was, when I woke up, I was cuffed to the bed. I've just had emergency surgery to save my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm handcuffed to the bed. And I'm going, oh my God, what's going to happen here? Thinking, oh, they've got me. Now, in them days, if they did get you for that, it would have been in my circumstances. It would have been five years in detention. Because that's what they gave you. It was, de- it was called detention. I would have got five years. So this cop comes into me and he said to me, OK, we're going to be taking you to Brighton in a few days. And I looked at him. I said, what for? He said, you were shoplifting in Brighton. And that was a relief. That was a relief to me. So next thing takes me a few days later, takes me to Cheapside and the pool. Drove down to Brighton. Go to the Brighton magistrates. Remanded me in custody. I get sent to uh, a prison outside Brighton called um, Lewis. Lewis Prison. Goes in Lewis Prison on remand for the crown. For two shirts. Two shirts. So I'm in the prison and I'm doing physiotherapy on my arm. Doing physio. And this guy is, he's bringing me my breakfast and that because I couldn't, couldn't do nothing with my arm. I could only walk and I'm getting all this physio. And I'm, the physio say, says to me, how would you like the guy who's coming helping you, the fella? I went, yeah, he's all right. Said, um, said that's Gordon Goody, the bank robber. And I went, is it? I said, um, oh, they're my idols anyway. <laughs> I said, I love them. <laughs> and it was Gordon Goody. <laughs> and Gordon Goody used to come. He was Irish, I think. He was the leader of the um, um, the great train robbery. Mm. And he was dead nice. So anyway, I was waiting for the trial to come in um, Lewis Crown Court. Pleaded guilty. I thought... I might get Borstal again. I might get six months. Goes in front of the judge. Judge said, I've got your record here. You've done a bit of everything. Now you're going to be doing a little bit of this. I'm giving you two years in prison. I just looked at him and went, what could I do? Gets two years. I'm sentenced to two years in prison. Where am I going? I'm up down in 
I'm down in Lewis. I get shipped out to Ashford in Middlesex to an allocation unit for one month. Goes in the office. They said to me, you're getting shipped to um, Wormwood Scrubs. You're going to be doing your sentence in Wormwood Scrubs. I was 16 years of age. By the time I'd got that two years, Sean, I'd been sentenced to nearly 17 years. Nearly 16, 16, 16 and a half years of my life. It was horrendous for the kid. I, I didn't realise till later on in life I realised. Anyway, get shipped to Wormwood Scrubs. YP Wing. Tough place. Goes in. None of them had done Borstal. These kids hadn't been in scum. I'd asked a lot of them. So there was a bit of bullying going on. And I went to this Scotch fella. See these two here? See them? When we go on down for our dinner, I said, we're not going down. We're going to break the, the legs and the, the chairs in the cell. And when they come up, when they go in the cell, we're going to give it to them because they were bullying everyone. And the Scotch fella had agreed to me. So when they came up, they went in the cell and we battered the two of them. That's what you did in jail. We give it to the two of them and then we closed the door behind them. But they knew it was us. Bump, shipped down to solitary confinement and wearing with scrubs. Next thing, in them days, what they would do then, that's assault, grievous bodily harm. They'd bring the magistrates in to the jail and they'd be sentenced again. But the, the, the governor said, I'm going to take this into my own hands. You'll lose six months remission. I lost six months. I was put in the block. And the governor came to me the next day and he said to me, the way you're going to carry on with your life you're going to be doing a life sentence. Yeah. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. And I always remember said to him, I'm doing a life sentence now. That's, that's, I always remember saying that. I've done a life sentence. So he said, Terry, you need to behave, lad. And which I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to behave. So next thing, I said, listen, <laughs> Am I going to spend my sentence here? He went, well, we could sort something out for you. I said, I want to get moved to Walton Prison in Liverpool. My family's there. How are they going to come down and visit me? So anyway, I did my time in the block. I'd lost six months. So now I'm doing two and a half years. I'm doing two and a half years. So next thing... Get shipped up to Liverpool a month later. Goes to Liverpool. Goes into Walton Prison. There's a wing called B-Wing. It's where all the YPs are. As soon as I walked in, I knew everyone. All over Liverpool. I got a, a cell. My brother was actually in there as well. Yeah. And um, he got me a cell and we got in the same cell together. And that. And, um, but, you know, we had a, a bit of a bad time because my father, he got sick and my father died while we were in prison and um, we were handcuffed, me and my brother, to my mother's home. We got handcuffed together. It was the most devastating thing in life you could see. And, you know, we had these prison officers over us and, you know, we buried our father. And, you know, we're cuffed. Watching my dad's grave, it was absolutely devastating. But that broke your mother's heart. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. So, goes back to jail. Everything was fine in the, in, in, in Walton because we knew each other, you know. It was like, it was, a, it was a homely prison, but it was tough. I got a job in the laundry. And this is where I met some of the most no notorious men in Britain. I, I, 
I had to go in the gym because my arm, and I was getting physiotherapy on my arm at the time. But I was just doing laundry. But they must have had me file and said, I think you're tagged. Watch him. Keep your eye on him. So goes in and I was doing the laundry with these fellas. But then I was going to the gym. Goes in the gym. This big fella's there, six foot four. Massive guy. We're doing circuit training every day in Walton. This massive guy. I think he was on category A. At the time, he comes in with these screws. He must have been, because he was guarded everywhere. It was Paul Sykes. <laughs> it was Paul. So I got to know Paul. And he was he was all right, like. And just got to know him in the jail and that, you know, every day going and then. And I always remember this day, he was arguing with the screws. And he picks the weights up. He throws them right across the gym, about 400 pounds. They go right across the floor. Absolutely bananas. I'll fucking do the lorries and all that. So about eight screws came in, took him back to his cell. And I was just looking at him like that. Fucking nutter. So it took eight screws to get him down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Paul was a big guy. He was a boxer. Yeah. Yeah, he was. But he was all right. And I, I don't know what things have been said about him in the past. But to me, it was, not, it, was, it was all right. So I carried on in my life in there. He put a guy in a coma for a month, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's when he was boxing. Yeah. That's when he was boxing then, Sean. Oh, yeah, wow. when he turned professional. Mm-hmm. But he was too old then. Mm-hmm. He actually came to Liverpool when I, when I got out. I went, to see, I went to see John Conti fight. John Conti fought at the stadium. And I went to see him. And he come home and he said hello to me. And they're all looking at me like that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, I'd, I'd done my time in Walton, but I had, a, I had another bad situation in Walton with a prison officer. Early in the morning, we were giving the water to the prisoners, so we were let out early. But for some reason, this officer, this screw, he didn't like me, and he decided not to open me up this day. So when I come out, we got a little bit angry for not getting opened up. And... Um, he went, fuck you and all that. I'm not opening you. You shouldn't be given. You should be locked up away. So I got the, um, as I come out, went to slop out. I got me, me bucket and I fucking lashed it over him. And it went all over him. The shit and the piss went all over. And he, he, he was in the army, this fella. And he was running down the stairs. He was shitting himself. <laughs> I said, now go on, fuck off. And um, next thing, about 10 of them got me, come up. He got me, bump, straight in the block. Right in the block. Yeah, 1974. 1974. Um, I got done for assault, lost 30 days remission. I spent 30 days in the block. Yeah. Then uh, my time came, got on with it, just carried on, Liverpool, finally released. So eventually I come out, I come out of Walton. I always remember the day it was, it was March the 8th, 1974. And I'm walking down the street and it was raining. And I've got the shirt on that I robbed in Brighton. I've got the shirt on my back. <laughs> I've got this yellow Ben Sherman on. Anyway, I get home to my mother's house. And um, unfortunately she became sick at the time and she wasn't well and my other brother was there Alan I was very close with Alan and he said to me <clears throat> he said Terry I'm taking you to Southampton I've got a friend he's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II the ocean liner and I was like okay okay <laughs> anyway stayed home for a few weeks and that and um, eventually, I was taken down to Southampton, taken to me. Alan had been in the Merchant Navy, my brother. He'd done the, um, the Maiden Voyage on the QE2, Alan. And uh, he was a lovely lad. And he was looking out for me. And I think he had a bit of 
you know, things in his head. Because when I ran away from the homes, he took me back and he didn't realise at the time what was happening. So he, 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 he felt like he had to do something for me and he was. And he would have done it anyway if he, if he wouldn't have done that anyway. Thanks for watching the podcast. This is with my sponsor. We've both been doxxed in this podcast war thing. People have put our home addresses online. And anyone can find any piece of information on the internet. Including your full legal name, relatives, home address, personal email and phone number. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. Jennifer Hopkins. Yeah, Googling Jen Social's come out of picture, li clicking on these websites, phone numbers. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers, and anyone else who wants to learn more about you. Stalkers, Jen. <laughs> you can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A -A, forward slash Sean Atwood, S H A U N A T T Wood, to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also, linked in my description box on this YouTube version, or scan the QR code on the screen. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura's app also features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls and protects your devices from malware. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with this link. You'll be shocked at how much of your private info Aura finds exposed over those two weeks. Go to my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash Aura dot com forward slash S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood to start your free trial. Also link below in the description box or scan the QR code. So he goes, goes down to Southampton and he said, I'm going to stay with my mate. He's got a flat in Southampton. So I went down, we stayed, we had a little drink. I didn't drink that much. And that, you know, being in, locked up most of my life that age and, and the physical training that we'd done. Goes to Southampton and um, meets a fella called John Callow in Southampton and he said to me, Terry, I'm going to get you on the QE2. You're going to be a specialist cook. Cook. In America, it's cook. <laughs> I'm going to, you're going to be a specialist cook on the Queen Elizabeth II. You've got to go over to Cunard. I know this guy in Cunard. <clears throat> He's going to get you a discharge book. He's going to get you a seaman's book. You're going to get all your photographs done and you're going to be a chef on the QE2. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm made up, <laughs> but also I've got no experience. So this is the this is another challenge I've got to face in my life. I've just gone through all that in my life. Short, sharp, shock, Boston. Twelve years of proof schools, and I'm going on the QE two as a professional man in the outside world to be trained as a specialist cook. It takes years for the specialist cook to be trained. And I'm just walking on the ship and I'm going to be a specialist cook. So that was another challenge for me in the real world of life. So it goes down and this morning I'm going on to the QE2. I just looked at it. What a ship. It was beautiful. Goes on, signs on at the purser's office, does everything. They give me my uniforms and they take me upstairs to the kitchen and the ship is sailing to New York. It's doing the transatlantic, goes upstairs, doing the kitchen. And there's a thing called churning potatoes. You have to, like, in there, it's a, a, an English style where very fancy potatoes, you have to turn it and the peel, and then you have to roast them. And I couldn't do it. So I was, I was fucking all up. I was fucking all the potatoes up. <laughs> so next thing, 
this this chef said, fucking get him out of here. I don't want him in here. I don't want him on my fucking corner. And I'm going, oh, my God. I was fucking slapping in a minute, a little so-and-so. But, you know, anyway, I left it. Then I got moved in. And an old friend of mine, I'll give him a shout out now, Tony Lawless, lovely man. He came to me rescue. And he went, what's all the commotion about? And he said, are you from Liverpool? I went, yeah. He went, get over here with me. That's what the Scousers do. <laughs> so I got over with Tony, my own mate. Oh. And um, I started doing sandwiches with him and cooking soup, boiling soup and that, and I helped him. So when I, I, I stayed in the kitchen, we, we'd stop in New York. Now, my mate, Ronnie Gibbons, he went to New York to be a professional fighter. And I was telling all my mates on the ship that I knew, you know, I said to Tony, we've got to go and see Ronnie. He's turned professional. And he was under a guy called Gil Clancy. And he was at Gleason's gym in Manhattan. I couldn't wait to get off the ship in New York. So we get to New York after five days, goes up to Gleason's gym in um, Manhattan, goes up there, walks up these stairs, and um, Gil Clancy's in the gym, and he goes, yeah, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for Ronnie Gibbons. And he went, yeah, he'll be in in a minute. So Ronnie comes in, just walks in, and I went, all right, lads, how are you? He went, oh, my God. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm on the QE2. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah. So next thing, he's, uh, I stayed with him like for about four hours. He, he had four sparring partners. He said, Terry, I'm going to be welterweight champion of the world. That's what he said to me. He did make it to number one in the world. He did actually make it. So anyway, here's the two of us. All little kids when we were eight. We're 18, 19 now, in New York, walking down 42nd Street. From Liverpool to New York, walking down 42nd Street together. Anyway, he said, anything going on on the QB2? I said, oh, I don't know yet. I don't know what's going on. So we, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next month. I go back on the QB2, stayed with the kitchen. This guy came to me and he said to me, why don't you become a waiter? You know, there's more money, you can make tips and that. So I said, all right. So I went down to the office and I put a request in to, do, um, to be a waiter. <clears throat> so I put that request in. And I became a waiter. Went up what you call um, topside. Started out first at um, washing glasses, cleaning the glasses. They had to be spe spotless in first class for all the customers. And um, a lot of stars were going on there at the time. Anyway, I got better at that. And I got this job as a, a first-class waiter, saving cocktails. And I ran the whole, the whole restaurant. And I was making a fortune. So I thought of a way out to make more money. And, you know, with the Americans, you know, sometimes they wanted a large vodka. That means two, but I'd give them one and charge them two. And we started making a fortune on the ship. <laughs> and things were getting great. So we got to Southampton. And we were getting signing off the ship for a, a month. You do three months on and three months off. And what I noticed in the corner was the wages. There was two suitcases. And it was just full of £10 notes like this and 20 pounds, and it was incredible. I just looked at it, I took one look, and I went, oh, my God, I'm having that. That's the first thing I thought of. There must have been thousands, and because th there was 1,800 staff on the ship, they had to pay out. So we waited for the purses after they'd done the payout, and I followed them back to Cunard. That's where they came from. Anyway... Gets off the ship and I thought, go to Liverpool. I know a few fine crime families in the South End that I've been in Borstal with, been in jail with. And I went to two particular ones, very well known they are, in, in, the, in the area of Liverpool. 
I had cases, done a lot of violence, and they knew me. And I said to them, do you want to come down to Southampton? And when these fellas, the purses are taking the money, the takings onto the QB2, I said, just have it off them. I said, I'll, I'll drive, or I can take it. Because I'd done the snatches and night safes, and we were experts at that. So I said, I'll drive. And anyway, they said, okay, we'll come down to Southampton. Anyway, they didn't show up, and I was very disappointed at them. So I left it. Goes back on the QE2 and started carrying on. So we'd done a whale cruise, finished the whale cruise, a lot of stars on there. So this day goes back on and signs on. And this guy said to me, Oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, Yeah, okay. I'll be the butler. And it, the service was no difference. It's all silver service. And it's the personality. And it's just the way it was. So I said, okay. So I went up to the penthouses. And I started working in the penthouses. We had two floors. And then down below we had the Queen's Grill. It was the best service in the world you've ever seen. Anyway, he was coming on. He was coming on the ship. Elizabeth Taylor. Oh. And Richard Burton. They're coming on the ship, and they've been on a, a lot before, I heard. So, took care of them a few times. And one, I always remember one night, she, she's had a few drinks, Elizabeth. And um, she said, Teddy, can I get another drink, please? And I went, yeah, sure. Gets to the drink, goes to the room. And she was, she was a beautiful woman. And I looked at her, and you know, as you see beauty when you're traveling with, around the world, you see different cultures and you see different people. And I seen this woman and looked at her. I always remember our Liverpool sense of humor. And I, get, I knocked on the door and I gave her the drink. And Richard was downstairs and he was gambling because they had a casino on there. And I, I looked at her and I just looked at her and I went, I wish you were 19. <laughs> And she looked at me and smiled. And I went, good night. And she went, good night. <laughs> and I had a look like a bit of a friendship with her. So but you that, actually flirted with Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? What's wrong with that? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I think every man on the planet would worry. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I, I honestly think if she would have been 19, I think she would have flirted with me. <laughs> I, think she, I think she would have liked to. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So... But then, you know, with the, um, the mind of a criminal, there was things going through my mind that I didn't like. And one of the things that I came up was to, to steal Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds. And one particular diamond was the, in, the ring that Richard bought for 8 million. And it was easy. It was in the room. It was so fascinating. So I thought of that in the back of my mind. So on the ship, we have this thing called the pig with all the staff drinking the pig. So I went down there one night and I walks in. I was on my own. Took my uniform off, put a white shirt on, a grey pair of pants. And I walked in, there was a girl sitting at the bar. And I took a look at her. So she's nice. And she's sitting by herself. And I went over and said, all right, love, how are you? Do you want a drink? She went, yeah, I'll have a drink. I said, what do you do? She said, oh, she was from London. She said, I'm the manager of the, the jeweler store. I said, are you? She went, yeah. She said, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm in the penthouses. And sometimes I'm topside. And I said... I said, are you the manager of the store where, they, where all the shops are? She went, yeah. So I said, all right. So I had a few drinks with her. She was absolutely gorgeous. Really beautiful woman. And um, she was only 19. I said, do you want to come out with me tomorrow in New York? I'll take you out for dinner. She said, yeah. So I took out for dinner. Nothing we ever became of it. We were just friends. 
So one night I said to her, do you want to come and have a drink with me? And she went, no, I can't. I'm doing the inventory. I said, what inventory? She went for the jewellers. So my head starts going again. Hang on, the inventory for the jewellers? <laughs> now you're talking about high class in these days. Very high class. So she told me, I said, well, let me bring a beer up to you and we can have a, a drink together in the jewellers. So what goes up? Goes up there. And she said, oh, we're putting all new displays in. And she's doing the inventory. And I'm looking at the inventory. I said, how much is here? And she went, it's about five and a half million. She said, we're going to be putting the displays out and we're going to be putting the diamonds and on display. It's a new thing. And I went, oh my God. I'm going to have the lot of it. That's the first thing I thought of. Who, who, who am I going to do it with? Soon as the ship docks in New York, right up to see Ronnie Gibbons. I know Ronnie. He's the main man. Shoots up there. Ronnie, he's training it all. Wait for me, Terry. Same old dance. Comes down. Said, listen, I've got two things here, lad. Let's go and have a beer. No, he didn't drink and I, he just drank water and I had a beer. And then, but they're sitting in the dining room on 42nd Street. And um, they'd just done the movie Taxi Driver. And I'd gone past that and I was watching them do that movie. And um, I said, listen, lad, I said, um, what do you fancy on this, lad? Get on the ship. I said, there's about five million on, on, in, the, um, in the display cases. I said, oh, you can have Elizabeth Taylor's jewellers. I said, but you know what? Elizabeth Taylor's a lovely woman, you know, wouldn't like to really steal off her. It was sort of setting in then. I thought that, you know, my life was getting a bit more better and I was doing well. So our goal was to do the jewellers. So being on the ship a while, and I was doing well, I was making a lot of money, coming home, was going to buy a house in Liverpool, and I'd met my future wife, which was Annette, and she was my lovely sweetheart, got engaged to her, and I went back to the QE2, and um, still had lots of friends on the QE2, and so the plan was we're going to do the jewellers, there was five million on display in the middle of the night when it was docked in New York, when everyone was asleep, we were going to use a, a fire hydrant on the ship. Me and Ronnie would have masks on together and then we had gloves and then he would put all the diamonds into a bag and then we had my room where I would go to. We had different levels of the ship. We were on the bottom of the ship. That was our accommodation. That's what we would do. All of a sudden, I bring Ronnie on the ship. And I, I look behind me. And we're getting followed. And then these two guys said, excuse me. And I went, yeah. He went, um, we know you. Who's this guy? I said, he's my friend, he's just coming on for some lunch. No, you're not. You, off the ship. So I walked down with him. They took him off the ship. And they said to me, when we get back to Southampton, we need to speak to you. So I just carried on with my work. Guess to Southampton in the morning. We dock at seven o'clock from Transatlantic. Four busies. I knew they were busies. I knew they were coppers, detectives and that. But I didn't know which squad they were from. Takes me. Takes me in a car. Takes me to the Cunard building. Sits down with me and he said to me, um, you're a member of the Irish Republican Army. And I went, what? I said, no. Oh, yes. You've been drinking with the Irish Republican Army. Do you drink with Irishmen on the ship? I went, yeah. I said, I have a drink with them. So at the time, the Irish Republican Army 
we're going to blow the QE2 up to smithereens. And what it was, I was drinking with a couple of them. <laughs> so they had done a check on the ship of all our criminal records and Bump targeted me. Oh, no. So I got sacked. They found enough gelanite in Southampton to blow the whole ship up. They got two of the guys that I was drinking with. I think they got 15 to 20 years. I don't know where the tip came from. So next thing I got sacked. Where am I again? I'm back onto the streets of Liverpool. I'm back on the streets. I go home, just had a lovely life on the, on the Queen Elizabeth II for a few years. Bought a nice car. I was going to buy it home. So I decided to get married. I got married. And I had a big, like, um, a massive wedding with the money I'd saved off the QE2. I was making thousands, thousands on the side. And I got married. And it was it was in the item suites. It cost me a fortune. Oh, I was, like, 400 people at the wedding. And it was like... Um, if you looked at if you looked at the Godfather's wedding and you looked at my wedding today, it was similar. It was actually similar. Because people look at my wedding albums now and they say, This is like the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a blue suit on, velvet suit. Look at you. Look at this. 400 people, big party. After the wedding, I was on my own. So I drove down to my mother's house and I passed a, a bus stop and there was a guy at a bus stop. So I pulled the car around and he was a bit of a hard lad, this kid. Very tough guy. I don't know if you heard of Eitan Baddies. In, in a, there's an area, suburb in Liverpool called Eitan. Eitan? Eitan, yeah. That's next to Witness. Cr yeah. Witness, Cranton, Eitan. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right. So there's... Some hard kids in Eighton, really hard, oh, yeah. hard, tough guys. It was very renowned in, in England, and he was one of them. So I pulled the car up and went, all right, lads, where are you going? He said, um, oh, I'm just going to do something. And he knew me very well that he could trust me. So he said to me, can you give us a... He said, I'm waiting for the bus. I'm waiting ages here for the bus, the 60 bus, they're going to Bootle from Queen's Drive. So I said, yeah, I'll get in. So we go see our Teddy, he said, I'm not sound, you know what, I might bend you in on this. And I went, what is it? And he sort of wouldn't tell me, he said, go on. He said, well, I'm going to the gyro in Bootle. Now, the gyro is the biggest place in Liverpool where it dis distributes all the money to the post offices in the whole of Liverpool. And I'm going, all right. So he said to me, will you meet me here tomorrow? He tells me that, and then it's in my head. It's gone white in my head. I meet him the next day. And he sits down, he said, um, he's with another guy. And then this, he said to me, this guy, he said, this is Jacko Fitzpatrick. He's from Cantrell Farm, next to Eiton. And I said to him, I've got just got a flat in Cantrell Farm off um, the government. I'm moving there. And he went, are you? He said, yeah, well, he said, I'll be in the Black Horse. I said, OK, I'll see you in there. But he was older than me, a lot older. And he'd done the approved schools and everything. But I'd heard that he was one of the greatest bank robbers in the northwest of England. This is how I, I start my life with him. And he said to me, Terry, are you sure you want to get into this? And I went, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Because I was in fear of no one. I could fight. And the only thing to me was not carrying any guns. I was a little bit against that. Because I had the power to take anyone down or any security men. Anyone, we had that power. 
and I would always be the leader. So this particular day, Jacko would spoke to me. He was in another pub and he said, I'll tell you confidentially. He said, but I jack in a van in Cantrell Farm. It's the first stop. It'll be 65,000. We reckon 65,000 to 100 grand. He said, Teddy, do you want to drive the car? I said, well, to be honest with you, I've been to the gyro and I've done my own surveillance and I'm going to be doing what you're doing. So I said to him, I've been following a van and it's going to Outer Bootle into Sefton and it does 11 drops. So I worked it out for three months. The 11 drops would be about a quarter of a million pounds at the time. So I went out. I picked a guy from um, one of the toughest guys from Kirby in Liverpool. And then I picked my old partner, John Lally, because I'd been done so many things with John. And I picked another guy who was a bit of a tough guy, but really, he was a shit house. When it comes to it, he was going to be the second driver. The first driver I had was a, a guy called Paul Williams. Was one of he could have been a racing driver. This guy, he learned us how to steal cars, and we had a group called the Hell and the VH drivers, the Vic Hell drivers. In between Norris Green and Walton, and we drop all the you know the Capris, the Cortinas, and. Everything that we'd rally with them, we'd get the MGBs and, that, and we'd have the police chase us and we'd always get away. And Paul was the best. So he would be on the first driver. My second driver was Frank Glass. He's a tough guy. So we thought he was. And heavy man from Kirby and me and John. I was the main man. This was set up for three months. We would strike... On, it was a bank holiday at the end of April that the following weekend, the following weekend it was a bank holiday, so that there would be two loads of money. And we would strike at nine o'clock. It was all set up. I'd taken them there. I got the safe house ready. I had the safe house ready from another tough guy that I was in Boston with was all taken but nobody knew where I was going I would be the main man to carry if any trouble started I would give them the directions what to do where we're going and what we're going to do to hijack it so in Los Angeles there was a movie called Heat brilliant one of the greatest uh, I've ever seen now they are actors in life, when you've done something like this, what we were going to do, I don't know where it comes from and who we are and why we're doing it, but it takes something, some men to do it, and especially to do this. I'd always remembered about the great train robbery, which probably was easy to stop a train and just get some mailbags. The whole objective of doing a ro a robbery is to get away. It is one of the most significant things is to do is to get away. And then the men that you're doing it with is that you don't leave any forensic and then you don't leave any of this. No grassing. So we're all set. The night before, they'd all had the, had the directions what to do. The night before, we'd had a few drinks. That following morning, from the nervous system, I was being sick from nerves because it was, it, it was a heavy job. Now, in 1969, there was a job done in, in um, Liverpool. Um, it was called the Water Street Bank. And my friend had done that Water Street Bank. His name was Tommy Comerford, who had got to know very well and then also there was another gang from Heighton 
when I was doing physiotherapy in Walton, a guy called Tommy Smith, and they hijacked a, a sorting office in um, Worcestershire. And, but the police were waiting for them. They got a tip off. And Tommy got shot in the arm. And Tommy Comerford would give a, a, a cigarette light, lighter to a lawyer. And the cops seen it. And they caught Tommy, and Tommy got 10 years. So I knew that we would be, we were, if we were caught, we would get a long sentence. But we didn't care. And also, I was married. And I, I don't know why, but we, we set out to do it. It was all set that morning. No one knew what I was carrying. I never told anyone. The van pulls up. The car's supposed to pull up beside the van. All the windows are down on the van. John would get the guy on the floor, in the back, put all the bags into the down windows, into the back of the truck, the, the car, the stolen car. Paul pulls up. I'm watching. They're too slow. John doesn't make it. The guy gets out. He's got one bag. As he's taking it in, there's a guy standing on the door. What does he do? He doesn't go for the bag. He punches him with a heavy punch. The post office guy who's carrying the bag flies through the window, smashes right through it. The plate glass window, as big as this wall, he goes through the window, he's cut to pieces. Now, there's a line, a queue, all getting the pensions, because it's double money. There's a milk float in the corner here. This goes off, and I'm going, Oh my God, he hasn't got, he hasn't got the bag. The guy would not let go of the bag. So I ran from behind a tree. We're all, we've got the masks on. We're all in black. I go over and I grab the guy. He's cut to pieces and he won't let go of the bag. So I had a rifle down one part of my body here that was loaded. And on this side, I had a claw hammer. So I said, let go. And he wouldn't let go. So what I decided to do was take the claw hammer out and just threaten him. I didn't want to hit him. And I was so shocked what's going on. We had to follow through. They would add my orders. I get the bag. It's a big bag. It's, it's, there's a significant amount of money in there that we'll never get. But it's all gone wrong. Absolutely gone wrong. Paul's in the car. A guy comes behind the car and whams us in. And we can't get out. We're stuck. Imagine this. All the people that are getting the money run to the milk float. They get the bottles of milk and they start throwing them at us in the car we cannot get out the car i get out i go around paul get out drags him out get in the back get in the back so i did the the vic hell drive movement the hell driver vic hell drivers put the car into reverse Put the clutch very low, let it out a little bit. Vroom! Boom! Push him off us. Push him off us. I got the car out. Next thing, all the bottles, as we were getting into the car, were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. But we got the bag. I'd actually got the bag. And one of the things is, I was going to pull the rifle out. And I was going to shoot it at the, the bystanders in the air to back off us. But I'd, I didn't have to use it. I left it. We get off. Now we've got to get to the second car. 
die presste Screamer auf. Und was did you die carry a Screamer mit dem? As the one man will stand, he has a Screamer. It's called a black box Screamer. When that goes off, it's like an alarm, but it screams crazy to scare you away. That was going off. The alarm was going off in the post office. And we could hear the police sirens coming. And I went, oh my God, this has all gone wrong. We get to the second getaway car. was in a construction zone. I get there. I see a taxi. It's not the guy's car, the stolen car that he should have got the night before. It's his own taxi. And I'm going... What the fuck is he doing? And I look to the right and there's a little kid mixing cement. And of all the commotion that morning, the kid's mixing the cement and he sees these guys all in black with masks on getting in the taxi. What does he do? He takes the taxi number. Of course. He took the taxi number. So I told the taxi driver, Frank... Go home, lad. You're going to get it. Just say you picked us up as a fair. Drop me and John at the safe house. The other two went. Bump. I get in the safe house. Takes all my clothes off. It was all organised. In plastic bags. Got to be burnt. New set of clothes. Got the bag. Got the bag on there. Could still hear the police sirens. John's quiet. John was a quiet lad, he didn't say nothing. I'd done most of the work. Anyway, we sit down, we're having a cup of tea, calming down. We had new clothes on. And my plan now was, the taxi driver's going to get caught. We're going to get it. So my plan was to go to the east end of London. I'd been in London with a few gangsters in Barking Road in Cannon Town. And I'd worked with a few of them. And I met them on the QE2. So anyway, I opened the the bag as a seal on it. It has a silver steel. It's a seal on it. And on that seal, it says how much money's in there. How many twenty pound notes? How many ten pound notes? How many five pound notes? And there was thirty three thousand in it. And I that's not bad, but you know, we should have imagined what was left in the back. Imagine what was left in there. So I said to John, listen, I'm going to leave the money in here. We're not paying no one until we see who gets arrested. So the guy's house that we're in, in the, in, in the um, safe house, he goes out that day and he gets the, the Liverpool Echo. Here we are. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo, the biggest headlines, one of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. And um, I was like, oh my God. I didn't realise. So that night when it went dark, I had a car delivered to the house and I drove to London. Stayed in London, but I'd, I'd had some connection with some Solicitors at the time that I knew were bent that I could talk to. And I phoned a guy and I said, All right, how are you doing? All right, good. Did you get on that today? Yeah, I did. Okay, what's the outcome? It's you. I said, Really? It's me? He went, Yeah. It's you. I said, okay, I'll see you. So I was stuck in London. So the big, big shots in the, in the, in the, the, the serious crime squad all over the city, from police station to police station, are on me. Where is he? And John, like, John's just quiet. Said, John, they're going to be on us. So I had no alternative to return back to Liverpool. Gets back to Liverpool, goes in a bar, 
and this big tough guy comes over to me and he said to me, all right. And I looked at him and I went, all right. He went saying, where's Frank's money? And I looked at him and I went, you talking to me? He went, I am talking to you. I said, I don't know you. No, fuck off. Well, I said, I've just told you, mate. Fuck off. I don't know you. And he starts mounting off. And I said, hey, lad, go away. So I knew Frank had gassed us up. Whoa. I know he'd put us in it. He'd fucking really put us in it. So someone had gone, I'd had a party in Liverpool after the wedding. And someone knew where I was, where I lived. No one knew where I lived. That morning I came out. Three weeks later, I'm surrounded by about 20 police officers. Got me against the wall. Never said nothing to me. Never read no Remanda rights. No rights. Put your hands behind the back, you're under arrest. I know they were loaded with guns at the time. I knew. They had gloves on and everything. 20 of them came that morning. They got me. <clears throat> Takes me into custody. My, I've never said a word in my life in custody. And anyway, basically, I was under investigation. Under Anyway, they said to me, you're going on an identification parade. So I said, okay. They had picked a, a, an old lady who was 65 years of age. She had thick glasses. And she picked me out. That was enough for them to charge me. They charged me robbery with force with a hammer. And the headlines was Wade on the post office, hammer gang. And how it was structured in the news about the milk and the glass and the blood. And I write that chapter in my book. The glass, the milk, and the blood. I've wrote that. So it goes into this, it goes back to Risley, where I'd been as a kid. And now I'm, I'm I think I'm 22, 23. Something was 23, 22. And I'm in Risley, and it's infested with all the gangsters. And I'm walking around the yard. And who's in there? Tommy Cummer, Tommy Cummerford. And he comes behind me, and it's all in the news. There wasn't many bank robbers in there at the time. It was mostly for importation. I did not know much about importation till later on in life. So next thing, this he comes behind me, Tommy, and he goes, um, "All right, lad, you're the new bank robber on the block, are you?" Yeah. I just looked at him. Anyway, he goes to court. I went to court. And um, he come back to me and he went, how are you doing and that? And he said, I was involved in the Water Street Bank in 1969 and I got 10 years. And he was asking me about the case. I said, I don't know much about it. You know, I said, I wasn't there. I said, I was in bed. <laughs> I don't know fuck all about it. I was in bed. And they were all in there then. Um, Charlie Seeger was in there. John Haas, um, and the Bennett South End. I got to know some of them. I just sat with some of them and that, you know. John Haas was the guy who did. John was quite big. He had the big security where they'd done something. They got 18 years and the MPs let him out. And um, Charlie Seeger was a, um, a good friend of mine, best friend who had met Charlie a few times. And he'd been involved in a murder. And he wrote a book, Killer. With um, one of, I think it was one of Cray's ex um, wives, he was involved with one of them. So I knew Charlie, and all my friends knew Charlie. So anyway, I'm in Grizzly, and a, a friend of mine came up to me after about four months. It was John Conti's brother, Jerry. Jerry being arrested for um, travellers' checks, three million on the docks. And he came up to me one morning and he said to me, Terry, you've got bail. 
I put a bail hearing in um, to the um, the Crown in London where the three judges listened to it at the old bailey. And they said, you've got bail. I went down to the PO's office. They come out and they said to me, yeah, you've got bail. Next thing, bump, walks out of Risley after six months. The judge had said to them in the court, why is this man being arrested? It wasn't because of Frank Lass. His evidence is admissible against the co-accused. He said, how is this man being arrested? He said, I've read the reports. The post office men said that they were attacked. I'd mash some. Why would a woman pick me out? So anyway, the trial's going to start. This big trial's going to start. So I've got a, um, got a QC from Manchester. He was a judge called David Brown. Then I had um, a guy called Turner. He worked on the Bulger case. He was defence for the in, in the Bulger murder. He did the, the kids, John Venables and the other kid, when they killed um, Jamie Bulger. David Turner was the defence attorney for them. And at the time, he was a junior barrister for me. So what they told me, the trial was going to start and I'd met them, my solicitor. My solicitor at the time was um, Rob Brody, who was very known in the city. And he told me, he said, you know, just listen to your barristers. So the barrister said, yeah, you've got 50-50. And I said, well, what's the other 50? Or 50 get off, what's the other 50? He said, 10 years. Ten years. And I said, okay. So the trial's going to start three weeks before Christmas. So what I did, I wore a blue suit, a shirt and a nice tie. Got my hair all cut off and I had a razor part here. Goes into, with my wife into the, the crown court. My barrister comes out, sees me, he's like, oh my God, the gallery's full. The court's full. Watching, going to watch the trial. He goes back in the court. So I looks over and I've seen all the coppers. They were down the end of the court. And there's the witness sitting by herself. And I looked at her and I went over to her and I said to her, how are you doing, Mrs. Seenor? My name's Detective Sergeant Smith. <laughs> I met you at the police station. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, she said. I remember you. I said, everything's going to be fine today. And I walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so next thing, the trial starts. <laughs> the trial starts. <laughs> yeah. Next thing, the lawyers get up, give the peace, I had this queen counsel. I'm going to prove today that Mr. Mugan did the robbery. He's the hammer man. He's done numerous robberies in this city. He threw that into the jury, which is, should have been a well, that's, you can't do that. The judge just looked at him. That's how bad he wanted me. So my lawyer stands up and he goes, QC Brown, he says, Mr. Mugan, I want you to go into the box. Your name is Mr. Mugan, is that correct? I said, yes. The jury is there. The gallery's full. I'm, I'm just standing there. Your Honor, we're going to call the witness. Yes. The judge's name was QC Temple. He was the one that gave me the bail. He actually came from London, particularly for this case. It was a sign to him that he wanted it. For some reason, I'm in the box, in the crown. I'm standing there. My lawyer says to the witness, can you state your name? She gives a name. He looks at her and he says, I want you to name that man that's in the box. She looks and she goes, 
Yeah, that's Detective Sergeant Smith. <laughs> <laughs> the judge went like that with his glasses. He said, I'll give you one more question. He turns around and he says to her, was you shown any photographs in the police station? Oh, yes. <laughs> was it Mr. Mugan? She went, oh, yes. The judge just went like that. Took his glasses off. Rubbed his eye. <laughs> he went, I've heard enough. I'm stopping the trial. I'm stopping the trial. They came back, sent the jury out, came back in. Clerk of the court got up. Judge told him, I want you to find Mr. Mugan not guilty. Wow. I get a not guilty. Wow. How'd that feel? I walked out the court. I was congratulated by the jury and all the people in the gallery. Terry, well done. <laughs> and I went, fucking well done. <laughs> I went, I haven't done nothing. Frank Glass would be sentenced to three years of probation for being a, a police informer. He told them everything. But his evidence couldn't go against mine. However, when I walked out of that courtroom, I was a wanted man. Mm. I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on a 24-hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool, and I didn't know. I did not know. And then it starts again. It's going to all start again. Oh, God. And you're going to have to wait for part two of this series to hear what happens next, because it's going to get even more mental. So if you've enjoyed this, please let us know in the comments what you think. And Terry, like like we said earlier, do you want to lift that up, Jen? Lift the banner. Of yeah. We are going to be, you know, Terry's going to be keeping us updated on when his book's coming out. Do you want people to go over to your Instagram or anything like that? Yeah, actually, it's called The Hollywood Butler. <laughs> I like. And don't forget our sponsor, Cora, as well. Link is in the description box. 5% off code True Crime. Yeah. The Thank Hollywood you. Butler. Hollywood, the Hollywood Butler. Butler. The Instagram. Hollywood I mean, Butler. I love that photo of you. You look very... It's all black and white. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man, give us a hug, brother. <laughs> what a journey. Right, round two. Yeah. Right. What a journey. Well done. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So real. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, been an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialized with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honour. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. And I look to the left, and it's Michael Caine. He's in the same car, but it was yellow. And I went, good morning, Michael. And he looked at me and I went, not bad for the Scouser, is he? <laughs> <laughs>
and they told me it was um, a, um, a TSB that was delivering a large amount of money. So we parked the van across the street. We all got tooled up. We got our masks on and we waited by the bus stop. These police cars are coming down. They've got the lights flashing. There, 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 there. Next thing, Joey said they're turning around. They're coming after us. Big heavy gangsters that are new and um, we'd had a Chicago warfare in the 70s in Liverpool. He had a big reputation. He went on to have a bigger reputation when he was, you know, in, on, the, on the importation. And he was very well respected in Liverpool. But I didn't respect him. After this, I thought, no, you're, you're going to get it, mate. George Harrison lived next door to him. On the other side was Barbara Streisand. Down the street was Gregory Peck. Rod Stewart. Frank Sinatra. At the bottom was Elvis. And facing Elvis was Michael Jackson. On this side of my brain, it was beautiful. But on the other side of the brain, it was dark. I was on the run. All right, we are in part two of this epic journey with Terry Mugan, who's flown over from California. Check out part one if you've not seen it. It's the early years, upbringing in an abusive cur home situation, then gets into the street gang level of stuff and quickly getting professional and proficient at armed robberies. So the crimes are escalating rapidly and we left off with... Uh, we were just about to talk about the surveillance by the Serious Crime Squad, but you had a story about Joey. Joey, yeah. Uh, yes. Joey. So eventually, after that was acquitted, Joey was my partner, and he'd asked me to... There was two other guys from the city of Liverpool in, that lived in the city centre. So Joey had asked me, he said, can we bring these other two guys and They've got a job for us to do. And he said, go and get Terry. And I went, okay, I'll take a look. But I'd, I'd heard of them, these two lads. And they were notorious, but no, they'd never been caught. And they were pretty tough lads. So I decided I'd meet them. And they, they knew everyone that I knew. And so they approached me and they said, um, there's a, a van coming th th um, through the city. And Terry, do you fancy having it? So I said, whereabouts is it? And they told me it was um, a, um, a TSB that was delivering a large amount of money. So I asked them the situation and they said, there's quite a bit of money in there. We've had the surveillance on it. We've had people go into the bank, a few of our friends, and it's quite sufficient money. I said, yeah, okay. And I'll, yeah, I'll have a go. So next thing, I didn't know I was under surveillance. And Joey was quite a bit of a tough kid. And these two fellas were pretty good. So I said, well, who's going to take him? That was the plan. So there was a bus stop on Scotland Road by the TSB. We have the safe house off Westminster Road set up. Then we have another house up in Anfield set up by a friend, my friend's house, because I could trust him. I knew, I knew what I was going to do. So we parked the van across the street. We all got tooled up. We got our masks on and we waited by the bus stop. It was about 1.30. And it was one of the guys' jobs to jump on the guard, take him. Then I had, a, I had a special way of getting the box off them. If you get them down, it's called a one, two, three pin, pin down move, where you get them on the floor. And then the arm was, the foot would go on the arm here and would squash the muscle. And then they'd release the box here in the hand. That was my pin down move. So I said, you get them down. I said, and I'll do the pin down on them. Anyway, we're waiting there, we're anxious, and we've got these big, it's in October, and it's a cold day. So it was a good opportunity to get nice and covered up. We were tooled up to pieces. If anything went wrong, we were just going to, uh, basically our job was not to hurt anybody. That was our motive. But our motive was just to get the money, and we'll do one. So Joey had just been in jail. He'd just been, just done three years for something 
I can't remember what it was. It could have been a robbery. And, and then he was back at it. So that's the way we were. So Joey, and come on, okay, Terry. So we parked across Scotland Road in the flats, put the van there. And we had this house in Anfield to go to. Next thing, Joey comes over. We're at the bus stop. Joey's down the side. My mate's at the bus stop. Soon the van comes, the security van comes, secure the car. We waited for them to get out, and then what did you do? They knock on, they give it a knock for him to release the box inside. So they knocked on, my friend just jumped on him, I ran at him, locked him down, done the pin down move on him. Within, I think it was about two, in his statement, he said, um, he had the box off me in three seconds. He's actually got it off me. That was in his statement. We ran across Scotland Road into the van. I was the only one that got in the van. I didn't know what the other two were doing. They just done one. They got away. So I'm in the van. Joey's driving the van. And I've got the box. Next thing. We're going through Scotland Road up Vauxhall Road, and then we, we cut into Anfield. And as we're going up this hill called Everton Valley, these police cars are coming down. They've got the lights flashing. There, 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 there. Next thing, Joey said, they're turning around. They're coming after us. And I went, what? He said, yeah. They're on our sail, Teddy. And I went, just keep going, Joey, to the house. Just keep going there. So next thing, Joey hits a car. It's a car, smashes into a car. He's panicking. Boom, I said, just keep going. When we get to the house, just get out and do one, okay? So next thing, we get to this um, house called Randall Street in Anfield, and Joey jumps out. I jumped out. All the bit, all the coppers are behind us. And there must have been about 10 of them. All the pandas are behind us. So we, we run through this house, runs through an entry. I've got the box. I get to, Joey gets lost. I go to another house, to the safe house, to my friend's house, locks the door, takes the box upstairs, and it's the six flats in there, so I hide in the top flat. Get the box and I put it under the bed. Next thing, we're surrounded. I can't get out. The police just come in, they smash the door down, eventually got up to the, the top floor of the flat, kicked it in, came in, grabbed me, they got me. I was I was in there alone because my friend wasn't home. They got me, put the cuffs on me, and they started battering me, kicking up me, and come on, we fucking got you now. Next thing, they takes me down, gets me in the Black Mariah, boom, straight to St. Anne's Street. Can I ask a quick question? How did they go straight to you? Is there a trace or something in the box? No. How just... did they know to go to exactly where you was? Well, because they'd followed us, okay. because I was running, yeah, and they knew that I'd, I'd gone to that house. Okay, yeah, yeah, they knew that I was in okay. the house. They were right behind me. There yeah. was about fucking twenty. There's no then. hiding. Yeah, there was no hiding this time. Yeah. Couldn't get out of it. So next thing they get me. Next thing, all the serious crime squad from the city come. Ah, uh, they've got me now. So next thing, we're in this, we're in this cell, and I hear Joey next door. I hear Joey. And he's going, Teddy, are you in there? And I went, yeah, all right. He said, have you been charged? I went, yeah. He said, we're going to the magistrates in the morning. I said, have you been charged? He went, yeah. Anyway, they charged us with um, robbery, with force. And in the van, they found all the tools. They found an hatchet. They found, um, it was like a small handgun. And then they found a, um, a pickaxe handle. And they found a hammer. So they had all the evidence. So anyway, early hours in the morning, we're getting, we got took to the um, city centre, the Bridewell, and it was the most, I thought, oh, I've had it now. You know, my time's, I'm done. They've got me banged to rights. And Joey's like, Teddy, you know, I've just done two years in jail, you know, was, you know, we might get 10 years. So anyway, we go to the magistrates, straight away custody gets put in custody. They've got us now. Anyway, we go to my old lawns, goes to Risley, gets in Risley, and gets banged up together, me and Joey. 
So we're doing our just thing, just carrying on slowly. So one day, I thought it was very unusual. Joey got a visit. And they called me and said, um, Joey, right? And he gets this visit. And he goes out. And I'm just sitting on my own. I thought, I wonder what's going on here? He's got a visit. You know, it's not visiting time. <sighs> it was a bit odd. So when he came back, and then in the afternoon we're on the exercise yard, and he said to me, I've just had a visit. I said, I know, yeah, who's that? Who's, who's he had a visit off? He said it was um, a couple of the top series crime squad from St. Anne Street. I said, yeah. And he said, um, I've got them boxed off. I've got it sorted. He said, I've, he said, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm giving them 5,000 quid. He said, and we're going to get out. And I went, what? I said, no, it's impossible. I said, they've been after me for years, Joey. They're not going to let me out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going, really? He went, yeah. He said, I said, no fucking way, lad. They're not going to let me out. He said, no, Terry, we're going to get out. And I started asking questions and I didn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it either. And no. I think no. I just take the money and run. Yeah. So anyway, what happened is um, the detective, he used to do surveillance on me when I was out on bail for the um, the post office van. I had 24 hour surveillance and his name was Smith. And that's where I used that name for the woman in the trial. It was the same police officer. I used his name. That's how I, I, I knew it was him. So next thing, we go to the, the magistrates and they bring us up. And uh, the magistrate was Wharton. He, he was a horrible bastard. He was just, he, he just put you in custody. You couldn't get out, even with kids for shoplifting. And me and Joey goes up, goes in there. And um, he was a bit hunched over, but he had like a funny back. He must have had arthritis or scoliosis in his back. The way he, he, he leans over in the court. And he looked and he had these glasses and he spoke out the side of his mouth. He went, and these are the two robbers that did the robbery. <laughs> and Mogan, he's been, he's been in front of me before. I know him. And, <laughs> and I'm going, fuck you, you old bastard, yeah. <laughs> and so what's the situation? Where's the police officers in this case? This is a very serious crime. And where are they? And the prosecution said, um, they're not here to oppose the bail, you know. What am I supposed to do? He stuck the magistrate. He doesn't know what to do. And it was causing mayhem in the court. <laughs> and Joey's <laughs> looking at me. I thought, fucking hell, what's he going to do here? We're going to get out here. <laughs> so next thing, next thing, he comes to a decision and he says, okay, you must call the police station and tell them I'm, I'm, I'm postponing this till two o'clock this afternoon. Um, put them back in custody. I can't let them out. I can't let them go. I need the police here. And uh, so next thing, we go downstairs, me and Joey. And next thing, Joey says, don't worry, Terry. I said, what happens if they show up? I said, they might fucking show up. And he goes, no, they're not going to show up. He said, they've took an holiday, two weeks holiday. No. <laughs> yeah. He said, they took two weeks. They took two weeks holiday. So next thing. He goes up at two o'clock, there's still no fucking serious crime squad. So the magistrate says, Oh, but I, I, I have no choice, I've got to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. It was unbelievable. So we said so me and Joey have just done one of the biggest robberies on Scotland Road and the magistrates is letting us go because of the cops. Joey's got the cops. And Joey's got the cops all boxed off. But then wow. so we walks out the court. Walks out the court. My wife was there and Joey's wife was there. They didn't know each other. And um, but he was with two gangsters, Joey. Big heavy gangsters that I knew and um We'd had a Chicago warfare in the 70s in Liverpool. And I knew a lot of them on the bouncers, on the doors and that, you know. But I, I just said hello to them and never ever got involved with any of them. But there was two of them showed up when Joey got out and they knew me. And uh, they went, all right, Terry. And I said, yeah, all right, how are you? And they said, and I just looked at them and I went, what are you doing with him? And I thought, this is a bit heavy, isn't it? And I said to Joey, um... Where are you going? 
You know, I'm just going down here. And what he had, he'd had a plan that he was going into the Bridewell to meet Smith to make a statement. He'd gone into the Bridewell with these two guys. They were his minders. And um, I said to him, hey, mate, be fucking careful what you're doing, you know. I'm telling you, I just sensed it. I knew what he was up to. So next thing, he goes in the Bridewell, he makes a statement. He said that he had nothing to do with the robbery, and it was me. Oh, man. And he said that he'd lent me the van. But he didn't name the other two fellas, only me. So that would put him off the hook. So next thing, at the committal, I got the, the depositions and I read them. And it was all in there. So I kept it quiet. How did that feel though, reading that initially? Yeah, and the betrayal. Well, obviously we're gonna, he's going he's gonna to suffer. We're going to take him, serious consequences against him. And later on his life would be the, there would be a contract on his life to kill him. Did you feel though, like just so let down and it was an emotion? Well, yeah, well, you, you know, you realised he had a, a, a big reputation. He had a big reputation. He went on to have a bigger reputation when he was, you know, in, on, the, on the importation. And he was very well respected in Liverpool. But I didn't respect him. After this, I thought, no, you're, you're going to get it, mate. We're going to get you. You know, we are going to get you. So anyway, what we did, there was another plan in the city centre for the same four guys to hijack a security van next to Water Street. It was a place called Williamson, Williamson Square and it was a bank that we'd watched and they were carrying a large amount of money for, and that money would be delivered to all the, the building sites in Liverpool. So we planned it like for three months, about two months, three months, and we had the plan out to get away, where we were going to go. But in between that, we'd been training, we'd been going to Formby Beach and we'd do like, really physical training, like fighting with each other, putting each other on the floor, running up and down the sand dunes, doing five to eight miles a day, really getting really fit if, if there was ever something would go wrong in one of these jobs. That's what we always did. And then we'd always go to the boxing gyms in Liverpool and we'd always do heavy training, you know. So this day, I'm on the bail and I'd lost it. I'd, I just actually lost my mind because we'd lost that money and I thought, well, we'll make it up on the next one. So this morning was set and it was nine o'clock in the morning, the security, security call van would arrive at Williams Square, but he had to park outside Williamson Square. So we're tooled up, everything. We would meet at 8.45, but this time there was no cars involved because we could run through the city. We know the back entries of the city and where we're going to go. So we decided, okay, we'd all meet at 8.45 and it was at, um, it was at a Bernie's Inn, a restaurant, and it was in a cellar and we got tooled up, put the mask on and we were ready. The van came, he goes in the bank, but however, there was only three of us. Joey never showed up. He doesn't show up. The other two guys show up. I show up to some of three of us. So I, you know, we didn't think nothing of it at the time. We thought, well, you know, there's three of us. We can take him. So I told me, buddy, I said, you go behind him and I want you to stop him in front of the van so that he can't put the box in the van. Then I'll come down behind him. I'll do the pin move on him. I'll just get him down with a, a, a headlock, a one, two, three, bang. I've got him. I've got the box. Then we run through an alleyway and then we close the door behind us and we lock it. However, bump. Next thing, as we're doing the robbery from both ends of Dale Street, as you come around Dale Street by the wine lodge in Liverpool, two, two pandas come around and then they block the other end of the street off and they've got the, the street blocked off and they're coming behind the security van as we're doing it. We were set up. So anyway, I had the box and one of the coppers is chasing me. 
So I'll go right through the city and um, there's a Lloyd's Bank and a, a new Lloyd's Bank. So I took a car park and I got up at the stairs in the car park and I, I laid under the car with the box and I was just watching for any footsteps. I was well ahead of the busy. We were well ahead of them because we were so physically fit. So next thing, I left the box under the car. I thought, I can't take it. And then there was a large, I think it was about probably £90,000 in it. And I thought, well, I don't want to carry this through the city. We had no cars. It was a different, totally different situation. So I thought, well, if I leave this here. But then my mind was panicking, thinking the city was swarming. But outside Lord's Bank, there was a bus stop. And it was the 17D going to Anfield, past Liverpool's ground. And I thought, I'll, I'll just leave it here, under the car. And I went, fuck it, I give in. I'd actually give in, I just, I just left it. Goes down. I took my balaclava off, I dumped it. I took my tools off, I dumped them. Next thing, I took the 17T bus. Went to my mother's house and had a cup of tea with my brother. He said, where have you been? Oh, I said, I've just been to town. What's wrong with you? I said, oh, something went wrong. My brother wouldn't say nothing. He's one of them guys, you know. So next thing, that was it. That was the end of it. Next morning, I thought, just, I was laying in bed. Laying in bed. Wife's asleep. Can't go farm. I had this lovely place. And all the gangsters had been there. They had parties and that. And, and it was like quiet. And I had it like a penthouse. You know, from the money we'd made and I had brand new cars and Cortinas and we had, you know, we'd had, we'd done well. So next thing, about six o'clock in the morning, bump, the door just comes right off the hinges. Bump, about six of them come in. I'm in bed and I've got the shock of my life. Copper puts a gun to my head and he says, get out of fucking bed. You're under arrest. And I went, get that gun away from me, mate. Fuck off. Because that's how, you know, I was crazy at the time. I said, get that gun out of my face. I said, no, get the fuck out of it. Get up. They got me, they pinned me on the floor. My wife screaming. And I went, oh, they've got me here. So next thing, they take me in. They search the house. There's nothing in the house. They tear the house apart. Kitchen everywhere, looking for money and everything. Never, ever found anything. So what happened was, they take me into St. Anne Street and I'm under the surveillance of getting questioned and they're asking me, well, you're involved in this, you're involved in that. And they said, um, we're going to get you on um, quite a few robberies. It'd be approximately four of them. They said, you hijacked a security van outside the gyro with pickaxe handles and you escaped with £73,000. And um, I looked at the file. As I was sitting there, this cop came in from the serious crime squad, and I, had me, I seen the file, and I looked over at it, and it said, Operation Transit, Terry Mugan. And as I looked at it, I went, hmm, I wonder what they've got here. So I just usually, you know, we used our, our skills from when we were a kid. And we just... Absolutely stayed silent. So I'm in, I'm in the police station. It goes on for about 12 hours. And I'm in my underwear and I've got a blanket around me. And there's just no food, no solicitors, no nothing. I thought. So the copper says to me, I tell you what, why don't you admit to one of them? He said, I tell you what, if you admit to the gyro and bootle, We'll let you off with the other three. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going under my breath, fuck off. <laughs> Get the fuck out of it. Who the fuck are you talking to? And I've, I just felt like saying, you know, you're talking to one of the fucking safest men in Liverpool that will never say a fucking word, mate. I've never said a word in my life. So what he said to me, he said, we, we want to get you for attempted murder on the Moss Lane post office that you were found not guilty on, for attacking him with a hammer. That man got seriously injured 
And next, I got to shock of my life. He said, we've got your friend, John Lee. He was pulled in for the bootle job on the gyro and the 73,000. He said, he's admitted to doing the one in Sefton. Was where he's making where, that up? Or yeah, had he course. really done no, it? No, no, they got him. They got him. And so he got pulled in. He actually got pulled in on the job for Bootle on the gyro for 73,000. <clears> they thought it was me and they thought it was him because I was connected with him with the one in, in um, Sefton where he'd punched the guy through the window. And they actually said to him, we're not letting you out. So John, we're going to get you. And he admitted to punching the guy through the window and he gets charged. <sighs> so they said to me, Teddy, if you come up with this, we'll let you go. You admit with John Lee that you'd planned the Moss Lane post office hijacking. And I just looked at them under my breath and I used myself to talk and went, fuck off. You're fucking joking, aren't you? So next thing, anyway, I'm in there. 12 hours had gone by, no solicitor. They wouldn't give me a solicitor. 12 hours had gone by. But this big CID walked and he kicked the door. And he went, get him up. Get him up. Take him to the front of the sergeant. So they go to the front. There's, there's about six of them. And uh, they'd been there all day. They kept asking me. I just wasn't having none of it for many of them. Next thing, sergeant go, what's, what's going on here? Um, he'll be charged with four robberies. And he goes like that, looks at the, the CID and he goes, his name is Walker and Bailey. And he went, well, there could be a problem. I'm just waiting for the court. There's going to be a prison strike. We can't take any prisoners. And I'm going, wow. And I'm standing there in my undies with the big handcuffs on. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, come on. I hope there's a prison strike and they, and they can't take me. And I said, ah, nah, they'll take me. They're gonna, they, there's no way in the world they're going to let me go. Next thing, the sergeant says, um, take him back in. No one waits 15 minutes. And I was on my own. They must have been talking to the sergeant. And I heard them say, they cannot let this man go. So next thing, they come in back to me and they said to me, Okay, you're going to be get charged with four robberies. Um, if you come clean, Teddy, you'll go. You'll probably get fifteen years. If you get you on the four year, if if you get you on the four robberies, and I knew the four robberies, what they were talking about, I knew who done them, who was involved, and I was part of some of it. And they said to me, probably the judge will give you twenty five years. You'll get twenty five years. So I'm standing there, thought, fuck this, I'm saying nothing. I'll take a fucking a chance. I've never, ever since I was a kid, when I stole from the milkman, I never, ever admitted anything in my life. And I'm, I wasn't about to start it now, even though I'd gone into the big time. And so they called me back out. And um, the sergeant said to me, um, Mugen, I want you to come back here tomorrow. And I looked at him and I went, we're giving you 24 hours bail. And I just looked at him and I went, okay. And I had the cuffs like that and it, the cuffs were on me and I just turned like that and I went to that, that to the detective. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, can you, can you take the cuffs off me? And they all started shouting at the sergeant. We, no, you can't release him. You've got to, you've got to get someone in power. This man's got to stay here. And the sergeant, I've told you, we've just had orders from the government. We cannot take any prisoners. There's going to be a strike. So anyway, they took the cuffs off me and it was killing them because they'd been after me for years. So it was going to get blown again. So I just thought, oh my God, this is the great escape. This is the great escape. So next thing I'm sitting there, and they got a shirt and a pair of pants and they said, here, put them on. 
I said, all right, thanks very much. And I was in the city centre on um, St. Anne Street. And they said, okay, make sure you come back tomorrow. <laughs> so I walked down and I just fucking walked out. And I went, I smelled the fresh air. It was a, a cool night. Mm. It was a cool night. It was actually, um, what, what month was it? It was, um, it was December. It was December. And I thought, I'll, I'll shoot up Scotland Road. And I knew everyone there. So I went to this guy's house called um, Jimmy London. I went to his house and I said to him, Jimmy, where does Tommy Gilday live? Because Tommy was a, f- a friend of mine. He'd been arrested for um, assaulting a police officer. And I got to know him well in Risley. And I was in the same cell as him. And I got to know Tommy. He was an upcoming hard case. And I went to Tommy and I went to Tommy, do me a favour, mate. I said, um, can you come to Eighton tomorrow? To Cantrell Farm? I said, and pick me up, you and Jimmy. I said, and, um, I said, can you drive me to London? He said, yeah, all right, Terry. I said, I said, please be there at three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to leave at three. So Tommy drives me home to Cantrell Farm, knocks on the door. My wife opens it and she went, wow. I said, all right, everything okay? Yeah. So I thought, well, actually, they're going to surveil the house. They're watching me. They're watching every move I'd, I'd gone. So I said to my wife, pack me a bag. And I told Tommy to where to park the car in the tunnel so that if the coppers ever come through the tunnel, they couldn't get through it. I'm going to run through the tunnel. It was like a walkway. I said, park at the back of the tunnel and, you, and then flash your lights. I told my wife, she packed a bag. I said, go to your mother's house. I said, and get me 50,000 quid. I said, I want you to meet me tomorrow morning at Pan Am in London. She said, where are you going? I said, don't worry about it. Just do as I say. Get me the money. I've got a little bag. Be at Pan Am in the morning. Please. That's all I've got to say. So early hours in the morning, I looked out the window and I seen the car pulling up. So I got her open, I tied it to the window, to the handle, and I jumped right down from the first floor. I just jumped and I just kept running. And, and it was raining and the rain was coming down on it, it was freezing. And I had a mac on and that and a hut and a hat. Just jumped in the car. I went, all right, Tommy, go ahead, lad. Right up to London, him and Jimmy. And um, I drove to London. It was a, it was a, it was a, a, a very unusual... I, I actually, I, I didn't have a choice. It was either I was gonna, they were gonna get me, or I was gonna, I was gonna go down for a long time. And I, we drove to London, and I, I told them to take me to Pan Am Airlines, and they dropped me off. I said goodbye to Tommy and Jimmy, and um, I said I'll see you, I'll see you, mate. Thanks very much. And I, I walked in, and my wife was sitting there. And as we're sitting there, she went, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I'm sitting there in, in, uh, at the airport at Heathrow. And I said, I don't know where I'm going. So I looked at all the flights. I said, shall I go to Spain? I said, Australia. And, you know, I had a 10-year visa in my passport for America. And, then, and I'd met friends in Miami. I thought, shall I go to Miami? And then I got this thing came through my head when I was on the QE2 and Elizabeth Taylor had told me to go to Hollywood and she'd actually said to me when I was young why don't you be an actor you'd make a brilliant actor I said no I'm not an actor she went Terry even if you were a butler in Hollywood she said they'd love you and anyway I looked at the flight and I went ah fuck it I'll go to LA <laughs> <laughs> So I bought a ticket, a return ticket, and I said to my wife, I want you to sell everything. And I'd had a place in Southport. I'd bought, I'd got a custom caravan made, and it was it was the headquarters. It was at a, a park called Riverside where we would all meet and plan everything, and no one knew about it. I said, and I just had a custom made, and I said, I want you to sell it and sell me cars. I said, get all the money, and I want you to fly out, quit your job, uh, I felt terrible for my wife. And it took me back to the days of like of, um, Bigsy, Ronnie Biggs, what he had gone through. And I was feeling the same thing. 
about Biggs because parts of my life when I was young I'd been on the run and here I am now really big and I was going on the run and I had this horrible feeling so anyway I said to my wife I'll see you and she went where will you be I said well I always remember Santa Monica I'll go to Santa Monica so anyway I kissed her and I was, I was bored in the flight and I was sick as a dog and I couldn't turn around. I was so emotional that it, 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 it had this grip on me that I'd, I was just, I was destroyed. But I thought, I've got to go. So I go, get on the plane. And um, I sat at the back of the plane. There was four seats and they were coming around giving me stuff and that. But I was actually, at the time I was sick. I started, the sickness started kicking in. I wasn't well. From the emotions and there was certain things that was wrong with me from what I'd been doing throughout my life. It was catching up with me mentally. So, get off in Los Angeles. Get off the plane. And in them days, it was like, it was like a bubble. And he just went through, went through the immigration, never asked any questions. And I came out. And it was a lovely day. The sun was shining and it was lovely. So I said to this fellow, where's the taxis, mate? So I jumped in the taxi, got the taxi. I said, take me to Santa Monica, will you? I said, is the hotel a motel? Or? He went, yeah, yeah, I'll take you. So he ends up in this motel called the Carmel Hotel on 2nd Street off Ocean Avenue. And it was a beautiful night and looking at the palm trees and all that. So it goes in this bar. And it was um, called the Cheshire Cat. It was an English pub. And I went in. And the girl looked at me and I looked at her and I went and said, um, do you sell British beers here? She went, oh, yeah. Yeah. I said, what have you got? She said, Newcastle Brown. We've got this. We've got that. I said, just give me Newcastle Brown. And she was nice like. And she went, where are you from? I said, Liverpool. She went, well, the chef, he's from Manchester. I'll go and tell him. So next thing, the chef comes out and I said, all right, mate, how are you? I said, all right, how are you? I said, from Manchester, from Liverpool. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I've just got here for holiday. I'm on holiday. Oh, how are you? Yeah. He said, there's a British bar up the street called the King George V. He said, there's a Liverpool fella in there. He's the chef. I said, all right. I said, I'll go up there later. So I was tired and all that, exhausted. Booked into the car motel. It was cheap. It was like, in them days, it was like, it was like fifteen dollars, oh, and I had loads of money, but I had fifty thousand quid. You know, it was a good, it was a good chunk of change. And then, you know, what else was coming over as well? Want my wife for that, and um, so I got my head down, slept. Next thing, I thought I'll take a walk up Fort Street, Santa Monica Boulevard, and seen the pub. Two o'clock in the afternoon, sunshine and beautiful. I was watching all the Cadillacs go by in the day then. All the lovely, lovely Cadillacs and Mustangs and all the big Jaguars and it was beautiful. I thought this is the life, you know. And I goes in the pub and I sat at the end of the bar and there was a Cockney behind the, the counter, John. He went, all right, mate, what do you want? And I said, um, have you got a pint of lager? Where are you fucking scarce are you? I looked at him and went, yeah. He said, there's one in the kitchen here. He's a fucking pain in the ass." <laughs> and I went, really? <laughs> yeah. And he said, I'll go and have a word with him. So the guy comes out in the kitchen. He comes out and he goes, all right, mate. And he's staring at me. And he went, I know you. He went, I know you. And you, Terry? He said, I slept in your mother's house. He said, I'm a friend of Alan's. And I looked at him and he went, Eddie Creed. And I went, all right, Eddie, how are you, mate? And he went, what are you doing here? So anyway, I said, Eddie, can I talk to you? So I told Eddie what had happened, because Eddie had been in Boston. And, you know, we so I could talk to somebody. I had no one to talk to. So eventually, he said, I can get you the job here, you know. These Norwegians had just bought the pub, come from Norway, and they, want, they paid like a quarter of a million for it. And he was saying to me, have you got any money? And I went, yeah, I'm fucking loaded. And he said, um, yeah. So I said, um, 
I'm, I'm staying now and that. And I said, you know, I'm on the run now. I've got to stay away. So we said, I can get you the job here. I said, we'll see what happens. So anyway, after about a week, I'd settled down and that. And I'd been in touch with my wife. Um, with a brother's house. He lived in down the East Lancashire Road. And I made the connection. She said she'd be over like in two months. So Eddie took me back to this apartment on Fort Street in Santa Monica. And it was beautiful. And the guy was in in Scotland. Lovely apartment. I said, Eddie, let's get one of these. So anyway, I got an apartment. It was only like $300 a month at a time. Wow. Got the apartment. It was gorgeous. And it was about... Three blocks from the ocean, Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica. It was absolutely gorgeous. Eddie got me a job in the kitchen and we became, I, I become the chef and Eddie was the chef and we did like about 16 hours, eight hours each and we'd done the menu and everything. Can Anyway, about after two weeks, I'd met the owners and that they'd been back to Norway. They sold it home. And they, they come to me and ask me, they said, hey, do you want to be come as a silent partner in the pub? Um, $50,000. So I said, well, let me give it some thought. And Eddie said to me, do it, Terry. Do it. Become a silent partner. By this time, my brother, one of my brothers was coming over from Liverpool to see me already. He was coming from Liverpool. Tony. And um, he arrived, got him, and he come and stay with me in the apartment. I told him, he said, just do the investment. We'll, we'll keep it quiet. We won't tell anyone. We'll just think that, you know, that you're in the kitchen, you're the cook. So we'd done this deal. There was no lawyers involved. It was an handshake. And I would get 25% of the bar. And I was part owner in a pub. Next thing, me and Eddie were in charge of the pub. And, you know, you get some great characters come in, you know, some some movie stars and that. So this guy's come in one day and he's at the end of the bar and he's got a, he's got a, a trill beyond. And Eddie said to me, he said, that's Patrick McGowan. He said he was the governor in Alcatraz. He said, um, and he, he'd done this big movie. And so we were cooking and fishing ships and we'd serve him and we'd go, hello, sir, how are you? And... Patrick, right? Yeah, yeah. And he used to come in every day and I'd talk to him, but we wouldn't invade his privacy. So I started getting a little bit sicker, felt a bit sick, like weak, very weak. And I just knew there was something wrong with me. So I was going to the bathroom and I was bleeding internally. Oh, wow. Yeah. Started going to the bathroom and I had these pains in my stomach. So I looked at some of the best hospitals in LA. I didn't have any insurance. I didn't have nothing. And you know what it's like there. So I went to this hospital and um, they advised me to go to get a private doctor. So there's a famous hospital called St. Joseph's in St. John's on 14th Street in Santa Monica. Very well renowned. So it goes in there, the hospital, and um, they said, oh, you've got to go across the street to see this doctor. His name is Dr. Messina, Alex Messina. So it goes across the street, goes in, and he looks at me, this young man. He said, hey, what's your problem? I said, I've got pains in my stomach. I said, I think I'm bleeding internally. So we said, okay, we're going to do these tests, the upper GI series and some tests. And then I'd formed um, psychological pains in the side of my head, really severe chronic pain. And I said, I'm getting these like seizures. Oh, we said, okay, then we're going to send you to an, um, a neurosurgeon in Beverly Hills at Senior Sinai Medical Center, Dr. Nelson. So they'd done the physical on me. They'd done some blood tests. I was, I was weak on blood. I was, I was anemic. And then he'd done a scan on the upper GI. I had three massive bleeding ulcers. And he said to me, we're going to have to take your stomach away if if you don't seal them. So they sealed it with a drug called Corafit. And then I said, well, what about the pains? 
He said, I'm going to put you on a course of Valium to calm you down. And he said to me, he was Italian, Dr. Messina. And he said to me, why are you having so many problems? What is wrong with you? And I told him. I'd actually opened up and told the doctor my situation. He said, well, if that's the situation, I'm going to have to give you a referral to a forensic psychiatrist. So we're going to see Dr. Nelson, done two brain scans, one intravit on a drip, and then another brain scan. And they came back. They were fine. I was in the clear. I was happy. I actually thought that I had a tumour on the brain, but everything was good. So next thing, Dr. Messina gets me fit. He gives me iron shots every week in the buttocks. It's iron blood to get the blood level back to normal. He gets that back to normal, puts me on all kinds of medication, and I'm getting stronger, getting back to normal. It took toll all from when I was a kid, from when I was eight, up into all what I was engaged in. It was taking a heavy toll on my life. So we'll go to see the doctor in Beverly Hills. He was a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Obler. And I sat down with him and he said to me, what is your problem? I said, I'm on the run. He went, what do you mean on the run? Oh, you mean on the lamb? I went, yeah, I'm on the lamb. He said, what for? So I told him everything. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you a prescription. I'm going to put you on Valium and an antidepressant. I didn't know what the antidepressant, I didn't even know what that meant. So it gets the Valium and the pain starts to and subsiding, getting better. Had a lovely place. Wife comes over. I buy a, bought a new Cadillac. Seville and I bought a brand new Mustang. Got the bar. Everything's going fine. I'm getting a lovely wage in. Wife comes over. Everything's fine. Doing great. So on Second Street, you had Gold's Gym. Walked down there, so I thought to start. I'll start training now again. Everything was going fine. So they just opened a new boxing gym. It was um, Muhammad Ali had opened a gym. And it was beautiful. So I walked in one day. I just walked in, I seen the ring. And um, these two black guys sitting there. And I looked at them. And it was Muhammad Ali. And I walked in and went, hello, how are you? And it was his best friend, Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy was the, the WBA champion in 1972. And he was running the gym. And him and Muhammad Ali had fought each other. And they were best friends in um, Louisville in Kentucky. They were the best friends. So I said, can I come in the gym? And they went, yeah, sure. And um, I, took, I, I took private lessons off Jimmy Ellis. I, had, I was having private lessons with him. Yeah, boxing. And he said to me, why don't you fight? I went, nah. I said, and I was telling him all about Liverpool and that, you know, all the great fighters, John Conti. We had some great fighters telling about Ronnie in New York and that it was great. So anyway, we, we settled down. My wife comes over. She gets a job with, um, with a real estate company and I give her the Mustang. Everything was fine. So one night, Eddie's in the bar and in the bar. You get some nutters coming in, you know, walking up down... Santa Monica Boulevard, we used to just chase them, you know, the homeless and, you know, we just helped them out and say, you know, are you okay, mate? You know, we never really, but we just didn't want them around the bar. But we'd help them in a certain way, give them some water, give them like some French fries or something like that. We never, we never abusive to them. We always helped them. So this night it was, we, we decided we'd build the bar up and have a disco. So we got this disco come in and we advertised it and the bar was chocky. So I was always worried that we were going to get robbed at gunpoint. Because it was known then. Where I'd lived, he'd gone into a liquor store and he'd shot a Vietnamese woman for nothing. But when you've got a bar like this taking a lot of money, you know, it was like unbelievable. So this night, about eight o'clock, six, six Welsh guys walked in. And um, one of them said... He was, he was like a weightlifter. And he said, Oh, there's a fucking scouse bastard in the kitchen. 
And I heard him, and he was referring to Eddie. And I looked at him, and I thought, there's six of them. So I went round the kitchen. I used to, I used to carry, um, I had two hammers, and I hatched in case of any trouble. So I said to Eddie, come here a minute. I said, see this crowd here? And he went, what? I said, they're going to start. I said, see there, Eddie, it's two hammers. If they start, just get hold of one of the hammers. I said, well, I'm going to do it a lot of them. Eddie looked at me and went, okay. He was a bit nervous. I said, see that big fella there? I'm going to take him down in two seconds. Eddie went, ah, oh, yeah. I went, yeah, I'm going to do him. And then I'm going to do the rest of them. So next thing comes out, they, they quieten down. Now my shift had finished and my wife was at home and I didn't drink. So I said, Eddie, nobody starts again. So no the fat for the fish and chips. Just, <laughs> I got the fat for the fish and chips and I said to Eddie, just the kitchen closed at 10 o'clock at night. So they were starting getting bevied all night. So I said to Eddie, turn the fat up. I said, and see this pan here? I said, just get it. Stand in the kitchen and give it to them. And he went, all right. I'll <laughs> fucking give it to them. So anyway, two o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on my door. It's Eddie banging on my door in Santa Monica on 4th Street. He went, Terry, open the door. And I let him in. And he's full of fat. He said, I've done what you told me to do. I fucking give it to the six of them. And the fat was boiling hot. But all the customers had got it as well. No. So anyway, all the coppers came in Santa Monica. And that. So Eddie stayed in mine. So this, this Welsh crowd had got a gun to kill Eddie. And so I went in at 10 o'clock and I opened the bar. And the bar's full of fat all over the bar. It's fat everywhere. He'd got it and scooped it and he kept giving it to them. Uh -huh. And I actually didn't think he'd do it. And he, he, he was doing them all in. And the, three of them had gone to hospital. They, they were, we were burns. So next day I goes in the bar and we had the cleaner come in. And she f slipped on the fat as she come in. She fell over. And I got it up and that we cleaned the fat up and it was all over the place. And we were going to get the bar up at 10 o'clock. So next thing, three of the Welsh guys walked in and they went like that to me. You, you fucking scouser. And I went, listen, mate, calm down, will you? He went, where's that nutter? And I went, I don't know, mate. And he went, we're going to fucking kill him. So I said, listen, listen, you better, I said, sit down and have a drink with me. I thought, I better not let this escalate again. It's going to get really nasty. So next thing, he came in and I said to them, listen, let's become friends. You just can come in here whenever you want. I'll pay for all your food. I'll buy you your drinks. We're just scousers and use a fucking Welsh. And forget about Eddie. I'll sort it out, okay? We want peace. So I sorted them. Next thing, the six of them became my friends. And they came in the bar every night. And I gave them beers and that, you know, Budweiser's. And they were all right. And then I introduced, I said, Eddie, come and say hello to them. Everything was peaceful. So it went on for a while. Now upstairs we had six apartments. A few weeks later. Scouser comes down and he goes, um, where's Terry? And I went, all right, lads, where are you from? He said, Norris Green. I went, all right. He said, I've heard about you. I went, all right, do you want a drink and that? And he was a good kid. So that night, the owner came in and there was a bit of a, a banter in the bar that they were legal. They hadn't paid the rent upstairs. And... The owner came to me and said, they haven't paid the rent. So next thing, I said, we'll leave it for now. 
let them pay later. No, they're going to pay the rent and all. I said, no, leave it, Victor. Just leave it. So next thing, it was about, it got on to nine o'clock and Victor had a few drinks. And he starts going to me, you fucking scouts bastards. To me, it's your fucking fault and all this and that. And I said, hang on, mate, calm down. So anyway, I lost it. I actually lost it in the bar. So he was by a phone and he was arguing with me and I was actually arguing back. That Liverpool way of arguing back at him. So I just, I stood back and I just threw a right hand and I hit him and I knocked him out. And I'd done him in. His wife had called an ambulance, took him to the hospital and his nose was broke and his jaw was broken. And I went, oh my God. And I went home and I went, what have I done now? Next thing, I had to pack a bag. Ended up, the police had gone to see him in the hospital. They'd call the police. And next thing, oh God, I'm going to get nicked now. Again. For, you know, grievous bloody arm. And, phew, Jesus Christ. What am I going to do? So I had to leave the apartment with my wife. Got a motel. And I'm stuck in a motel. Victor gets out to the hospital and I sent Eddie down to the bar and I said to him, if he, if he presses charges against me, I'd, we'd still had the investment in the bar. I came up with an idea that I was going to burn the bar down. I was going to torture you. And then I was going to move on. That was the only way that I could persuade his mind so Eddie went to visit in the hospital and he said, has the police been? He went, yeah. And did you give Terry's name? He went, yeah. He said, well, Victor, you can't prosecute Terry. I'm telling you, Victor, you're dealing with the wrong person. The bar will be burned down. He's going to burn the whole bar down. So Victor agrees. Meets Victor in the bar a week later. I apologised. And he puts his arm around me and he says, okay, you've got to leave. I've got to give you your investment back. I said, okay. Got my investment back. And I left. I left. So my other brother, Alan, had come over. I moved back into my apartment. And we'd gone to a place called the Tudor House. And I got a job as a baker. The manager had took us as a baker, doing all the steak and kidney pies, the sausage rolls, and me and Alan got in. So we, Alan's, Alan became the head baker, and I was the assistant baker. But they brought a confessionary baker in. They brought a confessionary baker in, in the Tudor house. So we're there for a few months. I think it was 1980, late 80. In the beginning of 81. So, the baker was showing us all... The, he, was a, he was a great baker, but he was a little weasel. And I was suffering from the my spine with my nervous system. And I went in the back to sit down. He went, um, I, am, I want you in the fucking bakery. Don't you be sitting down in there. And I went to him, hey, mate, who are you talking to? I said, don't talk to me like that, I said. I said, I'll fucking bury it in a minute. And he shit himself. So him and Alan would work together. So one day, I leave the bakery. And I go up to, to see Victor, to have some fish and chips. Next thing, the immigration raid, the bakery, and they get Alan, and they get his wife. She's the cashier. So I come down after an hour, and I see all these cars at the back of the bakery. And I'm looking. So I just done one. I knew there was something wrong. So they got Alan, put Alan in downtown detention, 
to importation. The bail was six thousand dollars. So the owner of the shooter house had bailed Alan out and his wife, and they got out. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do here now? Elizabeth Taylor, the butler. <laughs> I'll have to do what she told me. So I drove to Beverly Hills and I walked around. I parked the car I had. I had a big um, red Cadillac. It was gorgeous. Like a big movie star, you know. And I just parked it on Beverly Drive and, that, and I walked up and down Beverly, Beverly Drive and I was looking everywhere for agencies. And um, I found one. It was called the Sandra Taylor Agency. And I walked in and I said, um, do you do any butlers on that? And she went, yeah, yeah, we do butlers. And, you know, would you like to register? I went, yeah, okay. I said, is, is there any more agencies here? She went, yeah. She went, there's one down the street called the International Agency. So uh, I registered. And I went down to the International Agency and I walked in. And this woman was sitting there. She had glasses on and that and... It was all beautiful. And I looked, and it was all film stars on the wall. And I looked at them all. And I was looking at them all going, wow, this is beautiful. And um, she said, what's your name? I said, my name's Terry Mugan. I said, I'm a butler. I was the butler head butler on the Queen Elizabeth II. Oh, she said, do you fill the application in? She said, I can, I can place you tomorrow in a job. And I went, that's nice. So fills the application in and had me Merchant Navy um, Seaman's card and my book and, the sh and all where I'd been on the ships and I'd done a few other trips on the ferries to Olyhead. And in, in the book, it had in the book, PRS, Penthouse Room Steward, and it was done in red, which meant it was very high standard. So I took that standard and I used it to my advantage and I told her, I said, look, I'm, I'm one of the best butlers on the Queen Elizabeth II. So I'm sitting with her. And she said, I've got the ideal job for you. And I said, okay. She said, I'd like you to come back tomorrow morning. And I'm going to arrange an interview for you in the hills in um, Hollywood. I went, okay. Not thinking like who it is. Or, <laughs> or ever, anybody. And she went, um, do you do formal service? I went, yeah, I can do white gloves. I'll serve with white gloves. And we do serve on the left, take it the right, and I'll do the silver service. Oh, you can do all that? Oh, I said, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trained in. So she said, well, I'll have you eat, uh, meet um, Mrs. Eastwood tomorrow. <laughs> so I looked at her and I went um, Mrs Eastwood I said who's she she said oh she said to me that's um, Clint's wife she'll be doing the interview I said okay so this was the new life <laughs> that me, I was going to start went home got all ready put my suit on next morning my nerves are killing me go to the agency got the address, went to the hills in Hollywood, parks the car outside, gets my briefcase, all my references, goes into this big mansion, presses the intercom. Hello? Yes, Mr. Mugan. I'm here to see Mrs. Eastwood. Next thing, the, these big gates open, goes in. Oh, come in. This woman, it's Clint's wife, blonde hair, beautiful woman. And um, her name was Maggie, Maggie Eastwood. So I addressed her like appropriately. Mrs. Eastwood sits down and uh, she said, how would you like to move to Carmel? So they'd never had an English butler. They were fascinated with, you know, an English butler. I changed my accent a little bit so that they could understand me a bit more. Did you sound more proper British? Well, actually, more Scouse, but toned the Scouse down, spoke slowly, and made sure that they could that they could understand me. And sometimes I'd lose it, and then in between they used to say, "I love your accent, it's lovely," and I'd go, "Oh yeah, okay, you just sound like John Lennon." 
Of course, yeah. Yeah, you sound like John Lennon or Paul McCartney. Mm. And I just looked and went, oh, that's nice. Okay. So the arrangement was for me, at the end of the interview, to move to Carmel. I got offered the job. So at the side of the house in Carmel, she told me where it was. It was on the 17 mile drive and it was a big, beautiful brown wooden home that was built beautiful. They had deer and the, in the garden, it was beautiful, very excluded, but they'd built an extension on it. So I asked her, I said, is it possible that um, my wife could move with me? Oh, she said, absolutely. And I said, maybe she could work with you. So anyway, flies to Monterey airport in a jet. Um, next thing, gets to the airport. This big Mercedes pulls up. It's Maggie. She's got the two kids in the back, Alison and Kyle. And I went, hello, how are you? And it was Clint's two kids. So she gets us in the car. So she said, we're going for lunch. So Clint's had a restaurant called the Hog's Breath Inn in Carmel. And we go for lunch. And she said, this is uh, me and my husband's restaurant. And I'm sitting there with her. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Beautiful. Next thing, gets goes to the house. And it, was, it was at the weekend where the letters settled in. So about five o'clock, goes in the kitchen. I had the keys and that. And I wanted to sit, take a look at the kitchen, get familiar with the house. Next thing, I just turn around. And he hears a voice. Hi, how are you doing? It's Clint. <laughs> and he went, and I said, hello, Mr. Eastwood, how are you? I said, my name's Terry Mugan. Nice pleasure to meet you, sir. I said, I'm the butler. And he went, pleasure to meet you. My wife's told me all about you. I said, thank you, sir. Can I get you anything? Can I get you a drink? He went, yeah, I'll take a beer. He said, there's some in the fridge there. I'll sit out on the patio. I got him a beer and I walked out to the patio and I gave him the beer. And he was a quiet man. I just went in the kitchen. So we started on the Monday. And uh, I made a curriculum for the home. It was just a regular house like, but it was overlooking the 17 mile drive. It was absolutely gorgeous. So that, I remember the first night, it was very, they didn't want a formal. Some periodically they would add formal and informal because of the kids. So the, uh, the whole objective was to win the kids over. And I taught Kyle how to hit the speed bag. Clint had a speed ball in the house. And I thought I'd like to teach Clint how to do that. But I taught the son. And um, Alison, I taught her some cooking lessons, how to do um, scrambled eggs and toast and bacon. And um, I won the kids over. That was the main... If you win the kids over, you're laughing, aren't you? And um, I didn't have much interaction with Clint. So I stayed for about four or five months. And then all of a sudden, he was at home at the time. And he had this beautiful 6.9 Mercedes. And he come in one day and he said, Terry, um, do you want to do the car? I said, yeah, I'll do it for you. And I used to wash his car and I'd wax it for him and everything. And he loved it. I, did, I didn't have much interaction with him. I was a little bit, um, probably, I'd say they used the word infuriated. I was actually infuriated of them. It's not until you get to know them. His wife was more, like, relaxed. And then all of a sudden, he left. He left the residence. He left the residence. And he'd gone. So I would take four days off and I'd fly back down to Santa Monica. And when I came back, there was another guy there. His name was Henry Weinberg. And he dated Elizabeth Taylor. And I found him to be very obnoxious. And he was very abrupt to me, um, speaking to me um, um, inappropriately, you know, his behaviour. And I went, hmm. So anyway... 
said to my wife, I said, I think I'll, uh, I'm going to move. We'll move back to Santa Monica. And I gave her two weeks notice. And she was like upset. Because my wife had done some reception work for her. Because that's what my wife was. She was a receptionist in the bank. And um, we told him that we were leaving. And the kid was upset, Kyle. He was doing a movie at the time called Onky Tonk Man with Clint. And it was sad because the kids were really lovely. Alison went on to be a model in LA and um, Kyle never took the acting up. He became a musician later on in life. So eventually I left. And I got a call on the landline because Maggie had my phone number. And she went, Teddy, where are you? Are you work? And I went, no. And then in between, I'd gone down back down to my, my Dally's gym to see Jimmy. Started training with Jimmy Ellis again, getting more fit, stronger. Met a few fighters in there. One of uh, the welterweight championship of the world was um, Carlos Palomino. And I uh, struck up a lovely friendship with him. Because I said to him, I was, I, I was at your fight in London when you fought with Dave Boy Green in 1977. He went, really? I went, yeah. I was at that fight. I said, yeah. And he was he was like delighted. And um, I s- stuck this friendship up. So the call was from Maggie for me to go back to Carmel Valley. He was, his name was Merv Griffin. He was a, a multi-billionaire. He owned a show called Jeopardy. He said, oh, um, I've told this guy all about you in our country club in Carmel Valley, and he's looking for a butler. He, he said, she said to me, would you consider it? Um, he'll meet you in, um, on his studios on Sunset and Vine. So I decided, ah, you know what, I'll just go anyway. So he got my number and he called me, and I had an answering machine, and Merv called me, and I called him back, and I set an interview up with him, so I went up to Sunset and Vine and I goes in his office and I goes in the office and he welcomes me and had a lovely suit on, dressed as usual as the butler. And he said to me, well, do you want to fly back up to Carmel Valley in my private jet? I said, yeah, okay. And he explained to me the ranch that he had and it was set on the top of Carmel Valley, overlooking the valley. It was absolutely beautiful. So we arranged to meet at Van Nuys Airport. So when I got to the airport, I had my case with me. And I was looking at the plane. It was a, a little six-seater. And there was a guy standing next to him. He was about 22. Very good looking. American. Dead tanned. Handsome. And Merv said to me, oh, this is my friend, Tony. So I put two and two together. I thought, hang on a minute. This has got to be his boyfriend. This toy boy. So he gets on the plane, goes up, gets off in Carmel, lands in Carmel Valley. There's a car waiting for us. Had a chauffeur. Goes up. Goes to the ranch. He said, Teddy, this will be your house here. Big 5,000 square feet house overlooking the valley. Goes to the main house. Decorated with all, all the interviews that he'd done. The Beatles, John Lennon, all the big stars, awesome Wells. He did everyone in the world. So that night, he said, Teddy, what would I have so, for dinner? So they wanted Philly Mignon, asparagus, and mashed, you know, actually I did um, English roast potatoes for them and they'd never had that before. So he asked me to join them at the table, which I thought was nice but unusual at the time. It wasn't my job to sit with anybody at the table. I wasn't part of the family. I was the butler. So I joined them at the table and then all of a sudden I could see this Atmosphere can want to be crazy, you know. And, you know, and Terry, you know, this and um, me and Tony, you know, we've had this relationship for quite a while now and 
Oh, yeah, oh, okay. You know, like Scouser, like I'm going, yeah, okay. That's nice, isn't it? So I didn't know what to do. I know where this is going. So next thing, I was there for two weeks, but I wanted to leave the next day. <laughs> I wanted to leave. I thought, well, I'm, I'm stuck here. So I left and they said, oh, Terry, you can come and sit on the sofa if you like and watch the TV with us. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so I went like that. I went, no, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll just go to my room and I'll watch the TV. <laughs> so the next day, I was doing all the chores and I was cleaning up and everything, just as a regular penthouse butler. And I could see the bed that they'd been sleeping in the same bed. <laughs> and I was going, well, I'll, you know, I'll just mind my own business. I'll, I'll use diplomacy. I won't say nothing. And I'll just carry on. So a few nights later, they went out one night. And then the next night, um, I'd done um, a pan of scouse. You know, pan of scouse, just like Agus stew, you know what it is, but it's scouse. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was lovely. It was lamb and, instead of beef. And I set the table lovely. And um, Terry, would you like to join us? I said, no, I'm fine. Oh, no, we'd rather you join us. So I joined them again. I was going, oh, where's this going, you know? So anyway, where it went to was we sat on the so he, he, he said, I want you to sit here. Come and sit here. And I, I, I sat there with them, and I was, felt so uncomfortable. And he said, um, you never know, it could turn into a threesome. No. Oh. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. Just like that. Just like that. And he said, I think Tony likes you. And I went like that under my breath. I'll fucking knock Tony's head off. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, it went sour. So I perse persevered for two weeks and he was flying back to LA and he thought I was coming back. Got to Los Angeles and I went with him to his office. I said, you know, you put me in a, a very awkward position in my life. I said, I can't return. So, and that was it. And he paid me. So eventually, I'd left Merv Griffin. Where do we go back? I went to the international agency. And I thought, maybe I'd just stay around Beverly Hills this time. And I was close to Santa Monica because I had the apartment. Goes back to Dora. Automatically got a job for you. Job was for a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Feldstein. They owned a bank called the Mitsubishi Manufacturers Building on Wiltshire Boulevard. Absolutely multi-millionaires. And they didn't they bought a home. It was the former home of um, Jack Benny, the famous comedian. And it was on um, a, a street called Roxbury Drive. Roxbury Drive was full of all the stars, Bugsy Siegel. Um, Lucille Ball, Colombo. Actually, Lucille Ball's house was next door to the Feldsteins, and Colombo's was on the other side. So I goes to get this interview, and I met them. It was, it was silver service every night. They wanted silver, white gloves, very appropriately done. So I took the challenge, and um, the money was good. I took the challenge. Actually, she was English, but she never told me she was English. I thought that was very unusual with her. They had three children that went to the, uh, the Beverly Hills High School. My job was to show for them. And then during the day, I'd do all the chores and I, and I put a cu curriculum for the house. Anyway, I stayed a few months and I found that the, the children was, couldn't ruin a job. They would come home and spit on the, the mirrors and I had to clean it. And I thought, you know, oh, you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. It really put a bad taste in my mouth. And some people, it was a more of an experience that, you know, you can't please them all the time. You just couldn't please them. And very super rich. <clears throat> um, one of the, the best things, I just took the Rolls Royce and I'd go out for a ride and said I was going to the car wash. That was the best part of the job, of like of most of the jobs. And 
So I stayed a few months and that, and I wasn't happy there. I was never happy. And then on my weekends, they'd always want me to work on the weekends. We wanted to do this. We wanted to do that. Um, this woman, particularly, I remember now, comes back to me. She was so paranoid about cleaning that she would get a mirror and put it underneath the, the rim of the toilet to see if it was clean. And I caught her doing it. And she'd come back to me and she'd make notes. You have not cleaned underneath the rim of the toilet. And she shocked the life out of me. And when I was doing my job, she would go around me. And she was that paranoid that she kept checking it and checking it and checking it and checking it. And I went, I, you know, she's supposed to be English. But she turned into an American. And I went, this is ridiculous. And that was one of the things that really got to me. And actually then I wasn't feeling that good as well about the whole situation. But I couldn't get out of it because it was good money. And at night, I always remember once they had this party in the back garden. And um, I was doing the design of the tables and the, the tablecloths, pink with white lace um, napkins. And I was designing it all beautiful. And this woman, I just heard this, hello, hello. And I looked to me, right? And I knew Lucille Ball lived next door. And she goes, hi, how are you? Who are you? I went, oh, hello, how are you? Um, I said, I'm the butler. Really? She said, um, could you do me a favour? I said, what is it? She went, come over here. She went, um, my maid's off today. She said, could you take my garbage cans out? I said, yeah, I'll be over in a minute. So it goes out, walks around the house, goes at the back of Lucille's. Now, the garbage cans can't, they can't be put out in the street in Beverly Hills. It's against the law. <clears throat> they have to be put out in the alleyway at the back of the house. So she had them in the house, in, in the garden. And, you know, they're these massive, big... Have you ever seen the garbage cans in America? Yes, yeah, huge. They're like uh, enough for like 20 families. You could put 20 families garbage in them, but they've got six of them. This, it's, it's crazy. Um, most of the time they're empty, but they've got so many. So it goes over, gets the garbage cans out. And I thought, oh, oh, I've got to say something to Lucy. Got to say something nice to her, you know, build some rapport. So I'll turn around to her and I said, um, I said, you look like my mother. <laughs> I said, my mother looked like you. My my mother had red hair. And she went, really? I went, yeah, I said, you look like her. And I um, started laughing and joking with her. And then I said, um, anyway, you're welcome. And um, she, I said, is your maid here next week? I said, if, I said, if I'm still here, <clears throat> I said, you've got to make me a cup of tea. Anyway, I was... Dying to look forward to next week. But the job was getting me down a little bit and I wasn't feeling that good. I was still taking the shots of iron and I was still on the antidepressants and I was also on the Valium. And I was going into a, a decline. Um, I was going into what you call a mental breakdown. The mental breakdown was due to um, the trauma of um, PTSD. It was multiplying in my brain of being actually on the run. I'd go and see Dr. Obler and they wanted to know where I was going on my break in on the afternoon. If you work 12 hours in Beverly Hills, the law, the California law is that you're, you're allowed three hours break. And I, I'd have to go to doctors. And I'd go and see Dr. Obler and say, I don't feel well. Well, we can give you a stronger medication. No, I said, I've got to function in the job. I said, I can't function. It was affecting me. You know, it was just affecting me. And he said to me, um, well, um, it's possible then if this is affecting you that we might have to take you into hospital. And I looked at him and went, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we'd have to put you on a drug called Thorazine. And I went, what's that? Oh, he said, it's for people who are having breakdowns. But you'd, you'd probably have to be admitted into the hospital. And at the time, I didn't show that I was bad, but I was bad. 
I was having nightmares with the police, you know, the police um, putting the gun in my head. And that's all I, and it was just, it was horrible. And then it was just my life was just all come back to me. You know, it was just building up and building up. So I stayed another week or two and I actually did say to Lucille Ball on the day, I remember it was a Tuesday and um, I said to her, before she leaned over, I knew the maid wasn't there because I didn't see the car. And um, I thought, she's going to ask me to take them garbage cans out. I want a cup of tea with her. I just don't know why. I just She was a lovely woman. And um, I shouted. She, she popped her head up. I, was, I went out at the same time in the garden. And um, she, she popped over and I went, have you got that cup of tea? And she went, yeah, come over. Anyway, I went over and she made me a cup of tea. It was one of the highlights of living with the Roxbury ghosts. That's what they're called in Beverly Hills. All the Roxbury ghosts are all the film stars. Male or female, that's what they call them. I was sitting with a Roxbury ghost and it was Lucy. And what did you guys talk about? We talked about England and Ireland. She said she was Irish. She said she was Irish and she said, what are they like next door? And I felt like saying, they're a the gang of twats. <laughs> That's what they are. They're not in the real world. I said, I'm going to be leaving. I told her. <laughs> anyway, I started getting a little bit fit. I gave me notice in. And I left the Felsteins. But it was an experience. I started now to get the experience. I went back home to my wife. And um, she was working for the receptionist for a big um, real estate company. I went home. I was glad to be back home. So I started going back in the gym. Went down, I'm going down to see my Amadali, see if he's in there with, with um, Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy's always there because he ran the gym. And then she's like, and um, this big fella walks in. It's Joe Bugner. Joe, Joe Bugner, the heavyweight. He fought my Amadali a few times. He fought Henry Cooper. And, he, and it's all right, mate, how are you? Starts talking to him. And, you know, Anyway, I'd worked out in the gym and Joe was working out with um, Jimmy Ellis. And he said, what are you doing? I said, he said, I'm going to go for a walk. So I, I, I went for a walk with him down the pier. We went for a walk on Santa Monica. And we walked down on the pier. And we had to walk around the pier and we came back up and that with Joe Bugner. He's a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, lovely guy. So I, I had a break for about a, a month. And then the agency kept calling me because I was what you call placeable because I was English and I was a butler and she would not leave me alone because, you know, they get a good, they actually get a good commission. So she told me to come in. So I got a bit strong and I went in, I was feeling okay. And she said, Terry, I've got the most marvellous job for you. I said, you always say that. <laughs> You've always, I said, I hope this one is good. I said, I'll take it. She said, well, it's a guy, um, I'm going to tell you who he is. His name is Frederick Wiseman. He's one of the biggest art collectors in the world. And he's bought this beautiful Spanish ma mansion. Now, you've got Beverly Hills. And then above that, there's Holmby Hills. Holmby Hills. And she told me you lived on there. And he's got this mansion. He said, it's between you and a French chef. We'll get the job. Well, at the time, I didn't feel like I, I needed competition. You know, my competition was myself. That was my competition. That's what I'd learned. I wasn't interested in anybody else because I knew what I could do. And I go to this house and it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely set in Holmby Hills. And I'd, I'd been past it and I drove past and I'd ask someone, who lives on the street? And I found out that it was a place called Carrollwood Drive. And it was George Addison lived next door to him. On the other side was Barbara Streisand. Down the street was Gregory Peck. Rod Stewart. Frank Sinatra. At the bottom was Elvis 
and facing Elvis was Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh, wow. What a neighbourhood. Definitely. What a bleeding neighbourhood. Anyway, I went to the home. I was dressed immaculate. I put my best suit on. I thought, I've got to impress this guy. Now, what I liked about the job, it was one, it, it was one man. One man, no children, no dogs. And I, this is what I was learning now. I didn't want the responsibility of children or animals because I wanted to do my job. Next thing, he interviews me. Oh, he said, you'd be pay. Little guy he was. Very powerful. And actually, he owned um, Toyota. He actually owned Toyota. He, well, Toyota used to be called Toy Toyota. And they switched the A, called it Toyota. Yeah, they switched it. it in, in Japan, it was Toyota. And then they, they called it Toyota. And he bought the franchises from the Japanese. Wow. And he became the biggest distributor in America. Frederick Wiseman. And when he was young, he was the president of Hunt's Foods. And he married Marsha Wiseman, who was the sister of Norton and Simon, the big museums, the big art collectors the, in um, Pasadena. So anyway, as the interview, he said, oh, I love you. You know, the Americans, they all love you. Next thing. I didn't hear nothing for the week. Phone to you. Oh, he hasn't, he hasn't made his decision. He's between you and a, a French chef. I said, well, is the French chef a butler? He said, no. So the two girls that were his secretary's work downstairs, and I'd met them, and he went to them, and he said to the both of them, who would you have as the butler? And he said, there's only one butler. <laughs> he's not French <laughs> he's not French it's, it's, it's the Englishman so I was hired as his butler wow. wow goes into this home beautiful it's got the most Beautiful artwork you've ever seen in your life. Henry Moore, Liechtenstein, um, Giacometti, David Ochney, Andy Warhol, all of them. Ed Rouget, all the greatest artists in the world. And I didn't understand it. Didn't understand the artwork. But the position that I was in, that I'd been put in, was absolutely beautiful. Anyway, I became the butler for Mr. Wiseman and moved in. Mr. Wiseman, his schedule, he would get up at six o'clock every morning, sitting in a little cove at a round table, eating raisin bran. And he'd have a three-piece suit on with a, a tie that was very ostentatious. And he looked absolutely beautiful. He had little glasses on and all his hair was weaved. He'd had all a hair transplant. <laughs> and all he ate every morning, all he ate every morning was the, the raisin bran. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I was left to have the home to myself. So I approached him and I said to him, my quarters was beautiful. My bedroom had looked over Barbara Streisand's estate. I could see the house. I could see, but I never, ever looked, ever. I, it was, I just knew it was there. So I asked Mr. Wiseman, I said, you know, is it possible that my wife could move in? He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I brought my wife over, and she moved in the house with me, and she helped with all the chores, and she helped with all the cooking. And I, the home, I can't explain the home. It's on... Um, Frederick Wiseman Art Museum. And um, this experience that I had was absolutely out of this world. And for instance, one morning, I got up and he was in the kitchen and we had um, a blue Corniche. And the Corniche was like beautiful. 
and then we had some Toyotas. And he said to me, Terry, I want to go for lunch today. I said, okay. You want the Cornish? And he went, okay, we'll take the Cornish. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to trade the Vicks in Beverly Hills for lunch. I'd take him. I'd wait outside. Sometimes he would ask me to join him. I prefer not to. And I'd take him for lunch and he'd have a business meeting. And then I'd take him back home in, in the Rolls Royce. One of the best things was, was the Rolls Royce. And he had a, a P.O. box on Sunset Boulevard for his mail. So I settled down in the job and it was easy, found it easy. And plus, he'd go back to Maryland for three weeks. So I had the house to myself. I've got the home to myself. <laughs> Would you say that was your favourite gig? Yeah, it was the best ever in my life. So when he was away, the butler would play. <laughs> and the butler did play. And I, I took advantage of it, but in a nice way. Not in a, de a destructive way. It was in a nice way. And what I did was, I took the Rolls Royce one morning and I put the top down. And I went to get the mail. Now, when you go through Beverly Hills, you've got all these streets, but there's one main street called Lexington. And I'm going through, it's 8.30 in the morning, the sun's shining, it's April, and it's beautiful. Takes the mail up. On the way back, I have the mail. And I wore a uniform when he was in town, and then sometimes I'd take me tie off. I wore a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie. Usually, like, it was very high, highly graded. So this morning, I took the tie off. And I was driving back from Lexington. And I'm driving down Lexington. And I was feeling the sun and feeling uh, um, the freedom and the position I was in in life. On this side of my brain, it was beautiful. But on the other side of the brain, it was dark. I was on the run. It, it, it stalked me. So I'm driving and I'm watching the sun and the sun's coming through the, the trees. And I'm driving this big, the most gorgeous car you've ever seen in your life. And I've got a pair of black sunglasses on. And I stopped at a light on Lexington. And I was like that, just with the sun, and I was like that. And I turned to the left. And I looked to the left. And it's Michael Caine. He's in the same car, but it was yellow. And I went, good morning, Michael. And he looked at me and I went, not bad for the Scouser, is he? <laughs> <laughs> he went, <laughs> do you know what he said to me? Go on. You know what he said to me? Did you just steal that? <laughs> he said to me, did you just steal that car? I said, I said, I wish I would have. And I just, I just took off. I took off. That made me day. That was, it was absolutely brilliant. So I'd gone home and I just pressed these gates and there these two big, oh, it was that big Spanish beautiful one. I pressed the gates. George Harrison was living next door and they put the home ups of sale for George Harrison and he was leaving. I think he was going to Maui, to Hana. He'd bought a place in Hana in Maui and I'd never seen George and I think I would have got to, to see him. So the good thing is that we had um, we had like three acres, four acres on the land in the Holmby Hills. And it, it, it went down and we had a, a tennis court. So every morning I'd get up and I'd, I'd, I started doing strength training from what I'd remember from, from Borstal. And I got back into it, lifting weights, running in the morning, shadow boxing, doing all the things, getting strong to overcome the mental weakness. And I started building myself up. And he was away for quite a while, and I had the home to myself. So when he was home, there was one particular morning. He was in the bedroom, and he hadn't come down. And I'd gone up to the room to make sure he was okay. And I knocked on the door, and um, he was in the back of the, the, back of the bedroom, and he had an ammer. 
and he and he, he was banging holes in the wall. He used to move the artwork around like constantly, constantly and constantly move the artwork. And eventually I knocked on, hello, Mr. Wiseman, are you okay? I was concerned about his health. You know, we could have, anything could have happened to him. Oh no, Terry, I'm just in here, I'm hanging up. I said, I've got your raisin brand downstairs. Oh, I'll be down in a minute. So he comes down the stairs and he's got this, actually it was the same colour as that little dog there. <laughs> same colour as what you, yeah, purple. It's the same colour as that. Isn't that beautiful? It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Sit between us. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like that. So he comes down the stairs, and but it had black spots on it. And it was like, you know, like a jockey. You know when a jockey rides? So he comes down, he said, Teddy, out of a look. And I just looked at him. And I said, you look like a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, said, uh, I said, you look like a jockey. <laughs> and he, he said, oh, God damn it. And he ran back up and he took it off. <laughs> and he put his shirt and tie on and he came back down. <laughs> and he just sat there. He said, anyway, I threw that in the garbage. <laughs> and I, he put it in the garbage. So, you know, these experiences I'd had with him. And um, I got friendly with him. And one day he, he called me into his office. And he said to me, Terry, um, I've ordered a Bentley from the UK and it's going to be the first Bentley that they've ever made. It was a Bentley Mulsanne and it's going to be arriving at the home. He said, but I won't be here. I'll be in um, DC, Washington. I said, okay. I couldn't wait for this Bentley to come. So anyway, gets a call at the house. It's on its way. It'd come from Long Beach in a container from England. This beautiful British racing green Bentley leather inside. I couldn't wait for it. But anyway, they brought it in a, a big truck and they rolled it out, got it out. I inspected it and, and they parked it in the driveway and I just looked at it and I went, wow, what a car that is. I couldn't wait to take my uniform off. Went in the house, said to my wife, get ready, take your uniform off. Now it came with a, a cassette, Frank Sinatra. Come with this cassette and the fella showed me the cassette and it was my way. So I thought, um, I've got to do this. They left, they inspected the car, everything was great. Next thing, I said, come on, to my wife, gets in it. No one had had this car. No one, Beverly Hills. It was custom made, it was a quarter of a million, 250,000 quid in them days in 83. Next thing, it gets in it, puts the tape in. And I was just driving like that. It was like a big tank. <laughs> so it gets to Rodeo Drive. Gets to Rodeo. And I put the music up. My wife just looked at me and she went. And I turned it up. Drove down Rodeo. And all you could hear is Frank Sinatra, my way. I did it my way. I drive down there. I stopped the whole of Rodeo Drive. I went down to Wilshire. Everyone was just looking at this car in the street. <laughs> went to the Beverly Wilshire. Turned around. Came back. Came back up. And I just stopped the whole of Rodeo. And I just started laughing. <laughs> and my wife was going, wow. If that would have been filmed, it was like out of a movie. It was beautiful. Took the car home. It was lovely. Anyway, you come home, and it was all to do with art. Um, he told me David Ockney was coming to the house. I'd met David Ockney. Um, I picked him up from his studios, actually in Hollywood, and I drove him over, and he, he was buying art from David Ockney. Um, I, I'd met Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol had done all, you know, the Marilyn Monroe collection. 
you'd got the man on lo- like five five a piece, five million a piece then. Biggest like it's worth 170 million today. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we started to get to really know me and that and we formed a, a nice bond together, you know. It was nice because you're probably looking at me, young kid, and um so one day. I told him, I said, like, you know, you haven't been independently yet. So c- can I drive you? Let's go. I'll, I'll take the Bentley. I said, they've got a nice CD in it. And he said, oh, that would be nice. So anyway, gets in the Bentley, gets him in, closes the door. And we, we comes down Carolwood Drive, goes past Elvis's house, Michael Jackson's. And we're going down to Rodeo Drive. And we're going to the, the Polo Lounge. At the, uh, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So I put the tape on. And he, he took a wobbler. He went, get that fucking goddamn tape out of my fucking car. And I went, oh my God, what's wrong? He grabs the tape and he fucking throws it in the street. <laughs> he went, that fucking son of a bitch. And I went, what son of a bitch? And he threw it in the street. And he went to me, Terry, I'm so sorry. So we pulled up at the red carpet at the polo lounge. I'd been there many a time. And he got out and he said to me, come in with me. And I looked at him. I said, is everything okay? He went, it's okay, yeah. Come in with me. So there's a cafe there, the Polo Lounge, and there's a restaurant. So we never went in the restaurant. We went into the, the Polo Lounge. And he said, um, in 1969, I was in here. And the Rat Pack was here. He said, and I had a fight with Frank Sinatra. He said he made some words against me, against the Jews, because Wiseman was a Russian Jew, and he'd made these, they were being loud, the Rat Pack. It was, um, I think it was Dean Martin's birthday, and they were making all this noise, so Wiseman said, excuse me, can you keep the noise down? I'm having my lunch, and Sonata said to him, who the fuck are you, you little Jew? And next thing, Wiseman gets up, and he whacks Sonata, Breaks his nose and gives him two black eyes. And I've done a chapter in the book. It's called All Black Eyes. <laughs> That's the chapter that I've done in, in the book. Wow. So Wiseman was telling me the story. Next thing, the story that he tells me, Sonata's bodyguard had intervened and hit Wiseman and blackjacked him. Now, for the audience, blackjack means, blackjack, it could be with a kosh, where a blackjack is over the, the head. Or it could be, it was a phone. The bodyguard picked the phone up and hit Wiseman. Wiseman collapses. All of a sudden, an hour later, he's in Sina Sinai Medical Center with a tumor on the brain. The Rat Pack gets up, they all leave. Eventually, the police call Frank Sinatra in. And he said, no, he, he punched, he bumped my nose and he gave me two black eyes. So they blame Wiseman. There was no charges against Wiseman. Or there was no charges against Sinatra. And it was left. And it was a very famous thing that had happened in the Polo Lounge. And he'd explained that to me. And that was the reason why he grabbed the tape out the Bentley. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable story that he had told me. And it was famous. Mm. And so we got along together and we'd been moving some of the artwork. So one day they were knocking a wall down in the house. They were putting Henry Moore. He loved Henry Moore. He was the, um, the great British artist. And he was a sculpture. And he said, Terry, I'm going to get this Henry Moore. I'm going to put it here. I think he told me it was $2 million. It's still there today. So they knocked the wall down. 
And we had this construction site come in. So at the end of the day, I had to check the house. I had to secure it to make sure that all the doors were locked, etc. Make sure the gates and and I was good to the um, construction men. I baked them tea, give them a sandwich. So this day, it was about five o'clock. My wife was there. She was doing some chores, doing something for them or with the secretaries. They were downstairs. So I was, I was upstairs and I was checking the rooms in the house. And I come across this door and I was just checking it. And I just checked it and it was open and it should have been locked. I've never seen it open. And I opened it and there's a safe about, oh, I'd say about five foot by three foot. It was like a bank safe. So I put my hand on the door and I opened it and I looked inside, look around and then I took to the left and there was two big bags like this and I picked them up and I unzipped one of them and it was full of $10,000 bill, um, increments of 10,000s. I pulled one out, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. And I went, wow. Picked the other one up. PSJ watching it. Diamonds, um, gold bracelets, and two PSJ watches there, well, PSJ probably were 25,000 each at the time. Today would be 100,000. What was my first reaction? Well, I'm having that. I'm yeah. having it. I'm having it. I'm on my way back to England. I'm going to buy myself said. a lovely house. Yeah, what stopped you? Well, this is the thing what stopped me. I put myself in the position of that. I'd sat at the table when he was away and I'd ate the same breakfast, which was raisin bran. And I read the Wall Street Journal and I read the US Today, what he had read. And it dawned on me I was developing and I was getting more educated. And I thought, what a beautiful life this is. Here I am, the sun's shining in Holmby Hills and Beverly Hills. I'm driving two Rolls Royces. I'm making $50,000 a year. Wow. A man's given me a job. Why would I steal his money? What? Why would I do that? So I left it. And I played on it for 48 hours. Shall I go up? Shall I take some of it? Shall I take a few diamonds? Shall I take a gold necklace? And I told my wife, and my wife was so honest. My wife was, you know, it was the opposite. She'd never had nobody like me. And I'd never had no one like her that was so honest. It was the opposite directions we were in, but we were married. And we worked together, we got along together. And she said to me, Teddy, if you take that, you're going to be on the run again. And then it set in. My life had changed. Wise woman. Yeah. But it wasn't, it was also, she helped me change it. And then redemption set in. That was my life. That redemption had set in. I took the money and I took it down to the secretary and the jewellery. I said, Mr. Wiseman left the safe open. And they counted, it was about 155,000 and probably 200,000 worth of jewellery. And he came back and he said to me, oh, Teddy, thanks, um, I had some petty cash in the safe. I want to thank you for, um, I made a mistake. I didn't lock the, f I said, no, it's okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Petty cash? Yeah, petty cash. <laughs> Yeah, 155,000. Petty cash. Pocket change. Because he was a billionaire. He was a billionaire. So the artwork, we'd carry on, we'd move some. Um, Francis Bacon, he got two, two beautiful, got this beautiful 
orange masterpiece of Frank, Francis Bacon, and it was gold plated, and he came in and he was a perfectionist, and it was like we must have worked a fortune, you know, absolutely fortune. And he said, "This is Francis Bacon," and he would teach me the art, and I was really getting into it with him, and I loved it. And I said, "Do you get any more pieces?" Oh, he said, "Teddy." I'm getting something that's going to come that nobody's got. And I was just like young and naive. But this man was, he'd come out of the coma. He'd come out of it. The tumour, he'd recovered from what they'd done to him, Sinatra. But his passion and his love was art. That was his passion. But he told me he had this piece coming. And he told me twice, but it was delayed. So we're upstairs one morning. And when he'd wake up in the morning, he had a blue mural on the wall, just blue with, with um, white clouds on it. So he, he told me that when he woke up, that when he looked at the blue, he was looking at the sky and it made him happy. This was one of the things that he told me made him happy as opposed to being in seeing a sign in medical centre with a tumour on the brain. And I thought that was very interesting when he said that. Because later on in my life, when I'd go to Hawaii, that's what I would look at. The sun and the blue skies in Hawaii and all the beautiful white clouds. You, you can't beat it. Anyway, I waited a few more weeks. And this masterpiece was coming. Comes in as his breakfast, as usual that morning. And he goes, Teddy, I'm so excited. It's coming today. It's coming. And I'm looking, going, okay. He's all excited and I'm uneducated. At work, it's coming. Teddy, when it comes, let me know, okay. It's coming here today. So two o'clock comes, the doorbell goes. Hello, can I help you? Yes, got a, um, a piece from Mr. Wiseman. Let's them in. This wagon comes in. These two guys get out, get the masterpiece. They bring it into the living room. And I'm just looking at it. I said, I've got to go and get Mr. Wiseman. He's told me that this is coming. Goes down, gets him. He runs. I've never seen him so excited about his artwork. They unfolded it and he looked at it and I said, what is it? He said, this is the mother and child, Picasso, the only one in the world. Oh. <laughs> of one of the only one in the world and it must have been a fortune. You didn't find out how much it's setting back. I know what it's worth today. Go on. Um, today's value. Mm. it's priceless so it's absolutely priceless then I'd say 100 million which is very you know mm. it's up there <laughs> yes it's up there <laughs> but money didn't it didn't bother him of course what was giving him that. his life was the art mm. that was giving him his life so anyway, he said, Teddy, what do you think? I said, oh, it's absolutely beautiful, the mother and child, Picasso. So he said to me, where do you think we should put it, Teddy? He said, I think we should put it over the mantelpiece. I said, it's going to guide the house. And I said, your house will be blessed. He said, okay. I went to the garage, got the ladder, got a big hammer and some wire. And it was all ready with the ukes. I measured it, got the measure on it, and, and I put it there for him. It's still there today. <laughs> <laughs> that was in 1983. I'm just fascinated how you're using like a nail and a hammer in this day yeah. and age. Should you use a drill to yeah. hang a picture? No, I the used the risk of it yeah. sliding and falling and breaking. But yeah. 
you know, prices, probably later on, artworks, just later on. Yeah, that's what we did. It was always with the nail and, <laughs> nail and hammers. <laughs> all the all the artwork that we moved was with the nail and the hammer. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that's all I knew even... was the hammer, <laughs> the hammer, <laughs> the hammer from the robberies. <laughs> Didn't they didn't fall off or no no no, 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 no solid as a rock yeah and um, so this life I'd had with this man that was a billionaire was absolutely incredible and as I was learning so much and one other occasion he come out he'd had his breakfast again same to dance with him and he got excited he said Terry I'm so excited today he was always excited. And he said to me, I don't know which car to take. I don't know whether to take the, the Bentley or the, the Corniche. And he was doing this. I don't know what to do. And I said, I can't make a decision. Because he, he was like that. So I said, do you want me to make the decision for you? And he went, go on. I'll do it. I said, let's take the Bentley. It's very rare that you've rode in it. You need to, you need to take it. I said, where are we going anyway? He said, we're going to Van Nuys Airport. Gets him in the car. Close the car. Like a gentleman. Gets him in the car. He said, I'm so excited, Teddy. I'm buying a jet. And I looked at him. I went... Oh, that's nice. I always used to just say that's nice. I couldn't ever question him, you know. And he went like that. He went saying, yeah, I'm buying a G4. I didn't know what a G4 was. So he gets to Van Nuys Airport. This plane's sitting on the, the airport. And he goes like that. There's the plane, Teddy. This big, massive jet. G4. So I stayed by the car. And he looked at me and went, come on. Get on the plane. So he gets on the plane with him. The pilots are there, private pilots and all that. We're going for a spin around LA in the G4. Gets on the plane. G4 takes off. Wow. What, like, what, like, it was like the Concorde. Mm. Takes off. It's like that. The pilots are made up. Just me and him sitting there. <laughs> he said, what do you think, Terry? I said, brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. So he comes back, gets the pilots, and invites the pilots to stay at the house for the night. So what he's going to do, he's going to lease it, and then he's going to buy it. That's what he told me. So he asked me to take the pilots out. So I got the pilots in the car, and um, I took them in the Cornish. My favourite place was to go was Santa Monica Pier, in Santa Monica, on the pier where they'd done a lot of movies. They'd done The Sting, Robert Redford. And I used to love running when I lived in Santa Monica. Santa Monica to Malibu. And I'd always run up the pier. And it was beautiful. So I took them down there, gave them a few Guinness. And they're saying to me, Teddy, do you think he's going to buy the plane? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Takes them back to the house. Got their head down the next day. They had done the deal. And he bought the G4. He bought the G4. He buys the G4, and there's, he gets an artist. His name's Ed Rouget. Ed Rouget, and he paints the, the plane blue, and, it, and he puts white stars on it. And he said to me, Terry, this was his, his uh, imagination of art. Ed Rouget is a very, um, very big artist in the world. And he said to me, Terry, the reason why I did this is it will, it will blend in the night when we go to New York because he owned a brownstone in New York. I used to go to New York with him and he had a brownstone in Manhattan and I used to take care of it for him and we'd land at a private airport just outside JFK and we'd have a limousine and we'd take it into Manhattan and everything. And so the, bl the plane would blend in the night, blue with white stars on it. It was unbelievable. Anyway, I'd had so much experience with him. And I'd, Bert Reynolds had moved in next door. <laughs> Bert Reynolds. And um, um, he was with 
Lonnie Anderson, Lonnie Anderson at the time. And I'd seen him a few times. I'd said hello to him and that was it, you know. And um, so I'd, I was with Wiseman quite a while. And then I had so many experiences with this man. And he said he was moving back to Manhattan. He was going to move back to New York or Maryland. And he said, um, basically, the job was coming to an end. Mm. It was coming to an end. But one before, I, before I've got to tell you this one. He come up to me in the kitchen one day, and he said, "The secret service has come and said he to the house." And I looked at him, and I went, "The secret service." He went, yeah, they're going to be in two black limousines. He said, there's someone going to play tennis on the courts. I went, okay. So about half an hour later, the doorbell outside is going. I can see them on the camera in, in the kitchen. Hello. Um, yes, um, we've come here to play tennis. So I opened the gates. These two limousines pull in. Secret service. This girl gets out. She's with her dad. I looks over. It's Ronald Reagan, hmm. the president. Yeah. His daughter Maureen had come to play tennis on the courts at Wiseman's. I just looked and I went, hello, good morning. And he, I'm talking to the president, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> And he's, well, yeah, um, she, um, Maureen's come to play tennis and, you know, she's going to be, I said, oh, yeah, she'll be fine today. So she gets out. She was a big woman, very overweight, guarded by the Secret Service. So they went down on the courts, goes on the courts, took them tea down, give them water, fruit, bowls of fruit and everything. She came quite a few times to the house. But one morning, there was one morning particular time, unexpectedly, the doorbell rang. And I seen the car, this big black limousine. And I thought, is the Secret Service again? So I just automatically opened the case. He said he had a parcel, a gift. So I opened the gate. The car comes in. Ronald Reagan gets out. And he says, um, is Mr. Wiseman home? I said, no, he's not home. He said, could you give him this, please? And what it was, it was a photograph of Ronald Reagan at the White House. And he'd signed it to Mr. Wiseman. Wow. And I took it. And I put it in the house. <laughs> took it and put it in the house. So I could feel that the job was coming to an end, and basically it did. That job had come to an end because he'd moved. He kept the house, and he was thinking of turning the house into a museum. And I finally had notice. He gave me a great severance package with twenty five thousand dollars, and I left, and I went back to Santa Monica. And then I knew the phone was going to start ringing again. So the butler was on the move again. To Hawaii next time. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Kahala in Hilton. Hotel. The, the Kahala Hilton. And I'm walking down the beach and a guy walks past me and he goes, Terry. You're on the news. So I kept my head down. I kept walking. I went, oh no. Oh, Here we go. <laughs> this home was the former home of Elvis Presley. And he was the owner of the Carhalla Hilton in Hawaii, where Ronald Reagan, um, Princess Diane would, that's where their abode would be when they stayed in Hawaii. It was out of the movie, The Shining, 
and all these lamps on the side, like little chandeliers, and it was dim at night and very weary. And I thought it was something out of a movie. And the first thing she goes, hello, are you the butler? Are you the major domo? I went to Spielberg and done an interview with him at the studios. And um, I didn't like his behavior. I wake up at four in the morning and the smoke coming down the corridor. I'm going, what the hell is that? She had a mental woman in Truesdale Estates in Beverly Hills had access to a gun. And, it's, and this guy said, hello, this is the United States Immigration. Um, we want to speak to Terry Mugan. So I had made an arrangement to fly back to England to face justice. Terry, will you come in with us? We're going to kill Joey. And I looked at them, he said, yeah, we've got the gun upstairs. They had a shotgun, they had a handgun. And they said, they're going to kill Joey, right? Terry Mugan, part three. We're on this epic journey now. We've gone through expert in armed robberies, heists in Liverpool. Top of his game as a butler in Hollywood for the biggest names in the universe. That's that's the bit where we're at right now. Um, we just ended up where, you know, Terry's been kicking it with Muhammad Ali in the gym. <laughs> he's, 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 he was the butler for Frederick Wiseman was where we left off in, in Beverly Hills. He's, and the guy just bought a hundred million dollar painting. What Picasso. Was it? Picasso was what was it? Yeah, Pablo Picasso. Which one was the it? The mother and child. Mother and child. Um, before that, you were a butler for Merv Griffin and for Clint Eastwood. <laughs> it's getting... All right, so yeah, you're going you're gonna to now uh, meet the owners of the Kahala Hilton. Hilton. Go yes. For, go for it. So after we left, we'd left um, Wiseman's. I mean, next venture was obviously, I got a call from the international agency. I'm very placeable. Um, for my experiences, this particular home was um, was in a place called Truesdale Estates, where Richard Nixon, the former president, had done a, um, a deal with the land developers, and all the movie stars moved in here, like Sir Dean Martin, and you know, there's a lot of them in there. And this home was the former home of Elvis Presley. And I was assigned to the house to be interviewed by the secretary. Mr. Weinberg was absent. He was in, he owned half of Hawaii and he was the owner of the Carla Hilton in Hawaii where Ronald Reagan, um, Princess Diane would, that's where their abode would be when they stayed in Hawaii. And that's who they were. So this home was nested in the hills of Truesdale Estates. I arrive early in the morning and I'm getting interviewed by the secretary. And what the job came consisted of was a major domo. A major domo is a man that is above a butler and he takes care of the chef and the whole house. And he has to be in tip top shape. He has the responsibilities of the butler, the chef, the maids, everything. I thought it was very unusual that I hadn't met Mrs. Weinberg on the interview and it was a difficult home. I didn't know who'd been there before and now later on in my life I know why they probably couldn't have lasted. And anyway, they proposed to give me the job and I took it. it everything to me was a challenge. I would just go straight in and blast them and, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and I moved in and my, my house where I lived was next to the garage. 
It was a little one bedroom house, but it adjourned the garage. The butler was down the lane from me, well, down the aisle. And then you had the chef. We put him on the grounds in the pool house. I did him a favor. He came from the Four Seasons, and I did him a favor by giving him the job. So it starts, and you know, we're running the home. And the next day, I got introduced to meet Mrs. Weinberg. Now, the house was very unusual. When I walked down the corridor, it was like, it was out of the movie, The Shining, and all these lamps on the side, like little chandeliers, and it was dim at night and very weary. And at the end of the corridor was this these massive brown doors. And anyway, I got taken into them. And there she was sitting in the bed in the corner, this massive, beautiful room that you wouldn't even know it was there. And she was sitting upright. And she had pale skin. She had red hair and a violet nightgown on. And I thought it was something out of a movie. And the first thing she goes, Hello, are you the butler? Are you the major domo? And I went, hello, Mrs. Weinberg, how are you? And she went, you've had too much fucking sun. Because I was, all, you know, when, at the beach and that on my days off. <laughs> you've had too much fucking sun. And I'm looking at her going, oh, my God. Next thing, start talking to her, getting to know her a little bit. And she goes, how's that fucking chef? What's he like? I said, he's brilliant. I said, he come from the Four Seasons. And she went, he's not as good as our chefs at the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. I went, oh, my God. Anyway, I settled down. And um, what she'd do, she'd come out at night. The job was easy. We were doing, like, all the silver. We had the butler's pantry. And my objective was the Rolls Royce, <laughs> to clean it and take it for the drive to get out of the house. <laughs> and, um, so the butler was nice, the chef was nice, and he'd come up with all these dishes, but she didn't like it. She never liked his food, and she picked on him. And I was thinking, there's something wrong here in the house. And then the the other butler, had, they'd been there a while. They were from Dublin. They were lovely people. And she, they used to give me um, innuendos and go, you know, she's crazy. So we get into it, and um, after a few weeks, she was nice, and I was calming her down. And the work was like, you know, you had to polish these floors and the silver. They had silver from Ascot here, the Ascot Cup they had, the horse racing, and it had to be cleaned every week. And we had special polish to clean it with white gloves. And then sometimes we'd have these dinner parties at night um, in a big round table, and he had to serve them in white gloves. And we'd be in the kitchen and the, the bell would go. Did you have a bell? She'd have a bell. We want this, we want that. Bring us this, bring us that. And the chef was doing a good job. And I thought, this is funny, this. I used to just, my sense of humour from Liverpool. I used to just go, this is brilliant. But I was laughing at them all. And then all of a sudden, boom, one morning, I wake up at four in the morning and the smoke coming down the corridor. I'm going, what the hell is that? I could smell it, so I got up and I could hear the rumbling of the car in the garage and I thought, someone is stealing it. Someone's stealing the car. And I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute, I'll go out the front of the house and I'll go around the back and I had a key and put a key in the garage and I opened it and all this smoke hit me. The smoke hits me. I'm going, what? what's this? The car's on fire. I'm thinking it's got a short in the battery, something like that. Next thing, I looks and I looked down at the car and I seen the bottom of it and the exhaust had a pipe in it and the pipe was going into the car. And I went... Hold on a minute. And it looks, and there she is in the car with the pipe. 
in her mouth. And I couldn't believe it. So I dragged her out. The smoke's everywhere. I'm coughing like, you know. And the first thing I done, I called the police. And I knew that there was something wrong, but I didn't know it was this drastic. Calls the police. Up in LA, the police come with an ambulance. And they all come together, the paramedics. And they come. It's, it's like now it's about 4.30. They get there. They're giving the CPR oxygen. She's alive. She starts coughing. But but they knew her. She tried to do something before. And then what happened was they had her on the gurney and one of the paramedics and the cop come to me and they got my details and uh, view experience. I said, no. So she's on the gurney and she's got the oxygen on and the, the cop said to me, yeah, I'm taking the notes and the statements. Um, can you tell me how old Mrs. Weinberg is? And um, I said, I think she's 43. And she takes the mask off and she goes, 44! And I went, oh my God. <laughs> oh, you lunatic. And you're putting, you're doing this to us. We were subject to this, what we would see. What we would see. So they took her to the hospital. So the chef and that, early in the morning, we got up and that. I kept it quiet. I said, she's gone to the hospital. And I, I didn't say nothing to the chef. I just said, can you do some bacon and eggs and that and give us some orange juice? And I just sat there with the other butler and that. So the other butler, he said, I, I can't take it. So we went to the doctor and the doctor advised them to quit the job. So they quit. Though she was in the hospital and she's calling me from the hospital from seeing the Sinai Medical Centre from the room. What's the chef cooking me tonight? Are you bringing it over to me? And I'm going, well, don't you get fed in the hospital? It's a see nice um, medical centre. It's one of the best hospitals in the world. So I said, what do you want? She went, go to um, Nate Nell's on Be Beverly Drive, she said, and get me some lox and salmon. And I thought, okay. So I'll get the Rolls Royce over and I'll go over to the hospital. And I'm going to see in the sinus medical She's in the psychiatric ward. I'm taking them in. <laughs> I'm taking them into the woods. It's <laughs> just unbelievable. I'm going for it. He's this gousher from Liverpool. I'm in seeing the side of medical centre. And I'm taking bacon and locks to a Jew. It was nuts. And she went, thank you, Terry. And then one night, she'd be nice to me. And then she'd be going, I make sure you stay out the sun. It was absolutely bananas. Mm. So she stayed in there a while. And then she was released. She came home. But for some reason, she didn't like the chef. So what couple, nationality was the chef? He was American. American. Yeah, he was gay. He was he was he was gay, and then you know what? You know, obviously, you know when you know he's, he's gay. But I didn't judge him. I didn't mind because he was a good kid. He was just making a living. That's all he was doing. So I decided to. I just got along with it, you know, and I was making good money. And I just kept, uh, I, you know, I just went along with it and. So she came home and one night, she come in the kitchen and the chef was, you know, he was down by the pool and he had a little dog and the dog used to bark. So she got everything out the fridge and she threw it all over the kitchen. The whole lot. I came out in the morning, all the food and the milk had been poured all over the kitchen on marble, one of the most beautiful kitchens you've ever seen. And I looked at it and I went... Oh my God, I, I, me and the chef, we just cleaned it up and she was going bananas. So the chef come in at about one o'clock and he said to me, um, I'm getting out of here, Terry, I'm done. And he left me and he just pissed off. He didn't even get paid. <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't worth it. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. So I'm left, I'm left there. I mean, and it's Elvis's old house. And I'd had some beautiful pa parties there because Elvis used to fly all the all the hula dancers in from Hawaii, I believe, in the day. And it was unbelievable, I got told. Periodically, Mr. Weinberg would come back home and I'd serve him. I'd serve him filet mignon and I'd do him lovely meals, me and the chef and that. Really lovely gentleman. But he'd only stay one night because she used to... I, I, I'd hear them arguing in the room. 
and she'd get his closet and she'd take all his suits and she'd dump them in, in, in the corridor. <laughs> and she went, you can fuck off, you can get back to Hawaii. I don't want you in this home. And I was like, oh my God. She'd go, Teddy, what's for my dinner? And I'd go, okay, we've got you something nice. It was absolutely unbelievable. And it, what it reminded me of, it reminded me of the cuckoo's nest. You know, the cuckoo's nest that was done in 75. And it was just like that. So I stayed and I was the only one there. And I just carried on during the day and I thought, well, you know, my time's coming to an end. And I didn't know that she had a gun in the bedroom. Yeah, she had a mental woman in Truesdale Estates in Beverly Hills had access to a gun. So this morning, I got up and I didn't hear from her. And it was very hard. You know, I was more compassionate because, you know, coming from Liverpool, what we've seen and what I've gone through in my life, you know, we've had more empathy for people, you know, because we don't come from a close area where, you know, we've always helped each other. And I always felt that way. And this morning, I knew there was something wrong this day. Something weird was going to happen. Anyway, she was okay. I got her some lunch. I did a, um, a tuna fish sandwich for her with a pickle and um, a coffee. And I took it into the room. And I looked at her and I thought, she's not well. So I asked her what she wanted that evening. And she always said salmon and lox. And... I was very uneasy this day. There was something going to happen really bad. I prepared the tray. And as I was walking down, it was like, as I say, the movie out the shining. And um, the gun went off. Did you hear it? Yeah. The gun went off. And I knew. And um, that was the end. Did you find her? I was a bit scared. I was apprehensive to go in the room at the time. And, um, but I thought at the time that if I call the police, there's going to be a big investigation. And it, it crossed my mind to think, you know, that they might be accusing me. So I sort of half went, went in and I didn't go in. But, I, you know, I knew. So what I did is I went to the kitchen and I called the police and they knew, they knew and um, it was sad and then my life was, uh, so when I wrote the, chop, I wrote the chapter in the book, The Weinberg Tragedy and that, that gives more detail about it. So I decided to, I was, I was on my way back then, the butler's on the move again. Max Factor. Yeah. So I'd, I'd got my stuff. The police came, the homicide came. They'd done a big investigation and the police had asked me, but they knew what was going on. And then um, he said, took my phone number and Mr. Weinberg was in, he was in um, Hawaii. And that was the end of it. That was at the end of Mrs. Weinberg. It was expected. Yeah, it was. It was very sad. I'd never thought I'd be in this position to that I'd be, I was a major domo. Yeah. So I took a few weeks off, went down the beach, went back in the gym, seeing Jimmy, done some training, and I was getting calls every day. And I'd, I'd run up from Santa Monica to Venice, and I'd run up to Malibu just to get it all out of my mind. And um, I got a call. Teddy, there's a beautiful gentleman. He'd like you to come to his home. I said, well, let me come up to the agency. Okay, so I got dressed up as usual in my suit, and I went to the agency, and I sat with her, 
And I didn't say nothing about the Weinbergs because she knew you didn't have to say anything. Um, it was in The Guardian in London, the news. My brother would s call me and said to me, it was. Since then, I think they've erased it all from the record and the Beverly Hills Police. And um, I just carried on. So I went to see Dora and she said, I've got a lovely job for you in Beverly Glen. And I said, okay. So I got back in the swing. I goes back in the swing and it was for um, a gentleman called Max Factor. Um, the mogul makeup man, and it was it was Max Factor Junior. <laughs> yeah, my mum used to use Max Factor all yeah. the time when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, he was great. So I goes to his house, and he's an older gentleman, and he was he had a, these nurses twenty four hours taking care of him because he was getting on a bit. So he liked me being around him because I was young, and um, but before that, I'd had another interview with. Um, the director of um, Lethal Weapon. I'd had an interview with him and um, I'd met the butler in his house. Um, his name was Richard Donner. He, he directed the movies with Mel Gibson and I'd, I'd been to his house before Max Factors and it was up in Hollywood Hills and he wanted me to come and work for him but I didn't like the situation. I always remembered he had guns in the home so anyway, I took the position with Mr. Factor because I found it more informal. Takes the position with him. Drives him every day to Malibu in a, in a, a blue gold choice. Takes him out. Takes him everywhere with me. And in the afternoon, I'd sit with him in the afternoon tea. It was more like a companion than a butler. And then the nurses were like, you know, they were nice. But they had the family. They were Russian Jews as well. And some of the family converted from um, being Jews to Catholics or Protestants because they'd come and stay with his daughters and they'd tell me. I always remember one incident. It was his birthday. And I took him down to the Tudor house where I used to work. And I took him in. And the baker then was... My brother-in-law, David McNally, he took Alan's position up because Alan got deported. And um, we gave him sausage rolls and steak and kidney pie. And he, he wouldn't stop eating. But from seeing a sign in medical centre, we had a nutrition diet and we had to keep to the guidelines and we had to keep to his weight at 165. So every morning we weighed him. Every time I took him out, he was £10 overweight. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I used to love feeding them and just take them out, make them happy. And um, and then the nurses would say, he's £10 over. I said, no, you just got the reading wrong. It's 163, 167. It's not 175. Okay. Did you get it? And she'd go, okay, I've got it. And it was nice. But we had this, one of his daughters, Barbara, would come over. And she was the iron whip. She cracked the whip on the the nurses and they felt very uncomfortable with her. So she pulled up in this big Jaguar, this British Jaguar that they had made and everything had to be British, you know, the Bentley, the the Jaguar. And this day. So I caught her in the corner and she was smoking. And she got out the car and she went in the corner and she was smoking a cigarette. So what I decided to do was, I just went out and I said to her, good morning, Mrs. Bentley. I said, um, can I have a cigarette? And she went, do you smoke, Terry? I went, yeah, I'll have a ciggy. I didn't smoke, but I just wanted to play this game with her. So she gave me a cigarette and then she's standing in front of me. So she's got to finish the cigarette with me. So what's she going to do? She's got to talk to me. So I built this rapport with her and I'd asked her, have you ever been to England and have you ever been here and all that? Because you couldn't get near her. And she was the heir to the throne of the Max Factor family. The family, of, yeah, all the kids, worth billions. So I decided to have the cigarette. And I said to her, you know, knowing you come over here, you know, the, the household's great and your father's happy. He's under the guidelines of the hospital. Everything's brilliant. 
And she said, um, his birthday's coming up, you know, Terry. What are you going to do? I said, well, just leave it to me. I'll do all English style. I said, I can do an English trifle. I can do a, um, a souffle, a chocolate souffle. And I can, we'll do salmon, salmon and, salmon and um, cucumber sandwiches. And I'll set the table beautiful with white roses, pink roses. And I said, you can invite all the family. I said, will you do me one condition? Can you back off the nurses? And I'd like you to um, teach them, and with respect, teach them actually, have respect for them, because they feel uncomfortable. They're only human beings, and, and they're looking after the golden man. That's what they're doing, and that's what we're here for. Without us, you wouldn't have no one. And she said, Terry, I will. I'm sorry if, if I've offended them. Because she was, and she they really respected me. Anyway, this party came, and um, I'd done the table beautiful. I'd set it so beautiful, like the QB2. I put champagne on the tables, but, you know, it was non-alcoholic, pink and white, and we had this beautiful party. And um, it was absolutely, all the family came, about 25 of them, and she was very proud of it. She said, what, the way you've set the table? Because that's the way you used to set it on the QE2. You know, very formal and all the silver service. So when it was finished that night, he come round and, and met my wife. She was helping with me. She always came in to help me. And he came round and he'd shuffle around the living room at night to get some exercise with the nurse. And he, he took an envelope out of his pocket and he gave it to me. And it was $2,000 tip. And I never looked at it. I just took it. And I said, thank you, Mr. Factor. And I put it in my pocket. And I, I later on, I counted. It was two, two grand. And I just carried on with the job. And then um, a few months later, my sister was coming from England, the UK, to visit. And... I gave her the address of my place to put down on Fort Street in Santa Monica. So she comes through the immigration and she gets stopped by the immigration. And they stop her and they say, where are you going? And they find the address with my phone number. Next thing, she had the phone number at Factor's house. I gave her that number as well, because I could answer the phone. I was the one that answered the phone all the time at the household, because then I knew she was coming in, and I was going to go, and when I finished work, I was going to pick her up. So she was coming in, she was, and she got stopped, and the phone went, We'd done fish. I always remember what I gave him. It was orange roughy, and I'd, I'd, I'd done a cucumber salad, and he had some um, cranberry juice and a, a chocolate mousse that evening. And the phone went, and I picked the phone up. I went, hello, can I help you? The Max Factor residence. And, it's, and this guy said, hello, this is the United States Immigration. Um, we want to speak to Terry Mugan. And I went, yeah, speaking. He said, um, we'd like you to come down to the immigration. I said, where? He said, to the Los Angeles airport. He said, we're holding your sister. And we know that you're illegal. And I went like that. I just put the phone down. Goes in. My living quarters. Packed the case. Packed it all. Got in my car and left without saying goodbye to Mr. Factor. Went down to my apartment, Santa Monica, got a net, and we had to move to a hotel for two weeks till it all quietened down. Went back to Factors. He, he, he was bluffing me, the immigration officer. I found out then by law that was against the law to go to a, a private residence. He was bluffing me. He bluffed me. So I had to leave. A few weeks later, I moved 
moved back in the apartments. They let my sister in. They're given an immigration hearing in Los Angeles. I said, don't go. Just fly back to England. Don't put up with all this shit here. And um, I proceeded on. And then went back to the house, factors. And he was very upset with me. And he said, I would have sponsored you, Terry. I'll get you the green card. And then he, I just left. And then I was back to the agency again then. I was back at the agency. And then I went back to the agency. And there was a job come up um, for an A-list actor. There was a few of them came up. Tom Bosley came up. Steven Spielberg came up. Mickey Rooney came up. And um, I'd, I'd actually gone to... I went to Spielberg and done an interview with him at his studios. And um, I didn't like his behaviour, the way he was behaving. Um, he had some parrots in the kitchen. And he said to me, these parrots are more important than my wife. And he was married to an actress called Amy Irvin at the time. He was married to her. And I thought, you're very acting, very unusual. And well, you know, you can come to my house and, you know, you can try it out for the week and see how you like it and all that. And I just looked at him. Parrots are more important than his wife. Yeah. Parrots are more important than his wife. And he said, you've got to clean the parrots in um, the cages out every day and all that. And I said, well, I'm a butler. I said, I'm not a gamekeeper. And he looked at me. So I pulled out of that one. I just pulled out. And then um, I went up to Mickey Rooney, the famous actor in um, Westlake Village. He was just absolutely nuts. I thought, I don't want no part of you. And, I, and then I went back. And then, um, so this big actor came up, um, George Siegel. So I went to George's home and he lived in um, Bel Air, a beautiful place. And... Um, I goes to him. He'd, he'd been he'd been with um, he'd done a movie called um, Virginia Woolf with Elizabeth Taylor, and he was friends. He told me with Richard Burton, and I told him I took care of them on the QE two. Anyway, cut a long story short, he eyes me in his home in Bel Air, this beautiful home in Bel Air. It was gorgeous. I had living quarters. What to come with the job again? Big white Rolls Royce and a, um, a red Austin Martin. So George had this garage and he was doing, he had a few sets and then he was doing a few movies at the time. And he'd, he'd done a lot of movies, George. He'd done The Longest Day and he'd done the, name, the Valentine's Massacre and then The Owl and the Pussycat with Jane Fonda. And um, Glenda Jackson, she won a, an Oscar with him for some, um, some um, class act or something like that. And me and George, we could become friends. And anyway, he had this garage, and he had all the movies in the garage, the posters. And I asked him one day, I said, can I paint the garage? I want to put all your movies up for you. And he went, that would be great. And I, I painted the garage for him. And I put all the movies around the garage. And um, he had a lovely wife, Linda. And she was the manager of the Pointer Sisters. Remember the Pointer Sisters? Yeah. yeah. She was the manager of them. And um, he said to me, you'll get up to meet a lot of people here, Teddy. So I just carried on normal. And actually, the quarters, but he, he preferred me to live out, outside the home. So I'd go home at five o'clock. And it was a good little job. So I'd done the garage for him. And um, one day... He was going to lunch with a friend, um, another actor, and he never showed up. And so they had a table booked at the, the Brown Derby on um, Sunset. It was on Sunset or Wiltshire Boulevard. It was a famous restaurant. So we decided, so I said, what card do you want, George? No, well, it's called uh, Mr. Siegel. And he said, um, just take the Austin Martin. So here's me and him going down. In the Austin Martin, pair of glasses on, driving down sunset. Everyone's looking at us. Pulls up to the Brown Derby. Gets out the car, everyone's staring at the both of us. This older actor, they thought I was an actor. And we just gets out and walks in the restaurant. 
and I'm watching everyone and they're all staring at us. It was unbelievable. And um, came back, come back to the house and then in the evening, in the afternoon, I'd do them evening meals. I'd leave him and his, his wife evening meals. So one particular day, he was having a party in the garden and he gave me a list of actors to pick up. And he said, take the white Rolls Royce because it'll fit them all in. And he asked me, what are you doing for lunch? I said, well, I'll do um, an Irish stew. It's my mother's recipe. It's about a hundred years old. And he looked at me, really? And he said, yeah. So it's called Scouse. So it's called Scouse. And he went, really? Yeah, so it's, but it's Irish. So it's my brother's recipe. So I said, I used to learn it from her when I was a kid. And um, so the day come, I set the garden and all that. And I was excited. That's the role. So I used to got the list off him. The list had consisted of Buddy Aki, famous comedian, always doing Las Vegas. Bert Reynolds. I knew where Bert Reynolds lived because I lived next door to him in Wiseman's. And Charles Dane. And, and then there was another guy that was going to come later that I didn't know. He didn't tell me. Anyway, goes down, picks Buddy Aki up. Knocks on the door and said, yeah, um, Mr. Siegel's guest today. He comes out, little buddy comes out. He's a comedian, funny little guy he was. He's always on the Johnny Carson show. A lot. And he goes, I'm packing. And I was going, what? Oh, well, we, oh, he must have a gun. Yeah, and I'm packing. I pack all the time. Everywhere I go, I pack. And I'm like that. Wow. <laughs> well, get in. Anyway, get in. Gets him in. The car shuts the car. Goes over to um, Bert Reynolds, goes to the gate, presses the buzzer. Um, hello, yeah, um, guest from Mr. George Siegel. Um, I'm chauffeur. Bert comes out. Comes out, Bert comes out. He's about six foot two, dead handsome, you know. Gets in the car, closes the car on him. Goes down to another house on, um, just, it's just off Roxbury Drive. And goes to that house. And... Um, it was at the top of Roxbury on Lexington. It was on the corner. And I pulled up there. They were all gated areas. And it was um, Charles Dernan. And um, gets him out. And I've got the three of them in the back of the car. And I'm the chauffeur and I'm looking at them. And I'm clocking them in the back. <laughs> and I'm going, this is brilliant. It's like a movie. Gets to the house. They all go in the garden. Sit down. I've got the scouts warmed up. And... Um, George is smoking a big cigar. Always, always smoking a cigar. You know, when he was on the Johnny Carson show, smoking this big cigar, he was, he was unbelievable. And um, done a, he, he made his own, own mission one day to do cocaine. And I um, thought that was a bit like weird of him to do that to the public. But they can do what they want. So he said to me, Terry, bring the boys in the car. Do you want a drink? And I got them all a drink. And... I'd served him on silver. It was always silver, nice, you know. And he said, Teddy, there's gonna, um, another guy coming. He'll be in in about half an hour. So I'm in the kitchen and preparing all the food. And I've done some cabbage as well. Um, beetroot with the scouse. And I've got it all already warmed up on that. And I've got to serve on the plate, beautiful plates. And I'll take it out. Next thing, the doorbell goes. Goes to the door, and I open the door. It's Robert Redford. And I went, good afternoon. Welcome. I said, would you like a drink? He said, yeah, what have you got? And I said, they're all drinking scotch. I said, do you want a scotch? He went, sure, why not? <laughs> so next thing, they all went in the garden. They're all sitting in, in the garden and um, gave them the scouse. So George has got a script. He used to get these scripts from Hollywood and I'd see them in the bathroom and I'd, I'd have a little look at them and it was it was brilliant. So he gets the script and he's he's he's, he's in the garden and um, he gets the script and he gets angry 
and he throws it up in the air and he, he, he throws it on the fucking floor and he goes, um, I'm fucking sick of that goddamn ball and Brando. You know, this guy makes so much money every movie. And I'm like that. I, he said, I should be making enough. So Robert Redford says to him, calm down. And I'm watching this. George gets a cigar. He said, it's not like you, George. Why are you getting upset? And I'm just looking at them all in the garden. I'm shaking my head. So anyway, they have the scouts. They're all sitting there laughing and jo talking shite. And um, George comes in the kitchen. And I said to him, what are you getting upset for? Because I was quite close to him. And he said, man, and Brando. I said, well, there you go. I said, what an actor. One of the greatest theatre actors in the world. And he said to me, how do you know? Why would you know that? I said, well, I'd been to Joan Rivers' house, you know, the comedian. And while I was working for George, and he didn't know. And I'd been assigned for six weeks on the weekends. And she'd asked me to look after George Siegel had said to the agency, no, we can't go. He's under contract with me. I said, I'm under no contract. I didn't sign. Um, it's called a, a D. It's, it's, it's a, a contract um, where you sign and you don't sh show any um, talk about nobody. NDA. NDA. Yeah, non, yeah a non NDA disclosure. And, and so I said, no, I can do what I want. And he knew what I was going there because I'd said to him in the kitchen, I'd actually said to him, Marlon Brando. I said, I've been to Joan Rivers' house on the weekends I go there and I'm taking care of Salon and Olivia. And he told me that Marlon Brando was, was one of the greatest actors that he'd ever seen in his life. I said, so you should be honoured to be in that position with him. You should be honoured. I said, he's, he's unbelievable. And one question that I'd asked um, Sir Lawrence Olivia, when I did take care of him, was who was the greatest actor? And he had mentioned Marlon Brando. And then anyway, me and George got back again and they went back in the garden and someone had mentioned about the butler and someone said to him, wouldn't it be beautiful to have a butler in a movie? And he punched to me and he goes, there he is, there. That's him. He's been around. So I looked at him and I went, yeah, I'm the butler. I'm playing my part on the screen, but you don't see me. It's Oscar performance. Robert Redford looked at him and went, George went, I told you, you should have been an actor. <laughs> just like that. And I just started laughing. And I'm going, <laughs> fucking hell, the bank robber. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start out as the bank robber. <laughs> I'll do that movie first. And then the butler. <laughs> oh, my God. So next thing, I stayed with George a while. And um, anyway, things were getting on top of me, but I'd always been in touch Sean with um, a butler um, at Richard Donner's home. I'd shared an experience with him that we would meet at a park um, below um, Spelling's house, the big producer in the Holmby Hills. And he would drive a maroon Rolls Royce and I would drive a blue Rolls Royce and we'd meet in a park because we'd had the same interview and I'd met him in an agency and we cross swords in a shop called Gelson's in Century City, where you do all the shopping for the stars. And he was, he was, he asked me to come up to the house to Richard Donner's to meet Mel Gibson. And I said, oh, you know, I'll come up and have a cup of tea and that, you know. I said, I wasn't particularly interested because I'd met a few of them. I'd met Stallone's um, butlers, um, Kevin King and Paul Kane, 
they were Stallone's butlers. I'd met them years and years before this, and they were my friends. And they told me all about Stallone. Um, so there's quite a few English butlers, but this guy particularly was telling me he was so engrossed with his job. We had a cup of tea one afternoon in Richard Donner's, and his wife was going to school to be a psychologist. And they were leaving the job. So what he decided to do, he decided to take his own life. Yeah. And I was telling him that I was going to be leaving and going back to England. And I didn't know at the time how bad it was. And I was, I'd only had a few weeks left. I was going to, I was returning because I'd been in touch with some solicitors and they had told me to come back at the time. If the time could be appropriate for me to go back. Anyway, I got news from his wife that he'd, he'd took a gun of Richard Donner's and he'd killed himself. He shot himself in the home. And it was the headlines in all the papers, British Butler dies in the movie star's home. And mm-hmm. producer's home, Richard Donner. It was so sad. What had he done? So anyway, I ended my relationship with George Siegel. Actually, George was moving back to New York. He'd got his face done. He had a facelift. And he was selling the house in Bel Air. And they were moving to New York. And it was time for me to leave. So I'd made an arrangement to fly back to England to face justice um, because of the pressure. So I went to Palm Springs for the weekend with my wife and I'd called a solicitor in Liverpool. Um, his name is Rob Brody. He was a good friend of mine. And he's passed on now. And he said, come home, Teddy, just try it, see what you think. I said, will you represent me? He went, yeah. So we decided to leave Los Angeles and I rented my apartment out to a friend. I said, if I don't come back, you can keep it. But there was a bit of, I thought I'd get about seven years to 10 years at the time. I just had this beautiful life in California and I'll be going back to face 10 years or it could have been 15 years. I just wanted to get it over with. So we get back to Liverpool gets back and goes to the city centre. And, and I know everyone. Goes to the solicitor's office and says, Teddy, can we have some coffee with you? Says, yeah, all right. Goes with Rob, land the town, and he said to me, Teddy, you've been away for six years. I don't think they've got nothing on you. I think you'd be exonerated by now. He said, I'll make some inquiries. And his advice to me was not to give myself up. That was the advice. So I stayed in Liverpool and I'd met two of the old partners. And Joey Wright had betrayed the both of them. And I was outside the scare, outskirts of a home. And one of them said to me, Terry, will you come in with us? We're going to kill Joey. And I looked at them and said, yeah, we've got the gun upstairs. They had a shotgun. They had a handgun. And they said, they're going to kill Joey, right? And I sat and I looked at them and I went, hang on a minute. I've been in Beverly Hills, I've done this life, and I've come on back to this. And then some of the crime families at the time had invited me to do importation. But my life had changed the day I was in Wiseman's with the money and the redemption. And I'd been married. I'd been married eight years. And I was one to children. Anyway, my two friends, I had to change their thinking. And I told them, they said, he knows you're home. 
and Joey at the time was doing massive importation. I could have got in with Joey. So what I came up with was uh, an agreement with my friends that if, if you kill him, that I was associated to Joey, going back on the statements that he'd made against me, and I would be a target, I'd be his, his enemy, because they knew the cops, that he blew me up, and he had that connection with them, and I was one of the closest people to him at the time. So I changed these guys' minds, and I said, listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we tax him? And they looked at me and said, well, that's not a bad idea. I said, let me sort it out for you. And he said, well, he's scared of you, Terry. We know he's scared of you. I said, well, them days are gone, as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to go back to the United States anyway. So I'd met all some of the crime families, had some drinks with them all over the city, and they were they were delighted to see me. What are you going to do with Joey? And they, they thought I was going to have a straightener with him and all. I was going to do something. And I went, nah, lad. I said, I've got nothing against him. You know, he's a he's a blow-up merchant. He's a, it's a super grasser. And that was it. So what I decided to do was to go to his home. I know he was a bit of a tough guy, but to me it was nothing. I'd been dealing with all them all my life. So I went to his home and he lived on um, in Liverpool on Queen's Drive one night. And it was April, I'd, I'd arrived and it was light at night. So about 6.30 he went to the house. I just bang, 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 knocked on the door. And his wife opened it, Mary. Her name was Mary or Mary. She was a nice girl. She had two kids, young Joseph and Michael Wright. And... I said, hello, man. I said, it's Terry, how are you? I've just come home from the States. Joey pops his head around the corner and he goes, that you, Terry? I went, all right, how are you? And he said, how are you doing? I went, all right. And he, he didn't come to the door. He stayed where he was. And I went, here a minute, come, what's the matter with you? Come out, what's the do, lad? So he comes out. And, you know, he's put some weight on. He was a bit, a bit of a fat lad. and um, But he could have a go like. And I had a lot of bottles, fella. And I knew what he was doing through the grapevine, through others. And I kept that to myself. So I said to him, listen, can I have a pint with you? And we'll go up to Walton Road, to the Black Horse. I need to speak to you. He said, you've got a nice house. Got a lovely kids, lovely wife. I just need to speak to you. I said, Joe, it's not about me. It's in your best interest to come with us. I said, you're safe. I've got no one with me. I said, Joey, I'm standing here now. If I pulled a gun out, I could kill you right now. It's not about that. I said, come with me, let's have a pint. So we walked up. It was, a walk. it was only a few bus stops away. We walked up to Walton Road. And he was making a lot of dough at the time. A lot of dough in the 80s. And I'd heard that. So I sat with him. I had a drink with him. I said, listen, do you want 150,000 quid? And he looked at me and went, what? I said, do you want 150? I said, I'm the messenger. You've got to come up with 150,000 in cash. I said, if you don't, I think your life will be in danger. And it's a possibility that your sons will be targeted too. They'll be targeted. And that's all I've got to say to you. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 75. I said, no. Joey, it's 150. I said, I'm going to come back tomorrow. And he looked at me. He said, do you want another pint? 
And I didn't drink that much, you know. Which, well, I said, come on, I'll have another one. So I have another one with him. And he sits. I said, listen, lad, I'm going back to the United States. I said, your trial that you had with me, you had made statements against me. And I had the trial out with him in the pub. I said, you had boxed the jury off. You paid the jury for the not guilty. And that was my advice I gave you to follow the jury home on the bus. And I had done this for some people on the docks early in my life to follow the jury. And I'd get behind them on the back of the bus. An old friend of mine, Joe Evans, had been caught with a, a wagon load of whiskey and he was in custody. And I was pulled in with them with um, a good old friend called Jerry Benny. And I was young at the time and I followed the jury and I got behind them on the bus and I said, make sure you come in with a not guilty tomorrow. It's in your best interest. And I'd pass that on to Joey. What to do? And I got that message to him. And we always talked about that, how we would box off the Liverpool jury. And it worked for Joey. They even had the glass that they planted from the security guard onto Joey's clothes for forensic. That's how much they wanted to frame him. And they put it on my clothes. But the jury still came back in and he was found not guilty. I said, but what you told the cops, you exactly told the police that I had left to California, Joey. And it was in the Echo. It was an headline in the Echo. Liverpool man escapes to America after attacking a security guard on Scotland Road. You actually told them I went to, to Los Angeles. How fucking dumb are you? I said, but I tell you what, lad, I'm talking now our Liverpool language. They're going to have you. I said, you've got half an hour for me to cough. You've got half an hour. I'm leaving. I'm fucking off back to the United States to get on with my life. I said, what, what do you think? He said, what about a hundred? I said, I've just told you. It's 150. So tomorrow, Joey, there's going to be a car parked on County Road. In the back of the car, it's going to be a um, Medeo. They had the Medeo out there. This new car had come up with Medeo. This fella had a Medeo. The car's going to be parked there. The plates were changed on it. And I said, take the money. And I don't want you to bring it into the pub. Because if you set me up, Joey, and I get arrested, that's drug money. That you give them that what that's what you're making now. And he said to me, All right, Terry. I said, I'm telling you, lad, you've just saved I've just saved your life. I've actually saved your life. And you were the one that cast me up. I said, but I want to thank you for that because you actually changed my life. And I'd seen through this. I said, I went to Beverly Hills and I'd become a good butler and I've, I've had a good life and I'm going back to get some more. So thanks, mate. I said, go on your way, Joey. Anyway, I said, I'll see you tomorrow. Don't bring any heavies here, mate. Don't bring any guns. I said, and I will be here. Take the money and put it in the Medeo on this street. Besides the black horse, the back doors open and the two guys, my other partners, were watching the Medeo. He takes the money, he puts it in. They watch them. He comes back out. He said, do you want to have a pint? I said, no, thanks. I knew then I was outside in case anything happened to me on the inside. And I said, Joey, good luck. God bless you. So what happened to his life and his children's life, his son was executed. Mickey Wright was executed. In East Lancashire Road at a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Joey became a mule Importation to Scotland of heroin. 
the police had followed him one morning, got on the train with him and followed him to Scotland. They raided the apartment in Scotland and found all the heroin and the cocaine. And he, the judge gave them 25, the judge gave them 100, 100 years. They got 25 years each. Joey ended up in Scotland in jail during 25 years. Later on in his life, he got out. I think they um, they dropped it to 15 years. He'd actually asked me to come in with him. I couldn't, there's no way I could have done it. Because I was on my way back. His life was cut short down. The sentence was cut short down to 14 years. There was an order from a judge. And I think they confiscated his homes. He had multiple homes. He come out. He was depressed. Became an alcoholic. Went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And then he, 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 he fixated in, the, in his sleep. And he died on his own sick. And Joey had passed away. And that was the end of Joey's life. How old was he? I don't know at the time, Sean. I don't know. It was very sad. The other two guys, I saved their lives for not killing them. Because I know for a fact what had gone on in Liverpool, all the killings, that these would have got caught. The same with um, my other friends who were executing Dad and G. They finally got caught. That was the life of Liverpool. So then I would return to the United States to start a new life. That's 1987. 1987. That's the yuppies in the stock market crash year, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thatcher, 87, it? yeah. Yeah. Tha- yeah. So you go to Orange County. Go to Orange County. Goes back to Dora. Goes back <laughs> to Dora. Dora. Good old Dora. <laughs> the best international agency in the world. Now I was powerful. I was, I was classed then as the most wanted Hollywood butler in Hollywood. And I did about Orange County. And this gentleman was an attorney and he owned a five acre estate. So I decided to take a chance and drive to Orange County. The gentleman's name, the lawyer, was named Terry Giles. He is now um, Ben Carson, who ran for president. He's his attorney and his advisor. I get down to Orange County with my wife, Annette. It was a Sunday morning, and I always remember it was May. And I pulled up to the house, all gated, beautiful surroundings. And it was on a hill called Peacock Hill. And the reason why it was called Peacock Hill was where the peacocks used to roam. And I went in and had an interview with him. His house was 5,000 square feet. He had a cinema, five acres outside, waterfalls. Very, very, he was only 38. Took me to my house next door. My house next door had a swimming pool. My house was 4,000 square feet. <laughs> <laughs> had a gym in it. Everything. It was unbelievable. Next thing, the house next door, he, he'd knocked down. It was a million dollars and he built a tennis court. And he said to me, we've got some lovely exotic birds outside and they had peacocks and swans. <laughs> oh my God, I've never seen nothing like it. It was like, a, it was like paradise. It was like <laughs> a big hotel in Hawaii. And he had a lovely wife, Patty, at the time, and him and my wife connected. Patty's wife and Annette connected. And he sat back in the living room, and the living room was massive. And he sat with me and he said, um, I feel so comfortable with you. So I said to him, I'm not sure at the moment. He said, I'd love to offer you the job. I said, well, he said, well, I own a Toyota dealership. And I told him I just got back from England. He said, well, I can give you the new car for coming down. He said, I'll give you a Toyota Supra. And you can take it off the showroom floor. I said, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Giles. I said, well, I've got to go back to LA tomorrow. 
to meet Johnny Carson, the interviewer in Malibu. And I wanted to meet Johnny Carson. So I decided to hold off on him. And he said to me, will you commit to me? I said, I'll tell you what, listen, I love the grounds and that. And I love everything about what's going on here. But this interview's been set up. I've got to go. 95% I'll come to you. And I negotiate the wage. The wage was um, was good money. I'll, I'd be living in, to have all his credit cards, the car, and just the wage. The, the wage was like $80,000 in 1987. It was good money. It was quite a lot of money. I thought if I save up like for five years, you know, I'll have half a million. Ten years, I'll have a million dollars to buy at home. And anyway, I said, I'll, I'll be in touch with the agency. Next day, gets up, said to my wife, don't come with me, I'm going to drive to Malibu. Went to a place called Blue Heaven. Johnny Carson's estate. It's called Blue Heaven. Yeah, in Malibu. Went in and met Johnny. I just, I went through the motions with the interview. I really didn't want the job. It's what stuck in my mind was the freedom of having a lovely home in Orange County, but doing this job. So, went back to Zora. She called me that afternoon. She said, what's your decision? I said, um, I'll take Orange County. And I moved to Orange County. Moved to Orange County. Goes in the home, in the kitchen. There was a note to me and Annette and two cups and it said, welcome aboard. And it said, for Mr. and Mrs. Giles, this is the, one of the luckiest days of our lives that we've met you. Oh, was that nice? And a note and a month's wages. Um, it was six and a half thousand dollars. And I went, oh, these must be nice people. And... So all what I'd gone through. But the problem was I was half exonerated, but not exonerated. Uh Uh-oh. I'd been told to keep away, but I wasn't totally exonerated. So it still had a profound effect on my mind. Slated away, yeah. Slated in there. But I knew that I could just get on with it. And I changed and I thought about, I had two weeks holiday and I thought I'll go to the Hawaiian Islands. I thought I'll go there. And anyway, I took the job for Mr. Giles and he'd been in the news big time. His office, his offices were underneath the stairway of the, um, the tennis courts. And he had all his pictures on the wall in the Los Angeles Times. And I looked at them all. The Hillside Strangler, the Freeway Killer, Martin Luther King's estate he took care of. Richard Breyer, when he was Freemason, he was his lawyer. Frank Sinatra's lawyer. He was Frank Sinatra's lawyer. Frank Frank Sinatra Jr., there's a thing when women accuse him for having babies. I don't know what the name of it is. And Terry Giles would defend Frank Sinatra's son. And Giles would always go to Palm Springs. So basically, I started with Giles. I put this curriculum together for the home. And I had to put a menu because... They had um, a wine cellar, a cinema, and they would dine in different places on a Saturday night. And they had this palatial koi pond outside where they overlooked the grounds. And this is where I would serve them at night on the weekends and they'd have all guests over. It was absolutely beautiful. So I started the job. Everything was fine. Gourmet cooking everything um i took lessons from there was a, a private club down in um 
called The Golden Door in Escondido. Wiseman had actually sent me there when I'd worked for Wiseman for French cooking lessons and he paid for it for me. So, but I didn't give them too much because sometimes you give them too much and they expect too, they expect too much as well. So I didn't give too much. I always kept a lot back. I just started on the job. Um, he takes me first week to Garden Grove, Toyota. He said, which car do you want? There's a Celica, Toyota Supra and, and another. I said, I'll take that. The Supra? I took the Supra. I had a Supra around then as well. Did well, you? in the 90s, yeah. Yeah. By the last twin turbo thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there was the Celica and there was the Supra. So I got the Celica and um, just parked it outside the house. That was my day car for my day off. And then we had another Toyota for the, the chores. So we settled down with them. Doing a lot of entertaining at the weekends, keeping up on the the um, the grounds, maintenance, me and my wife. A lot of work involved. It was st- structured every day. So he told me that there was someone that was coming very important to the grounds. To me, it wasn't significant, but to them, it was significant. And he knew that I was the top quality man that I would serve him, me and my wife. And I never questioned him. I just entertained. But this day, he was excited. And he'd represented Martin Luther King's family, the estate. He was the lawyer for that. So this day, we, I sort of kept my distance from him. He was very, he was a brilliant lawyer. And I just asked him one day, I said, um, who's the guest this weekend? I said, because you, you're so excited. I've never seen you excited. He said, oh, it's Oprah Winfrey and Stedman. I said, oh, is he? I said, that'll be nice, won't it? Get to meet Oprah, eh? And he went, yeah. Anyway, so I was a little bit excited, like, and it was so, so. She'd just done the movie of Colour Purple at the time. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, she'd done that movie with um, Whoopi Goldberg. So he asked me what I was doing. I said, well, we'll do something life for though, because she was always on a diet. And I started laughing. I said, I'll do the nice salmon, eh? With the ginger on the top and that. And I said, I'll do... Um, a chocolate Sunday for her, souffle, and I'll do um, a nice salad and something nice and light. So the dining room, it was all gold silk. It was gold plated. It was absolutely gorgeous, marble. It was just, it's hard to explain it. It was like out of a movie. Anyway, the night came and we were all set. And we'd had a gazebo on the grounds with all the waterfalls. So when you entered, I entered, I picked Oprah up at the gates, two big white gates opened in a limousine. Good evening. How are you? Good evening, sir. Brings them in. Giles is awaiting down at the gazebo. That's what they did. And then I brought them down. And Oprah was like that, looking at the grounds going, isn't this beautiful? absolutely beautiful and I was watching Oprah and I was watching Stedman they were watching everything and she looked at me and she went are you the butler I went yes and I said my wife works with me oh it's a beautiful place I said yeah we keep it beautiful and they sat down they had a drink and then my wife went back to the kitchen to get it all ready in the main house and then eventually they'd sit down and they were talking business about Mandela in, in Africa. You know, you could hear certain things, but I wasn't that interested. In it. I just did my job. Then we'd we done the salmon. We did the dessert. And they had coffee. And Mr. Giles was always drinking his wine, the Pouli Fousse. That was his favourite white wine, Pouli Fousse. And... Next thing, the door opened and she comes in to the kitchen and she said to me, 
this was absolutely beautiful. And she said to me, where are you from? I said, Liverpool. She went, that was the most amazing meal I've ever had. So we started doing some banter with her. Thought I'd let her down here. So that was your show going. She went, great. I said, yeah, I'll watch you now and again on my break here. She went, do you? I said, yeah. I said, do you want me on the show? She started laughing. (laughs) 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 And I started laughing with her. And I said, I can go on the show, you know, tell you some stories about Beverly Hills. (laughs) 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 Anyway, she started laughing. And then she started laughing. She went, how long have you been? I said, I've been a butler all my life, you know, apart from what I've done in the past. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking nuts. She said, oh, you're amazing. So anyway, anyway, she stayed the night, actually. She stayed the night. And then the next day I took care of her and I gave them breakfast, took care of her instead. And they had lunch and then the limousine come. And she'd come like every month. Wow. And I got to know her. And she was, uh, I found her to be a nice woman. That's the way I found it. A lot of people say different. And um, I just carried on and we carried on with the Giles having all these experiences. And then Terry was doing a trial. He'd gone out and there was a guy, um, he was called the Fred Bar Douglas murder in Orange County. It was very famous where he'd gone out, this guy, committed murder and Terry Giles had got him off with the murder. He went out again. Did another one. He did another one, but she didn't die. He chopped the girl's arms off. Hold on, this is that guy from um, Joey Torres interview. Is it? Yeah. He was in prison with this guy, Larry something. I don't know his name. Yeah, because the guy said to him, um, you know, you chopped her arms off and she got like so much money. And, and yeah. he said, but um, well, the bitch can't spend it, can she? Yeah. That's what the, the killer, the, yeah. he said in prison to this guy. Yeah. yeah, that was probably the case. Yeah. Isn't that so coincidental, Sean? Yeah. Very coincidental. Scary guy, the killer. Yeah, he was, he, yeah. he was. So what happened with Teddy Giles, he was the greatest criminal lawyer with another guy called John Barnett, mm. which I'd meet John later on when in, after I'd have some trouble in Los Angeles. I'd meet John down the line. He was going to, def- he actually, def- he will, de- I'll tell you the story when he, he defends me. And Teddy Giles had gone to come to the conclusion that, oh, I've had enough of defending killers. And he quit criminal law. And he moved into an area of corporate law where he was very well known in the world as one of the greatest lawyers from Pepperdine University you could ever go to. Anyway, he took this case and it was um, computer land in the 80s. And how I know about the case is because they shared it with me and I got to look after the owner of computer land and he was the fifth richest man in the world and his name was Bill Millard. So he was coming to the house and Terry consulted me to tell me that, Terry, can you do your best? I said, well, of course. So Bill Millard and his team, Ed Faber and all of them were coming and there was a lawsuit at the San Francisco courthouse where they were getting sued or something was going on in the trial. Anyway, I took care of my lad and his wife and he had a daughter, Barbara. She was the CEO of Computerland. Terry had told him to step down and then Barbara would take over and she would become the CEO. So they had the trial, went on for quite a while. They'd all come back to the house at the weekends, be in the pool, having hamburgers, having an extra, you know, pool if you say wine. Then they get ready. They go back, fly a private plane back to San Francisco, and then the trial would resume. Anyway, they came in, the verdict came in. Terry Giles won the biggest lawsuit in history. Wow. 360 million. Won the lawsuit. 
they all came back to the house and they were drinking champagne. And Terry had come up to me, Mr. Giles, and he said to me, I said, how did you do? So said, yeah, we won the case. I said, congratulations. He said, and um, Bill Millard's very impressed with you. He talks about you all the time. I said, that's good, isn't it? I didn't think nothing of it, just, it was nothing. Um, he told me, he said, Terry, we'll be going away in a few days. We're flying on a private plane to, to the coast of Australia, to an island called Hamilton Island. Very exclusive. Two days later, they'd gone out for meals and that, and they'd, Terry owns a club in Newport Beach called Magic Island. It was a restaurant and it was a magic show. I had access to that. I could go there any time I want. I did train one of the chefs there and the manager how to run it. And anyway, Terry come down this morning and he said to me, Terry, we're going away for a month. The house is yours. And I was so tired. And he said, Bill Millard's going to come over to see you. He wants to thank you. And he, he said to me, Teddy, thanks. He said, go down to the club and have what you want. Take your friends, champagne, do what you want. I said, nah, I think I'll just have, I'll, I'll just play a bit of tennis. That's all I'll do. Because I was so tired. Anyway, Bill Millard came over and his wife. And he stood there and he thanked me in the net for the service that we, they gave us. Wow. That I'd gave them. And... You gave me an envelope with ten thousand dollars in it. He said to me, Teddy, here's the ten thousand. It was in an envelope. He went, This is for you. And he actually made a comment and he said, I've had the best butlers. He said, You are the finest butler I have ever seen. And what a compliment. Left, what they a left, compliment. yeah. They left and they went to Hamilton Island. And I was left with a net and we had the whole place to ourselves. But we were too tired. You couldn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But it was brilliant. Yeah, but it was about to turn sour a few years as I went on. It sounds like the next one's challenging with the Catholic bishop. Yeah, well, what happened there, Sean, is my wife had got pregnant in the Gileses and I was so happy because we had lost a baby in 1984-85 when I was at Max Factors and um, she was four months pregnant and we'd lost that and so now my wife had told me that she was pregnant and I was delighted so we got the heartbeat that was the most significant thing that what I told you was the heartbeat and we get to the heartbeat and I'm over the moon. We go and tell the Gileses and they're unhappy because they didn't have kids mm. and they didn't want kids. So next thing, after all these years, he said to me, Terry, I'll have to get a new couple. And I said, hang on a minute. I'll be your manager. I'll hire another butler and you'll have it. He said, no, but we want Annette as well because she played a big role with his wife. So I honestly think that Terry Giles, him and his wife had had an agreement that they didn't have children. I live next door and they don't want a child on the property for insur insurance purposes. So that position... A month later ended, mm -hmm. after all them years. But it was a great experience that I had with him. It was absolutely unbelievable. And we parted ways. And then I head out, and then I go back into the real world, and I buy a little home in Santa Ana. And I'd kept in touch with the window cleaner. I'd hired him. And he asked me to go in business with him. And I did do eventually. But I got 
another position from Dora again. And it was actually in Orange County. And it was the bishop for the Catholic Church, Todd Brown, in Orange County, that there was a school called Marta Day High School in Santa Ana, the biggest Catholic school this side of the Mississippi. And they wanted a, a cook. They called themselves, they want a cook. Well, I'm not a cook. I was a chef. A cook to me is like McDonald's. So I'd gone to this school and the principal was John Wiling and he told me about the house that Mr. Todd Brown had sent me and he was the major decision maker and he hired me to be the chef at the house. And then what I found is it was very un, very unusual. There was a priest there and he was dying of AIDS. He was actually dying of AIDS. And they asked me to keep it quiet. So because of my loyalty, I kept it quiet. And there was times that I, I fed him. I fed the priest and I kept quiet and used to feed them all like every night. Like I went in from four to nine. It's like part time. And then I used to watch the priest and they'd be, he had the intravenous and it was a white shake they were giving him in his arm and he was dying. And later on in life, they used to mock society. They would mock society and how things were. And we had a girl who was a cleaner and she was a little bit disabled and the standards of a cleaning weren't up to theirs. And I picked up on this in a conversation and I thought, this is not working here. And it was always in the back of my mind how we, how we got the AIDS at the time. Later on in life, he'd been in, involved in um, sexual abuse because there was a lawsuit in Orange County and in, his name was mentioned. And you know who defended the case? Giles. Giles. Teddy Giles defended. It was a $100 million case. He defended it. So I carried on and stayed with them a while and then eventually I left. But my baby was born and I bought this little house in Santa Ana and then Kelly was born Aww. and we had this little baby and I was in the hospital and I was in, down the street was all, all, all the gangs, the Santa Ana gangs and they were all in the, no, the hospital in the Western Medical Centre with the, with the gunshot wounds. And on the top floor, they had the maternity ward. And, he, he, you know, they heard all the sirens coming in. Oh, it's a gunshot wound. You know, all the Mexicans fighting in the barrio down the street. And I, I, I lived dead close to it. And um, anyway, Kelly was born. And it was beautiful. It was 1989. Shout out to Kelly. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kel. All right, love. Yeah. And it was beautiful. Oh. So I didn't have any insurance. And they came round for the bill. And the bill was 15,000. And my wife was in the bed. And they're asking for the bill. And I'm going, we haven't got it. I did have money, Sean, but I wasn't going to give that kind of money to an hospital. I thought to myself, I'll do a deal with them later on if it goes on my credit. And um, it was 15 grand. Later on, I come back to haunt me when I bought another house. It was on my credit. And I'd done a deal with them. And I paid them seven and a half thousand. 
and then eventually it all cleaned itself up. So then I carried on and um, I decided to build the window cleaning business up. So you in, in Orange County, you've got the north, the central and the south. And I brought this other guy in and two other guys. And I thought, well, let's see how we do the first year. So I changed the, I came up with an idea and it was called Britannia Windsor Cleaning. And I advertised in the north, the central and the south. And that was stayed at home. And she'd be the secretary. And I had three guys working for me. And I went out and I marketed it. I had two vans. And we did well. The first year, we made it under grand. It was great. Made it under thousand. Living in Santa Ana. Yeah. So, carried on. And what happened was, I put Kelly in a private school. Carried on. But it was always on my mind wanting to be a butler. Um, you know, just it was always in my system. The butler, the butler. I'd met so many people on private homes. They were custom homes all over Orange County. And I'd met a guy called Bob Citron and his wife, Terry. And I'd actually go into these homes and I was very trustworthy. And I, I ran the old place and they wrote the check and they just left us in the houses. And they said, lock the door up and that. They knew we were after they got to know us. So this one particular guy, his name was Bob Citron. And he was the county treasurer in Orange County. And I got to know him. He was a bit, very miserable man. But Terry was lovely. Then all of a sudden, all over the news in Orange County, It was the taxes of all the homes that you had your taxes. You'd write your cheque to him on the taxes on the house. Well, can you imagine the money in Orange County? Well, that was pooled and that went into the stock market with Merrill Lynch. So their returns that they were getting off that money was quite substantial. But all of a sudden, it was about to go wrong for Bob. He got you confidence. Then all of a sudden, the money was lost in the stock market. And what they said, he got arrested. County Treasurer Bob Citron gets arrested in Orange County. He's arrested. He's put out on police bail. It's all over the news, all over the world. Orange County has gone bankrupt. I don't even remember this. I do, yeah. But that was Bob Citron. Wow. So Terry, I was in the house. All the news used to come to the house. She had no one to talk to. And she relied on me a bit. And I said, when does he go to court? And she goes, he goes every week. And I said, why are you going out the front of the house? Into the media? And she said to me, Teddy, do you think you could help him? This poor guy was lost. He was frail. He had these lawyers that were just, I don't know, they were okay, but they never had the common sense what we would have done, Sean. So I decided to step in and I said, well, so I sat down with Bob and I said to him, do you want me to guard you? And he went, yeah, and if you could help me. He, he, didn't, he couldn't answer that question. I said, let me help you out. He said, the day you go to court, 
what we're going to do, we're going to go out the back door. You're not going through the door and then they're following you to the courtroom, making a show of you. So when I made the agreements, it was in um, a very exclusive place on Sharon Lane in Santa Ana, this home he had in Floral Park. Opposite side to that, you had all these infested barrios of the gang members. And then on the other side, you've got Floral Park, Bob Citron. It was nuts. So anyway, I looked out and I'd done a search of the, the old street. And at the time, I had a brand new Ford Taurus. So I went to the neighbours next door. And I went to the back of the street and I clocked the house. And I went to them and I said to them, excuse me, my name is um, Terry Mugan. I'm the bodyguard for Mr. Citroen. And they looked at me. I said, he's getting harassed every time he goes to court. I said, could, we, could you help us out? Or would you be willing to? And they said, yes. What can we do for you? Most Americans in that neighbourhood and the old Americans going back in them generations would help you. A lot of them wouldn't get involved, Sean. They said yes. I said, well, see this garden here, see this fence. I want to take some of the plywood out and we'll make it a gate. We'll access his garden into your garden. My car will be in the front of your house and we'll bring him out the back way. Then he's in the car with me and his wife, and I'll, I'll take him to the Orange County Courthouse. So he called me his bodyguard. <laughs> I wasn't really his bodyguard, <laughs> but in the essence where I showed him common, what common sense was, <laughs> and I just took him to court every week. So in that case, what happened then was he, he never done anything wrong. He never done any self-gain. He never stole anything. He had great lawyers. So we're in the house one day, went on for a while. I carried on with my life during the winters and I carried on and every week I did it, went to his home, sat with the mad coffee, so this day, Terry said to me on a Friday, we'd brought him home and he'd been in to see the judge and he'd come out and he said, Terry, just drop me off at the house. So I took him to the, the neighbours. We went in the back. We went in the kitchen. And I said to him, is everything okay? He went, yeah. He said, I got my final sentence today. And I said, what is it? He said, it's 12 months at the food bank. That was, that was my imprisonment. Because he didn't steal nothing for his own gain. Sounds like Merrill Lynch encouraged him to gamble it. Yeah, probably. Probably at the time. We didn't know the, the fundamentals of the case. So what happened is he got 12 months and then they still became my friends. Every Christmas they'd send me this beautiful photograph of the two of them together. Oh. I've still got them. Oh. And, you know, they were really nice people. And then I just carried on with my life. Until the traveller's checks come. Oh, my God. Ah, oh, this was one bad mistake on my part. After all that. I faltered. I really faltered. I was actually... I was actually ashamed of myself for doing this. Well, there was a heist in Liverpool. And there was $3 million taken off the docks. I was involved with five of the men who had been charged with that. One had died in a car accident in Liverpool, Jenny McGibbon. The other friends, were not, some of them were notorious. Um, Jerry Conchie, John's brother, he was, he was in it. One of my other friends was in it, was big. And a, 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 a Cockney that had been arrested in London, Alan Wells, Wellesie. So in the prison, 
um, I'd been asked when I got out, would I mind some of the traveler's checks for a friend? And my share of it would be compensation of 25,000. But then you did what you did and I kept them and my wife had brought them to America with her and I had them in a safety deposit box in a bank. So a friend of mine had come, home from, come over from Liverpool and I asked him to bring him some of the, the old-fashioned licences the green license to copy it and I'll, I'll get a few of them. So basically I had 25 grand of American Express and I started cashing them in Orange County. So every time you write a check, it's a felony. I didn't know that, Sean. I've got Kelly. I've bought a house. Making an underground on the windows. And I've faltered, I've defaulted. So I was getting away with it. Go to all the miles, cash them in, cash the mail. I'd take the money, put the money in the safety deposit box. For some reason, the Saturday morning, I got up. And I was with a friend and I thought, well, where's the money flowing? It's in Disneyland, isn't it? All the registers, the tills, all the cash everywhere. I can knock these out easy. Takes a taxi with a dear friend to Disneyland. Next thing, cashing them in. Takes one woman. She didn't like the signature. She calls it in. I get surrounded on Main Street in Disneyland by six coppers from the Disneyland police. They took me to the, the police department in Disneyland. The Hannah Iron police came and got me. They come in Disneyland, put me in the back of a police car and was taking me to Anna Iron police station. I swear on Kelly's life, as they're bringing me out of the police station, Mickey and Minnie are walking past. And fucking look at me. <laughs> they fucking look at me. And I just put my fucking head down. And I went, the most unhappiest place in the fucking world is Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fucking nicked in Disneyland. <sighs> the fucking bank robber's been nicked in fucking the most happiest place in the world. It's fucking Disneyland, lad. I get fucking nicked. So I'm in the police station in Anaheim and um, the CID come in. But what's in my mind is the three million iced in Liverpool. Are they going to connect this? A few of my friends got not guilty. Alan Wells got eight years. Jerry Conti got five years. There was some guilt there. And I went, are they going to get me on this? So anyway, it goes in the police station and I got an OR, my own bail. And I got out with the, um, it was three felonies. Because when you take a check into a private property, Sean, that's breaking and entering. You're burgling Disneyland. So I got done for burglary on Disneyland. 
And then I got done for the traveller's check. And I was fucked. I was fucking knackered. Got home. I had a lovely home. Lovely cars. And I went. I'm wanted in England. I'm still wanted officially. And I'm nicked in America. What have I done? Let myself down. Anyway, I retained an attorney by the name of John Barnett. He was the the attorney that represented the police officers in the in the in the the um, the Rodney King beating. And I went to see John. And he knew me from Terry Giles. He was Terry Giles' partner. He'd been to the house for dinner. I thought, I've got to get John Barnett. Anyway, the three felonies would add up to over four years in jail. However, I was having another problem at the time with one of, a neighbour, an American crazy neighbour. Um, he was jealous of me and he used to bully his, his mother next door and he knocked on the door one night and told me to move my trucks over. I moved them. They knocked on the door again and I said, excuse me, I said, my daughter's asleep. Don't be knocking on the door, mate. I've just moved them. He fucks off, he comes back. Knocks on the door again. So I just grabbed him by the throat and I pushed him out to the street. And I kept hold of his throat and I, I said to him, I'll fucking break your jaw next time. His mother's standing there watching it. They call the police. Seven police cars come on a 911 call. So I defended myself in front of the police. I went, no man. And I, you know, the old Liverpool came out of me. I didn't back down to these cops. This fucking motherfucker here and he's, he's a cunt and everything. He's bullying, bullies his man. And so next thing, they said to him, do you want to press charges? He said, yeah. Fucking gets arrested again for an assault. I'm going, fuck this. John Barnett told John, you know, it's classed as violence in America. It's two things that you don't tolerate, as you know, violence and drugs. Next thing, goes to court. So they put them together. Anyway, I was going to leave for England and do one. Thought, nah, I'm just stay here. Anyway, comes up the case after a few months in January. The judge said, okay, the sentence is four and a half years. And I went to John, that's too much, man. That's too much. He said, well, if you can do restitution for $25,000 and then pay the victim back 5000 for the assault, we'll give you two. So I, I disagreed with it. Anyway, cut a long story short, I got 18 months. Did you have to do the whole thing? No. No, I didn't do the whole thing, Sean. I agreed there, and then the judge said, what do you want to do? I said, well, you, I said, you can take me now. So they took me. Said goodbye to Annette. Kelly wasn't there. Kelly was three. And we had to tell Kelly that her dad was going away on a ship. So here I am. 
I'm going to America in jail, to jail. I could have done one, but I stayed. Goes in the jail. You know what it's like, Sean, all the Mexicans and that. And fucking white guy, you know, this white guy stands out. Gangbangers. Yeah. Everybody. I thought. But I knew I was tougher than them. And I'm going to show it when I get in there. From the Borstal. From London prisons I'd been in. And... Gets in there, and you know, it's all big tanks, elevators in the Orange County prison. Well, it's a jail, they don't call it prison. And two guys are upstairs, get all my kit and that, and we're going in the tanks. And two of them go, um, Yeah, we'll take this guy upstairs with a white guy. I just fucking looked at them and I went, You know, when I get upstairs, I'm going to fucking take the two of you. I'm going to fucking kill the both of you. <laughs> and he went, wow. So the guard looked at me. And one of them shouted, you an Irish gangster? With the accent. And I went, yeah, I'm an Irish gangster. So they took me and I got segregated into another tank. And I went in the tank with them. And then it was started then. Stayed in Orange County for quite a few months. And um, I established myself. To shadow box and all the Mexicans loved that. Got the towels at night and all that, you know, to earn respect. Toilet rolls in socks. Yeah, everything. I've done it all. And then um, I got shipped out to um, an open prison, James Music. Get shipped out there. And I think I've got five or six months left. So goes in the jail this morning. They took us at three in the morning. Then they got us back up at, at five. To all the music, the Viet music. Dang, 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 dang. All this music. It was crazy. So I'd made a mistake that the next day, you, could, you know, they give you them big black boots. And I'd made a mistake. I put my foot on this guy's bed. And he was about six foot three. And he said to me, Hey, motherfucker, get your foot off my bed. I'll kick the fucking goddamn shit out of you. So I went like that. I just ignored him. So on the, com the commissary, I bought cigarettes to... I just bought 20 cigarettes. So we goes to recess this morning, the next morning. And put two towels in the back of my pants. Give one guy a cigarette. Got a match and a litter for him. The other fellas looking at me like that. Says, you smoke, man. He went, yeah, says, here, yeah. got the match, put it down and put the towel and just went like that around me. And I just threw a right hand and I hit him and knocked him out. And there was two black guys there and he went, wow. He just went, woof. So next thing, I said, get him up, took him in on the bed. I said, go and tell the guards he fell over and banged his head. And as I walked away, I said to them all, any fucking messing out of any of you, that's what you're getting. You're going to fucking behave yourselves, the lot of you. So I had actually established myself in the prison. And um, they took him out. There was a little bit of discrepancy. They thought that I'd done it. I was questioned. I said, no, he fell over. Yeah, and I said, he, he banged his jaw and his head as he went down. <laughs> and everything was okay. I got away with it. Good. Yeah, I got away with it. Carried on with the sentence. And I, I went on the fire crew. I went on this fire crew. I was on the fire crew and um, outside cutting fire lines. 
and then um, got in, and then I was finally released. Yeah, I'd done about nine months. And then as I came out, one of them said to me, one of the prison officers said to me, are you a citizen? And I just said, yeah. I just said, yeah, I'm a citizen. You know why? Deport- they said my green card. Deportation. Deportation. Yeah. Deportation. Gonna get nicked. So I just carried on, come out. Then all of a sudden, a week later, where I'm living, the guy next door I walked past him. He's got a gun. I actually seen the gun as I walked past the window and he had the gun like that. And I walked past and I looked at it and he was staring at me. I walked down the end of the alleyway. I come back round, went back in the house. I said to my wife, eat a minute, come with me. So get Kelly. And we went out. And I went, he's got a gun. She went, as he said, yeah. I said, he might do me. So next thing, I said, where's, call the nearest real estate agent up. I said, and put this house on the market right now. So we packed up, left the house on the market, and I moved to Irvine that week. And I got an apartment in Irvine. And I moved to Irvine to get out of Santa Ana. I think within a month we sold the house, got my money back and I made a few quid. And then um, I set up buying another home in Irvine. And then put Kelly in school. Then I just carried on and carried on. And then... I kept in touch with um, Brody in England and um, I decided to one day go back. So I got a few jobs, small jobs as butler. Um, One was on the coast in Orange County for these multimillionaires, St. John Nitz. And I ran their home for them. Kobe Bryant lived next door to them, the basketball player. I used to say hello to Kobe now and again. And it, it, it didn't work out, that job. And then I just carried on. Just carried on with my life, doing the window cleaning. And then I just put Kelly in school, private school. Carried on. And then I decided... The years were getting on, I decided that I'd go home. 1996. 86, yeah. And, um, well, no, but it was after that. You're going to file a lawsuit against the Catholic Church? Yeah, yeah. So, I decided to go to England, settled down, bought another home in Irvine, and I goes home, but we dad, I had a problem. I was working on a home, and there was three hundred thousand dollars gone missing out of an account. So I had this house where I was like the butler manager, and it was on the in the Irvine on the lake. And this London crew came in and they were fixing the house up, putting new cabinets in, putting all this stuff in, new carpets. And I was in charge. So next one morning, the FBI surrounded the house and stopped me. And took me into the Irvine Police Department and said, what's going on? 
I said, well, I had them out uh, from the Yellow Pages. They'd gone in and they took 300,000 out of this account. And they said to me, was any of them checks go to you, Terry? I went, no. So what they were insinuating, John, that I was the facilitator. Conspiracy. Conspiracy to facilitate. The FBI had said to me, if we thought that you had anything with this case, we'd arrest you right now. And they never. They never arrested me. So I decided to get out the way a little bit. I decided to travel to England. And I went to England. And I was with Kelly and my brother, and I was staying at my brother's. And we were going to Southport. And As we were driving, I said to my brother, stop over here at this home. I want to show Kelly where it was, where I went to school. It was St. George's approved school. So we goes on the yard and my brother got all nervous. He got really nervous and he went, no, you've got to get off here. You've got to get off. Next thing... We got off and he was in the car and he was dead nervous and he went to under investigation. I said, what for? He said, oh, they've all been arrested for sexual abuse. Then he said to me, the police are looking for you. The police are looking for you. So... I decided, we had our lunch, it was playing on my mind. I had a bottle of champagne. So I decided to get in touch with the police. But before I did that, I'd gone to Brody. And I asked him to do a search warrant. Before I did it. He does the search warrant in his office. And... It, and they had stamped on it, agents, either them or the police. I paid £25 for the de Department of Prosecutions. We went and had a cup of tea, me and Rob Brody. It came back. Agent, no warrants. <laughs> he just looked at me and said, I told you, didn't I? <laughs> to stay away. I was exonerated. Went bang. Now, the police on the Whittle was set up by um, Operation Care. They were set up. Went to see some lawyers and I got involved with suing the Nugent Care Society, which is formerly the Catholic Church, on three of the homes. St. George's, St. Aidan's, and St. Joseph's, where I'd served 12 years for the mental abuse and physical abuse. And then there was a lot of sexual abuse that most of them were arrested. Most of them. So when Operation came to me, Operation Care, they came to me and they interviewed me. All the children hadn't seen each other for 30 odd years. And I had said to them, is everybody telling the story right? He went, yes. So then we had to get in touch with the solicitors. Cantor Jackson, then there was other solicitors in Manchester, so many involved. Then that started. That was taking like 14 years of my life up to sue them. Backwards and forwards to England. It was a holy nightmare. And um, I'd gone back and then they wanted me back again. 
wanted me back. And then it really got heavy. They told me that I had to go to Rampton Hospital for the criminally insane to see three forensic psychiatrists. I drove to Rampton as an outpatient and I sat in a room with three psychiatrists that was assigned by the court. They were for the court, they weren't for me. That was their defence. And I'd gone in with them. And my plan was, the first question I had for them, have you seen the reports from 1981? Dr. Messina, Dr. Nelson, and Dr. Ralph Obler. And they said, yeah. In them reports, it was said I was misused and I was abused in the homes. So they had no way that they could defend their own, their own attorneys. <laughs> so the interview lasted six hours. And I actually said to the Dr. Millen, what are you looking for? He said, we're looking for split personality because of the abuse you would get a split personality. And I said, I don't have that. So he said to me, you've done the Beck, the Beck's inventory, haven't you, Terry? And I went, yeah. The Beck's inventory is a scale of psychological and psychiatry where the levels of anxiety and the levels of depression either moderate, high, or extremely high. Mine came in extremely high with the score. So on that score, that meant that I had to be hospitalized. So Dr. Millen had said to me, Terry, it looks like you need to go into hospital. And I said to him, no. I'm going to be all right. I said, it's because of this case now. And he let me go. He let me go. I calmed down. And the lawsuit took about 14 years. I went through it. But in the meantime, I was getting angry and then I was sent to the NHS in Manchester for another evaluation. Each school had a psychological and a psychiatric evaluation. Then I was sent to the NHS, the social services, to be evaluated again. Basically, the three evaluations had come up all the same. Severe chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, which meant I had to be hospitalised. But I was functional in the world, and they were concerned about me. So I just got on with it. So throughout them 14 years, I decided to get a doctor in Orange County. His name was Dr. Daniel Amen, that he represented the F NFL for the head injuries to prove me case against the Nugent Care Society. I paid approximately $5,000 to be examined. Now, it wasn't an examination where it was talking to us, uh, a, a, a psychiatrist or a cognitive psychotherapist. This was machines that would go inside the brain, the left lobe, the right lobe, 
and they'd have all these machines and they could see it. And actually, in the in the amygdala in the brain and the papillary gland, they could see all the anxiety in the brain. And Dr. Daniel Amen is one of the best in the world. So he did me brain and he came out and he, he said to me, you're suffering from... Then he also gave tests for ADD and ADHD and bipolar disorder. And it came up that there was ADD, ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, bad intru- um, intrusive thoughts, and cyclothermia. So in bipolar, in the factory of bipolar, you have a mental illness. You have bipolar one, bipolar two. Cyclothermia is a mild bipolar. So he sent me to a, a professor of psychiatry Dr. Mark Zeaton, renowned best professor in California to be examined to support my case. He examines me, cost me thousands to prove my case against the church. While that was going on, the police had given information to a guy called Christian Walmar, who had wrote a book on the history of the abuse in children's homes. We've interviewed him. Have you? Yeah. Do you remember? He uh, featured in our Jimmy Savile documentary. Did he? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, let me elaborate on this. Please do, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely beautiful man. Yeah. So the police in on in the care. Operation of Care had told them the most strongest man we've got is Terence Morgan. He's a survival. He hasn't died. He's the greatest. And he has more mental strength than most people. So Christian Walmart calls me. And he wrote the book, The Forgotten Children, all about the care homes. And we're building this rapport backwards and forwards. And he asked me questions, Terry, is it true? And I said, of course it is. I wouldn't doubt. I said, the only way that it wouldn't be true, if there's a kid that's doing a life sentence where he'd been injured by in the care home where he wants to get back at his perpetrator and say it was him and get him and I I couldn't see that I could have said things to Christian I could have said things to Operation Care where I said that I was raped by certain men that were being arrested for rape. I could have said things, but I just told the truth. I could never get a man say that he raped me and then he would get a life sentence or a 20-year sentence. And that was the situation in one of the cases where Christian was asking me. So we became friends with Christian and I was sending him emails backwards and forwards. I was actually going to bring them and show you them, (laughs) but I thought I'd give you sufficient evidence in my life, and I do have them. So I kept in touch with him, and he's um, he's from London, and then he became a member of Parliament, and I kept in touch with him. So I wrote a, a story of my life, and I wrote a poem, and it was about pain from when I was a child, and I'd sent him that, the pain of my life. Each year was significant to pain, what I'd gone through. 
And he had said to me, I have never in my life met anyone like you. He said, Teddy, keep going. Keep going, my friends. And then I found out later he became a member of parliament. And sometimes I often think about sending him an email. And, it, and I think he's wrote some books from that. I've got his email if you want it. Yeah, I have it. I have yeah. his email. Yeah. Yeah, I've got his email. <laughs> yeah, isn't that coincidental? Yeah. That is really coincidental. We went to his house in London. Really lovely guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Lovely man. Mm. Arsenal supporter. <laughs> I was supposed to meet him in Wales in 2001 <laughs> when Liverpool played in Cardiff <laughs> and uh, it didn't, didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. So just went on and then and then I came across another incident when I was going to see a friend when I was having my lunch with Operation Care in the city centre and they told me some stories and I, and I said, I can elaborate on that. And one was a guy who would, his name was Williams. He was the former headmaster of St. George's. When I was there, it was Mr. Hickey. So I'd gone to see a friend up in Southport and I told him I was filing, joining the lawsuit, the class action lawsuit. And he said to me, what lawsuit? He said, I was in that home. He said, I was in there two years before you. And he said, the headmaster's name was Williams. I said, I've just spoke about him. He's going to be arrested. And he actually told me that he'd been raped. So I said to him, I said, he lives in Formby, this guy. So I organised a plan that I would kidnap him, get him. And I was scared of my friend a little bit. That I had these, what you call intrusive thoughts, that I was going to get him, go in his house at night, tie him up, put him in the boot of a car, and then I was going to put a rope around his neck, and I was going to tie it to the car, and I was going to drive him down the street at 50, 60 miles an hour. And I was going to kill him. But I always remember I'd, I'd counselling from a doctor in California, Carol Ann Way, and she said to me, Terry, they're going to get what's coming to them. They will get what's coming to them. And I pulled out and she said, you need peace. What goes around will come around. Unfortunately, this man was never arrested. He was too old and the statute of limits, limitations had run out in time with him. Often the case. Yeah. And um, eventually the case was settled. Well, actually, they done two trials in London. Case A and Case B, Boy A and Boy B. And what they found, they found them guilty. And the judges went back and said, you've got to settle the cases. But the cases at the time put you in a, in a case where there's different levels of violence, different levels of abuse, where it gives you a statue of how much money you're going to get what you're going to get. In my case, it was, they'd offered me £22,000. If I would have known this in the beginning, I wouldn't have been part of the lawsuit. There was no way I wouldn't have done it. But one of the reasons why I did it 
was to change the system in Britain that they couldn't touch any children in the future. Good. And the law had changed that they couldn't touch actually a child ever again. And the laws were changed. And we... It took me all them years. It was how an effect. And then, you know, I had a lot of bad things going through my head. But I just, I just got on with it and got over it. You know, it's still there. And we got a lousy 22,000 quid. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And probably today in Britain it's still going on. I don't know what goes on today. Because they get slaps on the wrist. There's no... Some join the church because they know they'll just get the high-priced lawyers to protect them. Yeah. It's, it's, you know. So the, there came a point when temptation, you refused some uh, criminal underworld members from Liverpool tried to get you back. Yeah. I'd gone back to Liverpool and... Um, it was constant temptation from crime families... And a lot of them had become millionaires through importation. So I decided to go to eat, meet eight of them in New York City to see what it was all about. That was the temptation. So I went to New York and stayed at the um, Marriott Marquis and our alibi was to go and watch a fight. It was Prince Nassim versus Kevin Kelly at Madison Square Garden. I'd booked the eight of them in under my name, under my credit card, to protect them. Sat with them. And what I heard was, like, incredible. Up until then, they had smuggled about 25 million in through Morocco, through South America, and etc. And I was looking at them. I knew three of them. I didn't know five of them, but they dared of me. And the other three had said, no, there's only one man. It's Teddy Morgan. That's what they thought. And what was my position? Investor, carry money, negotiator. So I sat with them. And it was a bit crazy. $6,000 rounds of crystal. Observations, just watching them. And one of them, I told one of them, I said, these are the, f- these five that you've got, I've never robbed a bar of fucking chocolate out of a shop. And all of a sudden, they've got big homes, they've got everything. I said, tell you what, lad, I would not like to get caught with these five because you're fucking going down, la. You're going down big time. So my advice is get away from them and go on your own. And stay with the other guys that we know from when we were kids. And eventually they would get it. You know, five million would go missing. So they asked me to come fly me home to Liverpool. And I did. I'd left them in New York, made no decision, flew back to Liverpool and... I'd met in a hotel in Liverpool. Sat with them again. Guy asked me to take 650,000 quid to Spain with one of the guys that I knew. I said, let me think about it. The only person I ever thought about was Kelly. Good. I thought about Kelly. 
And I just went like that. I went, no, I can't do it. And it's very hard for a man like me to say that. But I've got my life. And I've got my daughter. So I declined it. So anyway, he took the money one of them down to Spain. And I'd been asked to go to Spain. And he, one of them got caught. He got 10 years. Got 10 years. And I went like that. I went home that night. And I was staying with my sister-in-law. And I've known her since she was young. I knew her dad. And she looked at me. And I'd been in the city centre and I'd had a suit on and a combi. And I walked in the door and she said to me, Where have you been? And she would never say that to me. She went, I know where you've been. She pointed and she went, it's not for you. Look at you. You're a smart man. She put them words into my head. She was the one that I listened to. Never listened to my wife. Never listened to any of the gangsters. But I listened to her and she meant it. She said, you've got a lovely daughter. And it was the what, it was how she said it to me. She said, look at you. She said, you're a lovely man. And then um, I pulled out. Good. Later on in life, um, I'd met, I'd, I'd, I'd know some of the, the families, um, you know, the showers, the lambs. Yeah, we've had Michael showers on. Yeah, I met Michael. When I, I drove in his Rolls Royce with him. I mean, at Jenny McGivens funeral um, I've never seen a crowd of gangsters together ever yeah I was in the front seat with Michael in his Rolls Royce yeah when Jenny died and one of the guys when I was a kid was um, one of the most powerful families is the Whitney family Les Whitney he was my best mate when I was young and I'm surprised all his family become one of the most feedest <laughs> drug dealers importation. So who's Chester Hanks? Oh, Chester. Chester Hanks is the son of Tom Hanks. What happened on the 101? I've been on the 101 many times. <laughs> <coughs> oh, my dear. God. Well, I've just been over to Glendale. And I'd gone to a Japanese restaurant. And I was with um, some friends. And I decided to get back early because it was a Friday. It was Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. So I get on the freeway. I'm driving. I've always drove a Mercedes for the... If you got it in LA, you know, it'll protect you. It's well built. So... Gets on the 101. Well, actually, it's the, the 34 Glendale to the 101 to the 110. So I got blocked in and I couldn't get on. It was that bad, the, the traffic. So I'm driving. I can't get in. I've been pushed onto the 110 through right downtown Los Angeles. And I look to the right on the off-ramp and sees this car coming on and he's in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I went, I was watching him. And I thought, I bet he's going to hit me. 
He's going to hit me. Anyway, he comes behind me. And the traffic's slowing. I'm slowing down. I'm watching him. I took my eyes off him. Bang. All of a sudden, he hits me. Smashes right into me. I goes forward. But I kept my distance in front of the car because I, I just knew this was going to happen. So, my head went back. I came forward. They said in, that I, I, did, I did the dashboard, TMZ. It made this, and I, I didn't. I, did, I banged my head. I went forward, and it banged my neck. And this arm getting hold of it, so I think I had nerve damage. So, gets off the freeway. He gets out, Chester. Big kid, dickhead, tattoos all over him, pulls over, tried to help him, said, you're all right, mate? He said, yeah, I'm all right, yeah, man, and all this, you know, like a gangster. And he had the most horrible attitude I've ever seen in my life. So I looked at him, said, give me your documents. And he went... Hey, man, don't call the police. I said, no, man, I won't call the police. I don't do that. I said, leave that car there. And I said, call your parents. I didn't know at the time who he was. I didn't know who the fuck he was. So next thing, um, gets in the car with him. I've seen all the cocaine. Seen all the marijuana. And I went... You're loaded, aren't you? And he went, Don't call the police, man. I've got anxiety. So get all the documents. Photoed a lot of them. I didn't think much about it. Then I decided to go to the hospital in Irvine. Finally gets to the hospital. But as I'm going in the hospital, I get a call from an insurance company. Um, who are you? I said, Mr. Mugen. I said, who did you get hit by? I said, Chester Hanks. Well, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. I'm going in the hospital. I don't know my injuries. I'm just going into the emergency room now. Well, can we take a statement now? I said, no, you can't. They knew. So that put... Red flags up in my head. So anyway, what happened to him was, I just carried on. And then, my neck got worse. So basically, I went to a, a neurosurgeon. One of the best in me was from John Hopkins. And you've got to be the best. So what he'd done, he looked at the, the MRI and he looked at it and he said to me, you need surgery on your neck. And I went, really? He said, yeah, the disc has come out five, milligra mm. five, five millimetres. Now everybody gets arthritis, everybody gets problems with the neck. But I never had this problem. People get disc bulges, but exaggerated it. That's what it's done. So anyway, I went to Newport Beach and um, got these attorneys. Next thing, they done these checks on the car. And they said to me, you know who owns this car, don't you? I said, no. Said Tom Hanks. He's responsible. So, what they done was they said by filing a lawsuit against him, him, his wife, and Chester. Well, next thing they file a lawsuit, and I'm down in Laguna Beach. 
and I'm walking down the beach and a guy walks past me and he goes, Cherry, you're on the news. So I kept my head down and I kept walking and went, oh no, here we go. <clears throat> Next thing, I get a call, Santa Monica from my niece and she goes, Cherry, you're all over TMZ. And I went, what? She said, you're all over the news. So what happened is then, I called Kelly and I said to her, will you meet me in um, Cona del Mar? It's between Laguna Beach and Newport. It's a very lovely, isolated, one of the best places in the world to live it is. Where a lot of movie stars live and, you know, Basket Kobe lives down there and all them. Oh, Tiger. Tiger was an old friend of mine, Tiger Woods, yeah. We used to have me breakfast with him, yeah. So we go down there and um, I said to Kelly, get the news up. I said, can you Google um, Tom Hanks? I said, put the, the two of us in together. So next thing, it's spreading all over the world. It's going everywhere. Oh, it's going like wildfire. I said, Dad, look at this. And at the time, I felt terrible. But it was just a way of sending a message. Even though you're not a film star, you cannot give your key, the car keys to a child who's under the influence of alcohol and drugs. So the case went on and next thing, it got heavy. You know, he was going into restaurants with Steven Spielberg and the rap came in and they were asking him questions and they were blowing it up on E! News and Huffington Post. And it was like ridiculous, really, it was just media. And I felt sorry for Tom Hanks. So I came in and I'd met his lawyers and we'd done these depositions and they were sort of threatening me in a way, you know, oh no, it was only this. I said, no, I said, we'll go to the jury. We'll take it to the jury. And then finally I was, after the deposition, I read in the news that he decided, Stephen Malowski, to tell the news that my case will be settled in the future. And he told the Daily Mirror that um, it was exaggerated. And it was just... Because Chester, a few months before, just come out of rehab. And he had threatened Howard Stern with a gun. He'd done all this. And he, he used the N-word. And he was just absolutely crazy with drugs. And then he done a video saying that he was, I snorted more coke up my nose than anybody. And, you know, it was, it was bad news for Tom and Rita, especially Rita, his mother. So what happened is I had a, a bit of trouble with the lawyers. And then we came to an agreement that we would go to a courthouse in San Diego to do a mediation and settle the case. And then we went there and it lasted 12 hours and I sort of, I could have kept it going and kept it going and kept it going. But I thought, no, this has got to end here. And I always thought about the better man. And I thought about Tom Hanks and Rita. And luckily he hadn't been in trouble and we settled the case. Good. And we signed an, uh, an agreement. We're going to finish then on how your life is now, Terry, but my stomach's rumbling. Can you just get past me a banana and a coro bar, someone? Thanks. So how is your life now? <laughs> is it still going? Yeah, yeah. We're still going? Yeah, yeah. Um, not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Except for the surgeries I had my neck had, uh, limited me. And um, I'm not doing bad. I'm alive, mm. doing okay, living in Orange County. Mm. 
you know, Nervine's not too bad. And I hope maybe one day um, to come back to Britain and do some work with some institutions here or represent some companies in public speaking for um, children who've lost a way in life. And mental illness is... I'm pretty well educated on mental illness from all the doctors I've met in my life. And a lot of people don't know about it and how to just go around it and how to keep fit and how to control it. And, and, and actually to get the right diagnosis. A lot of people are misdiagnosed. That's the problem. So just enjoy my life with Kelly and, you know, see Annette now and again. And so life's pretty good. Would you ever drive up Norlands Lane? And... Um, actually, when I go up to Liverpool, I'll, I'll be in witness because Alan, my nephew, lives there. So I'll be going that area. It doesn't bother me anymore. You know, it's just, it's part of life. I've, uh, I've grown to that. How does it feel telling your story for the first time? Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and I just want people to know is get a message that life of crime doesn't pay for nobody for, well, especially what I've been through and how I suffered throughout my life. It's, it's, it's been devastating, but the mental strength and how I've survived basically in my life. And I'd like, if people do see this, that I hope it gives them some help and some closure to their life to realise that they're not going through as bad as things as what I went through. And, you know, to go on the run for all them years, it is devastating. What about young people watching this who might have gangsteritis? Oh, if they've got gangsteritis, forget about it. So what do you want in life? Do you want the cuffs on or do you want them off? Because once the cuffs are on, you can't get them off. So you choose. I would have a campaign, um, actually, Terry Mugan, cuffs on, cuffs off. <laughs> I think that'd be a good campaign in Britain. Definitely. Would you like that? Yeah. I think that I came up with that idea this morning in bed. Mm. Cuffs on or cuffs off. No cuffs on. I always believed in, um, nobody talks about the Ten Commandments. I always believed there's an 11th one. And I always preach it. Would you have any idea what it is? 11th commandment. Anyone got any ideas? Don't get involved in drugs. <laughs> no. Don't get caught. Don't get caught. <laughs> the 11th commandment. Don't get caught. <laughs> So remember, don't get caught. Cuffs on, they're going to stay on. Cuffs off, they're going to stay off. Gang members, you'll be in a cell. You stab someone, you're going to be in a lonely cell for the rest of your life. The outside world will get about you, and then you've got to deal with the government, the British government that is going to step down, and you don't know what they've got in store for you. So... The easy life, don't get caught, get educated, find a family, raise well, go to somebody, talk to them. Even, you could actually even go to a psychologist or someone and tell them your problems unless you've got these problems that you want to kill someone or something like that. Don't do it for you, for you young children out there today. Do not do it, please. And can people watching this reach out to you on social media or anything? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a beautiful um, Instagram. It's called The Hollywood Butler. It's all black and white. You can go to it. You can send me messages. You can follow me and just look at some of the life that I've led and look at the significant photos that there and, and the marked underneath. And it's, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I've had a good life, even though it started bad. So please let us know in the comments what you thought about this epic story. It's something that we've never heard before in our lives, just where Terry's gone from to back forth. It's madness. Huge thank you, Terry, for coming on. You're welcome. Cheers. God, God bless you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well done, Billy.
Yeah.